April 5. I am sick in the consciousness of what awaits my poor children and grandchildren. But otherwise, viewing it from the broader standpoint, I long for the day of the catastrophe in order that the nature of these lovely continents, Europe and North America, now savaged and despoiled by overpopulation and commercialism, may have a chance to breathe, to recover, to cause these atrocities of man's handiwork to decay into the ruins they deserve to become, and to restore to the trees, the natural shrubs, the streams and wetlands, and the self-accommodating, non-destructive animals, the dominion over God's great and beautiful creation which they deserve to have. Sarlat, France, May 22. I sat myself in the back seat, mildly troubled by an aching kidney stone, and yielded myself to melancholy reflections. To wit, one, it was obvious that the trend, both in Western Europe and in the U.S., but more in the U.S., was towards war with the USSR, that all my own efforts to halt it had been futile, and that I had come to the end of my usefulness to my own time. Two, could I myself have been wrong in my conviction that this was unnecessary, that there were better and safer ways to approach the problem of Soviet power in the post-World War II era? In certain respects, yes, of course. No one is right all the time. But basically, no. I had been right in saying that once political stability had been established in Europe in the late 1940s and early 1950s, one should attempt to negotiate a departure of both Soviet and American forces from the center of Europe. I had been right in my opposition to the basing of our defenses and those of Western Europe on the worse than useless nuclear weapon and our encouraging of the Russians to do likewise. I had been right in my belief that the best solution in Northeastern Asia would have been a neutralized and demilitarized Japan and Korea. I had been right in my distrust of a wholly motorized society in my insistence even 25 years ago that we should not permit ourselves to become dependent on Middle Eastern oil. I had been right, finally, in my warnings against the reckless importation into our society or any other highly developed society, and particularly into our great cities, of masses of people of wholly different cultural habits, traditions, and outlooks, incompatible with our own. In all of these causes I have failed, and the result of these failures was the present march of Western civilization along several paths into the very jaws of catastrophe. 3. What to do? Acknowledge the total failure as irremediable? Retire silently? Fade out of the picture, without defense, without effort at self-justification. No, one would still like to set the record straight, if only as a matter of self-respect. Bonn, June 3. I have not much longer to go, a couple of years probably at the most, presumably until the 9th of May, 1982 to be exact, Kennan actually would have died on May 9, 1983, if, as he surmised, he had been allocated the precise lifespan, 79 years, 2 months, and 23 days, as that of the cousin of his grandfather, George Kennan, 1845 through 1924. In an apparent arithmetical error, he wrote May 9, 1982 in the diary. The two George Kennans shared not only the same birthday and interest in Russia, but also many other parallels in their lives. And so serious is the present international situation, so threatening and terrible to my children and grandchildren, and to millions of other people's children and grandchildren, that anything I could do to diminish this danger would be more important than the best I could hope to do as an historian. Unless the greatest of the dangers can be averted, there will remain few books on history to be read, and there will be few to read them. September 18. Princeton, with its never-ending pressures, its many other writing tasks, correspondence especially, and the frequency of travel in every conceivable direction, is a poor place for diaries. Chapter 9. Cold War Critic, 1981 through 1990. 1981. 
Kennan interrupted a European sojourn dedicated to research and to conversations with friends and officials in order to receive the Albert Einstein Peace Prize in Washington on May 19. The award pleased him for several reasons. Though he and Einstein had never spoken, their tenures at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton had overlapped. Kennan appreciated the $50,000 check that went with the prize, but most important was the opportunity to argue his case before a wide audience. Kennan realized that the SALT, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, process had come to a dead end. Negotiations had bogged down in arcane, complex details. SALT II remained unratified by a skeptical Senate. The belligerent rhetoric of President Ronald Reagan was further escalating Cold War tensions. Kennan seized the occasion of the Einstein Prize ceremony, which was attended by members of the Reagan administration, as well as by the Soviet ambassador, to propose a dramatically new and simple approach to arms control, an immediate across-the-board cut by 50% of all nuclear weapons held by the two superpowers. The proposal propelled Kennan further into the limelight, a development that both delighted and dismayed him. Although now 77 years old, he would have to work harder to balance the competing demands of public life and scholarship. As indicated in the entries that follow, Moscow, as it had for decades, sparked in Kennan a mix of turbulent emotions. Moscow, April 13. I cannot describe the impressions of this day, so many of them deepened by the wisps of memory, the impulses of sympathy and pity, clashing with those of revulsion, the everlasting battle of contradictions. April 16. The military policies, and even more the rhetoric of these two great countries, are on a collision course, and I feel quite helpless in the face of this situation. About the Soviet Union, I can do nothing. These people have indulged themselves for sixty years in the habit of polemical exaggeration and distortion. It is as Russian as boiled cabbage and buckwheat kasha. But what about my own government and its state of blind militaristic hysteria? It has not only convinced itself of the reality of its own bad dreams, but it has succeeded in half convincing most of our allies, and that to such an extent that anyone who challenges that view of the world appears to them as dangerously subversive. To read what some, most in fact, of our good people are saying makes me feel that I must be going crazy or they must. Our respective views of reality are simply incompatible. Kennan was aghast at Washington's protest of Moscow's threat to intervene against the Solidarity Uprising in Poland. April 17. What is the inference here? That this is something new and abnormal? Are we to gather from this that the Soviet Union did not have the capability of intervening in Poland over all these last 15 years? The Soviet Union, with some 19 divisions in eastern Germany, with five divisions in Czechoslovakia, with dozens more in the western districts of the Soviet Union, or so we are told, and with two divisions already stationed in Poland— are we supposed to tremble and to wax heroically indignant all of the sudden over a situation that we have peaceably put up with for more than a third of a century? I feel that I must have been asleep for several decades and have woken up to find it an almost unrecognizable world. Night before last, there was a dinner at the embassy where the chargé d'affaires, Jack Matlock, said in a toast to me the kindest and nicest things I have ever heard from the lips of anyone in this government. Jack Matlock, Jr. was a State Department expert on the Soviet Union who would become ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1987 to 1991. Enough to make up for all the slights and rebuffs I have had from the U.S. government from John Foster Dulles on down. And today, at a lunch in the Prague restaurant, Georgi Arkadyevich Arbatov said equivalently warm and moving things from the Soviet side, a side from which, too, all has not been posies and compliments in earlier years. I would not be human if these things did not give me satisfaction, 
But they are certainly all, if not more, than I deserve, and they are, like the recent Einstein Peace Prize, a commitment. May God give me the insight to retain, in the light of my weaknesses, my humility, the strength to do something useful in the remaining time. April 19. Today, it occurs to me, is the 77th anniversary of the death of my mother, the woman without whose sacrifice and agony I would not have existed. I never knew her. I tried to picture her to myself, beautiful, as I know from the photographs, but provincial. I can more easily imagine her voice, the slow, middle western drawl I can recall from her sister, Auntie Venn. Her passing was a tragedy for the family, for my poor father who needed her, for my sister, Constance, then six years old, who was dependent on her and who in a way never wholly recovered from the shock of her death, for me, whose relations to women were unfortunately affected by the bewildering succession of female figures who flitted in and out of the house, each taking care of me in her way through the years of my infancy and childhood, once, a few years ago, I dreamed that I saw my mother. I knew it was she. She stood motionless and silent before me. She could not speak. The barrier between the dead and living made it impossible, and I understood that it must be so. Visiting Tchaikovsky's house, I was much moved by the whole encounter, not so much with Tchaikovsky, although I admire a great deal of his music, but rather with these evidences of the period, and I came away deploring the fact that I had not been born a hundred years earlier than I was. What a century, that nineteenth, loaded with meaning, thought, beauty, and tragedy. The regime of observation over non-resident foreigners has been considerably modified, so that there is no longer much of that indefinable strain, as detectable in the atmosphere as though it had been some sinister odor, that once enveloped the foreigner in this place. The sense that not only was one being constantly followed, one's self by hostile and suspicious eyes, but that those Soviet citizens with whom one had to do, even for unavoidable and authorized reasons— were similarly held under a species of menacing, dangerous observation. April 21 From these experiences of the day, I came away with the sense of having my nose rubbed once more, always a useful experience, for one tends to forget, in the incorrigibly dual, ambivalent quality of all Russian political reality, the clash of opposites, the two-headed eagle, the heads looking in opposite directions, the patriarch dispensing Christian charity and forgiveness, the czar dispensing sheer power in its most terrible forms, the grand chancery of Gier's day dispensing current and peaceable policy in the most elegant French. Nikolai Karlovich Gier's was the Russian foreign minister who helped engineer the alliance with France that Kennan was writing about. The Asiatic Department, conducting its intrigues along the southern borders in the most truculent Russian, the People's Commissariat for Foreign Affairs of the 1930s, behaving like the former Grand Chancery, while the Comintern exerts itself to overthrow the very governments with which the Commissariat is trying to conduct pleasant and frictionless relations. And now... Arbatov and all these others being touchingly kind and nice, and this, to me of all persons who has no power, has no influence on our government, cannot help them in the least. And on the other hand, the unseen warriors of the Ministry of Defense and the secret police, all of them as convinced of the inevitability of war as were the Tsarist Minister of War and Chief of the General Staff a hundred years ago, as convinced as are our hardliners and military planners at home, blinded all of them by the unspoken implications of the weapons race in which we are all engaged, fighting in their imaginations and plans, rendering inevitable by the very act of so conceiving it, the very war they profess to wish to prevent. 
and doubly sinister by virtue of the dense cloak of secrecy and anonymity in which they insist on wrapping themselves. What is one to make of this two-headed phenomenon, which at times can assume the warmth, the capacity for sympathy of an Arbatov, and at other times the monstrosity of a Stalin? Obviously, one places some of one's money on both— for however impressed one may be with one side of this personality, one has no right to forget the other. But when, and if one has to choose, I would favor giving the edge to the more hopeful side, which is the human and humane one, for it is plainly our best chance. It is, in fact, our only chance that is less than disastrous. It may have some political disadvantages— the present situation in Afghanistan, for example, but these may be expected to find their own level with the course of time. Over the long run, it is, after all, the civilizational capacities of governments that are decisive, as the Russians are now learning to their sorrow in Poland. Many a distortion of the moment will find its correction in the slow, mysterious persistence of the underlying cultural habits and capabilities of peoples, but for the horrors of modern war, particularly but not exclusively nuclear war, there is no correction. No one can bring back the lives, the hopes, the cultural values which a great war destroys. Copenhagen Airport, April 27. Before leaving Leningrad, I walked over to have one last look at the river, for this was, I supposed, my last hour in Russia, ever. So for a few brief moments I drank in the spectacle of what Pushkin called this majestic stream, confined among banks which are, to my mind, the finest river banks to be seen anywhere else in the world, except Venice, and greater even than these latter in scale and sweep. The rail trip to Helsinki was comfortable enough, much snow still lying in the woods and snow flurries alternating with sunshine all along the route. John Gaddis, the best of the American and Americanist diplomatic historians of this generation, now spending a year in Helsinki, kindly met us at the train and escorted us to the hotel. The following day was sunny but cold, Gaddis and his wife took us to lunch at the very Victorian restaurant in the park by the harbor. I felt ashamed to let them do it, for they are young and Helsinki is an expensive town, but remonstrations were useless. Returning to Europe after the Einstein Prize Ceremony, May 27. This last year has changed my life in two ways. The reception of things I have written or said publicly— culminating in the Peace Prize, has created a situation in which I no longer can nor should try to hold aloof from the debates about current questions of international affairs. This being the case, it has plainly become quite impossible for me to do any studying or writing of history. Unless another great war can be prevented, there may be no more history to write about, and even if there were, no one who could write it or read it. The newspapers tell us of President Reagan's speech at West Point. It is a simple world picture that he paints, and a very old-fashioned one. It is so old-fashioned that I ought to love it as he sees it and be thrilled by it. I cannot. I love certain old-fashioned values and concepts, but not his. He stresses the need for a revival of patriotism. I can imagine that were we ever to meet and talk face to face, something which is most unlikely to occur, he might, remembering my evil reputation, look me sternly in the eye and ask, Kenan, are you patriotic? What could I say in reply? I would have to ask in turn, Do you mean, do I love my country? And if so, what do you mean by country? the land or the people. If you mean the land, then yes, of course. I love it. Loved it as a child, the way it then was. Continue to love it today to the extent the people have not yet made a wasteland, a garbage dump, or a sewer out of it. 
If you and your supporters, who seem to have a positive hatred of all that is natural and beautiful in it, complete the destruction of it, or encourage the developers to complete it, which is the same thing, there will be little of it to love. And the people? What do you mean, love people? I suspect that what you mean when you speak of patriotism is, do I join you in idealizing them, in encouraging in myself and in others the view that there is something wonderful about them, something other people do not have, something that gives them a superior virtue and strength and entitles them to consider themselves leaders in the world, stronger and with greater authority than anyone else. If this is the way the question is put, if this, I am being asked, is the way I view them, the answer is decidedly no. Helsinki, July 16. I have been sitting alone with my kind hosts over dinner. I return to my room wholly inebriated, or at least wound up. With what? I had one scotch and soda before dinner, a couple of glasses of red wine during dinner, nothing more, before or after. I have had that hundreds of times and never felt inebriated from it. What then? From my own talk, I must conclude. Sometimes when I sit this way with a very small circle of listeners, I get going. In some way, I overpower them and silence them, or make it difficult for them to speak. And the less they speak, the more I do. What is it that silences them and leads me on? Fascination? Over-intensity? Astonishment? Whatever it is, I end up like a clock which is about to break because one winds it too tightly. 1982 Despite the extraordinary honors and respect heaped on him, Kennan agonized about his failure to stem the apparent rush toward nuclear war. He saw himself as a prophet, one who might remain unheeded in his own time. Horror at the prospect of a nuclear holocaust spurred him to question nearly all armed conflict, even the Second World War. Acting on such conviction, Kennan teamed up with former National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, and arms control negotiator Gerard Smith. In a widely read article in Foreign Affairs, this gang of four urged the United States to pledge, as the Soviet Union had done, not to be the first to use nuclear weapons. That assurance could reduce the chances of nuclear war starting through preemption or miscalculation. The Reagan administration, like its successors, refused to make such a no-first-use pledge. Princeton, January 10. The year 1981 was what one might call a diary-less year. The reason is obvious. Very active people do not, as a rule, keep diaries not unless they are so well supplied with clerical help that they can dictate them hastily to secretaries and so full of the importance of what they are doing that they think their daily doings must absolutely be recorded for history. And for me, 1981 was an active year. When I received the Einstein Peace Prize in Washington, the observations I made by way of acknowledgment of the honor ended up being distributed privately in thousands of copies. When, then, at the end of the summer's vacation in Norway, I was asked to address a special meeting of the Norwegian Pen Club, a gathering much more political than literary, the remarks made on that occasion also went the rounds and ended up, in one form or another, both in Die Zeit in Germany and in the New Yorker on this side of the water, and in the New York Review of Books. All of those statements addressed themselves to the problem of nuclear weapons— they produced such an eager response on the part of thousands of people that I was misled into thinking that my word might really carry some weight, and I wrote columns for the New York Times op-ed page. I even let myself be wheedled into appearing a week ago today on Meet the Press. Today, at the end of this rather pathetic effort to affect governmental policy, I have to recognize its total failure. The New York Times obviously understood nothing I said. 
and for the Reagan administration, all this was, at best, a species of slightly annoying mosquito bite. The bite of an insect to be absentmindedly brushed off and at once forgotten. So I find myself now in the full consciousness of my failure. I do not regret the effort. My children, if they survive the next five years, which I consider to be doubtful, may at least be able to see that I did my best to head off disaster. Or was it my best? Would I not have been more effective by far had I, instead of expressing myself as I have, become the politician, said a thousand things I did not mean, cultivated a thousand people for whom I had no respect, mouthed all the fashionable slogans, got myself at least briefly into a position of authority, and then, playing as the others do on popular emotions and slogans, wheedled less perceptive people into doing useful things, the real nature of which they would not have understood at all. The answer to this question is, of course, theoretically in the affirmative. Whoever wishes to lead the masses in a useful direction must learn to deceive, not to appeal to people rationally. But this answer is actually beside the point. All that was not in my nature. My role, vain as this assertion may sound, was that of a prophet. It was for this that I was born. And my tragedy is to enact this part at a time when it becomes increasingly doubtful that there will, as little as ten or twenty years hence, be anyone left to recognize the validity of the prophecies, or whether indeed any record of those prophecies will have survived the conflagration to which nuclear war can lead, or any eyes would be there to read it if it did. I find myself standing as a witness at the final apocalyptic self-destruction of this marvelous Western civilization, with all its immense monuments of architecture, music, art, and literature, a civilization which had the vitality to burst out into breathtaking feats of creativity in earlier centuries, but lacked the power to live by them, to build on them, and, in the end, even to preserve their surviving monuments. In the face of this terrible vision, nothing will help except the Christian faith, the Christian faith in its most primitive form, Without hope or delusion for the perceived world of our life on earth, its eyes riveted on another life which we are incapable of imagining and for the reality of which we have only the passionate, inspired, and compelling witness of Christ himself. There we are. My own role as a faint and unsuccessful protester is obviously at an end. Age would soon have put an end to it anyway, even if discouragement did not. But meanwhile, there is a bit of life still to be lived, a bit to be seen of the tragic beauty and poetry of this world, a bit, in short, to be witnessed, perceived, and recorded. Whether anyone as old as I am can even observe all this with his fading eyes and react creatively and usefully to it with his dwindling perceptiveness remains to be seen. This journal, being resumed at the moment of final discouragement, will be the answer to that question. January 11. Bitter cold this morning. Zero or a bit below, depending on which thermometer you look at. The morning paper full of stories about the desperate efforts of the Reagan administration to induce others to join them in putting sanctions on the USSR over Poland. It is clear to me that the administration has decided that the time has come for an all-out effort to break up the Soviet hegemony in Eastern and Central Europe and to do it in a manner as humiliating as possible to the Soviet leadership. An unnecessary effort, for the hegemony was disintegrating by itself without our doing, and an immensely risky one, probably leading to war, for Moscow cannot permit so arrogant and dramatic a challenge to its prestige, not to mention to Soviet security. The Soviet leaders will see, at the end of this process, a totally hostile German-American alliance directed exclusively against them. January 17. 
To a visiting Soviet dignitary, I imagined saying, You can say to your people that there is no use in your trying to patch things up with the Reagan administration. They are determined to make things as bad as possible, short of outright war. There is nothing you could do to appease this administration. The only effective way you could handle these people would be to take the consequences of their attitude, to take a deep breath and resolve to live without trade with the U.S., even without the grain, to be prepared for the elimination of all forms of cultural interchange, to insist on a mutual recall of ambassadors and on a drastic reduction of their staffs, and to settle down to a long period of relations at the lowest and coldest conceivable level short of hostilities, retaining only a readiness to continue with all seriousness the talks on the reduction of nuclear weaponry, to learn, in other words, to live totally independently of the United States, expecting from it only the worst it can do in hostility and vituperation. I did not, of course, say one word of any of this, but I would have liked to. February 16. This, of course, is my 78th birthday. Left to myself, I would give up the Princeton residence, acquire an abandoned farm in the northernmost regions of Vermont or New Hampshire, and settle down to a life of doing the small chores, cutting the firewood, feeding the chickens, baking bread, and carrying water to the horse. Nothing to me could sound more inviting. The Kennans journeyed to Central Europe, where they visited friends and George worked in the archives. Prague, March 12. A long ride through central Prague and the embassy limousine. A Prague not seen for 43 years. It made upon me, even the beautiful Baroque facades, an impression of drab and gray sadness. How much of this was a real change? How much the tricks of memory? Who could say? To what extent, that is, were these facades really sprucer, brighter, more cheerful, more hopeful and affirmative in that remote year, the last months of Czechoslovakia's real independence when I served here, 1938 through 1939? Or to what extent did they merely appear so to a far more youthful eye, or did memory now attribute to them a color brighter than any they ever really had? No fully adequate answer to these questions. I think without pleasure or pride of the young man I then was, physically healthy as never before. I remember the very sensation of health by which I was overcome in that tragic autumn of 1938. But with great failings, Failings so great that I dislike now to remember them. The best I had to offer was not my person, which was weak and inadequate to the private responsibilities it had assumed, but my mind and my capacities for critical observation and judgment, especially for the absorption of impressions and knowledge. I was dreadfully uneducated, but in high degree educable. These qualities, nevertheless, did not redeem my personal failings, and I find myself wondering what has become of those, other than my wife, who were in one way or another, not always innocently, the victims of them. Vienna, March 20. The Soviet War Memorial, surmounted with the heroic figure, and not a bad one, of the Soviet soldier of World War II. It is, I fear, no place of reverence today, a fatality in this respect to the behavior of the Soviet troops in 1945, the rapes, the plundering, the executions, and other excesses, and to the political brutalities perpetrated upon so much of the rest of Central and Eastern Europe. The Viennese make fun of it, referring to the figure on the top for some reason as the Erbsenkönig, the Peking, I, alone perhaps in this city of nearly two million, view it with sadness, sympathy, and respect, seeing in it the millions of Russian youngsters who laid down their lives in that war. May those who sent all these men to their death 
on whatever side, some day be compelled to account for their action to the God who had caused these victims once to come into this world as sweet, innocent children. Belgrade, March 28. The image that emerges of the nature of the Reagan regime is more and more appalling. It is not just that it is ignorant, unintelligent, complacent, and arrogant. Worse still is the fact that it is frivolous and reckless, and is unquestionably carrying us with great rapidity towards a wholly unnecessary and disastrous war. I return home shaken and deeply concerned. Washington, April 7. I am devoting this present week to the effort, primarily through an article in Foreign Affairs, drafted by Mac Bundy but signed by the four of us, to force our government to abandon the option of first use of nuclear weapons, which it has insisted on retaining for the past thirty years, and to which I have always been opposed. The article was officially released to the press at 6 p.m. this evening. The four of us gave interviews, first to the European press and then to the American one, about a hundred of them, with the photographers this morning, and now we are giving individual ones. Should the effort succeed, I would regard it as the most important thing I had ever had a part in accomplishing. July 21. As for the Soviet dissidents, so-called, the thesis is that only Western pressure could cause the Soviet leadership to be more indulgent in its treatment of these people. The record would seem to me to indicate, for the most part, precisely the opposite. The dissidents are largely Jewish. Their aim is not to overthrow the Soviet government, but to leave the Soviet Union. Because of this desire to leave it, and above all because of their insistent tendency to appeal to the Western press for support, they are stamped, in the eyes of the regime, as enemies of the Soviet Union and as agents of the imperialists, meaning the United States and Israel. Any pressure exerted from the Western side on their behalf only confirms this impression. There are, of course, others, non-Jews, whose opposition to the policies of the regime are of a more political nature, who are trying to bring about useful change by working within the system, who are made to suffer for their efforts, and who deserve Western sympathy and, where possible, support. It is entirely proper that this sympathy should be made manifest by the Western press and public opinion— it is another thing for the Western government to get into the act and to make an international issue of the treatment of these people at the hands of the Soviet authorities. That is, however one looks at it, interference in the internal affairs of another country. This is seldom useful, and it is inconsistent with our own professions. July 30. Arthur Schlesinger asked me to participate in a commemorative meeting at the Century Club for FDR. What do I know about Franklin Roosevelt? An intellectually superficial but courageous and charming man, a gentleman with pronounced liberal leanings, guilty actually of great mistakes, the greatest of which, in my opinion, was the provocation of the unnecessary war with Japan— tying up as it did the forces and energies which, if not thus tied up, might well have and probably would have enabled us to meet the Russians somewhere well east of the line on which we did actually meet them in 1945. But FDR was a man of his time, a captive of its prejudices. If you are going to blame him, you have to go back farther still and blame the American missionary movement— with its powerful pro-Chinese and anti-Japanese bias. Hanover, West Germany, September 25. I will never get anywhere with most of the Germans until I find some way to argue my point effectively. The scenario conceived by so many of these people, including, I believe, Marion Dernhoff, is simply not the way great powers behave. By this scenario, I mean the vision of the Russians someday appearing at the door and saying to the West German government, You do this or that or else. I know of only one instance in which anything of this sort has actually been done. The night in March 1939, when Hitler and his henchmen browbeat the elderly, ill, and drugged Czechoslovak president, Emil Hacha. 
As opposed to this, there have been thousands of instances of serious conflict between stronger powers and weaker ones where this was not done. And there is good reason for that, because no serious statesman in his right mind would consent to deal with another government in the face of such a threat, because to do so would be to sacrifice all independence of policy. The question would at once arise... If I submit to such pressure today with respect to the particular demand at issue, what will be asked of me tomorrow? The Farm, October 17. Reunion of five siblings who had not, so far as any of them could remember, been assembled together in any one place for at least sixty years. It was a momentous occasion. The uncertain lines of fate and experience which had taken their departures so many years ago from the oddly positioned, partially dark, and not always happy home on Cambridge Avenue in Milwaukee had divided us widely and over many years from one another. Yet even at the end of this division, we were not strangers. The community of childhood proved stronger in the end than all the intervening ups and downs of life. Memories were kindly and without rancor. Mutual sympathy for all that life had done to us, the good and the bad, was felt but unspoken. In none of us was there any self-pity, nor was there much of a and more reassuring by the presence of the others, spouses, children, grandchildren. Without their youth and strength, the occasion would have lost some of its happiness. Princeton, November 3. First in the morning with the reply to a rather persistent young assistant professor from the West Coast, who was spending some months here in Princeton, apparently mostly for the purpose of burrowing in my papers at the Mud Library, and who has unearthed the fragment of a document, apparently written by me in 1938, but never completed or offered for publication, and has built an essay around it. The Prerequisites Notes on the Problems of the United States in 1938 In Box 240, Kennan Papers this paper, evidently written in a mood of deep depression over the state of the country, and quite immature, will no doubt, if published, lend welcome fuel to the fires of my various critics and opponents. But I do not see that I can really object to its publication. I have sent a copy of the young man's essay, his name is David Myers, and of my proposed reply to John Lewis Gaddis for his comments. The episode raises the question whether I should not ask the Mud Library to place further restrictions on access to my papers. Other problems of the morning? Robert Silvers of the New York Review of Books, wanting me to review Cy Sulzberger's book on Yalta. Such a piece, The Roots and Ashes of Yalta, 1982. I shouldn't, of course, but, oh dear, who else should do it? The Kennans traveled to the Caribbean, where they were guests of their friends, Bill and Laura Riley. Pine Cay, British Virgin Islands, December 24. I thought thoughts, first about this country and our civilization, doomed, obviously, doomed in the first instance by the nuclear weapon, this viper which we have seized to our breast in incredible belief that it is our protection because it could bite other people. But then, if the viper should fail to destroy us, we are doomed again by overpopulation and environmental destruction or degradation. It is not, to be sure, our overpopulation at this point, our country is, of course, some 200% overpopulated, but we have at least stabilized our own birth rate and could perhaps face the future with confidence if we were the only ones concerned. It is the others, the Mediterraneans, the Muslims, the Latinos, the various non-wasps of the third and the not-quite-third worlds who are destroying civilization with their proliferation our civilization as well as theirs. If there could have been any chance of preserving on at least a portion of this planet 
a reasonably sound and hopeful civilization, as one capable of coming to terms with modern technology in a manner considerate and protective of the natural environment as well as of the human being himself, this would have been under the guidance of a body politic made up of people heirs to the traditions and habits, the capacities for self-restraint, and self-discipline and tolerance that have developed historically in close association with the Christian faith in and around the shores of the North Sea. One of the great American delusions has been, and is, that these values are readily communicable to others who did not inherit them, that all you had to do was to bring these others to our shores, plunge them into the midst of our civilization, and they would instantly be penetrated by this political ethos and responsive to it in their behavior. 1983 Both the apparent slide toward nuclear war and the resulting public protest gained momentum in 1983. In March, President Reagan publicly castigated the Soviet Union as an evil empire. Also that month, Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, a program to develop and deploy a high-tech shield to protect the United States from Soviet missiles. With such a shield in place, Washington could, observers feared, launch a first strike against Moscow. Though mocked as Star Wars, SDI threatened a serious escalation of the arms race. In September, Soviet fighter jets shot down a Korean Airlines plane that had wandered into Russian airspace, killing all 269 passengers aboard. The resulting furor worsened already tense relations. In November, the day after, a television movie watched by over 100 million Americans in its initial broadcast depicted the effects of a nuclear war on a Midwestern town. Though Kennan did not know it, President Reagan, alarmed at the burgeoning public anxiety, began considering steps to ease tensions with Moscow. The president was encouraged in this effort by Secretary of State George P. Schultz, who had replaced the more hawkish Alexander Haig. Princeton, January 4. Helen Caldicott and another lady doctor, both very attractive people, came to lunch and stayed until 4 p.m. Helen Caldicott is an Australian physician and anti-nuclear activist. It was very interesting to talk with them. They have a program for the peace movement that they are anxious to put forward nationally and for which they would like my support. Dr. C. also described in detail her recent talk, or non-talk, for it was simply hopeless to get through to him, with President Reagan. Terrifying. Washington, March 2. Went to the Soviet embassy for lunch alone with Dobrynin. Anatoly Dobrynin was the longtime Soviet ambassador to the United States. Had no particular purpose except that I, having once suffered under the fact that no one dared come to see me when I was ambassador in the Soviet Union, felt for him in the present dismal state of Soviet-American relations and thought our country could do a bit better in this respect than the Soviet Union had done by me. So I marched bravely into the old embassy building on 16th Street, under the amazed eyes and furiously clicking cameras of God knows how many agents of the FBI and others of the intelligence fraternity, was kindly and jovially received by my ambassadorial host, lunched and talked pleasantly with him for an hour or so, well aware that the recording devices of both governments were probably noting, for the benefit of an official posterity, every word of our rather innocuous conversation. In the evening, to the Four Seasons Hotel for a dinner of the Ambassador's Emeriti with the Secretary of State, Mr. George Schultz. The latter arrived in company with Larry Eagleburger and a young gentleman from California by the name of, no name specified, who, meaning very nicely the usual Reagan requirement that he should have had no previous experience with foreign affairs, and should know nothing about them, had just recently been named Deputy Under Secretary of State, a position most Foreign Service officers would have regarded as the crowning achievement of thirty-five to forty years of service. Lawrence Eagleburger was a career diplomat who would later become Secretary of State under President George H. W. Bush. 
I, being the senior of the various ex-ambassadors, was the first to greet and welcome the Secretary of State, and although he is very much an imperturbable person, I thought it jolted him a bit when I gave him the name. The evening passed off pleasantly enough, but I came away doubting that it had been worth his while. He was, as I had expected him to be, patient, quiet, and a good listener, reserving at all times, as I thought quite proper, his opinion on the matters discussed. I found myself liking and respecting him, as most people do, but I foresee something of an ultimate crisis between him and the fanatics in the White House around the President, particularly if he tries to do anything sensible about relations with the Soviet Union. George and Annalise traveled to Europe for his historical research and to visit their daughter Wendy, who lived with her husband in Switzerland. En route from Paris to Zurich, June 10. I am now of an age when I should, on all actuarial probability, have left this life or at least have forfeited any physical or mental powers that would have permitted me to contribute to it. I must learn, then, to look at my surroundings as I was once forced to do in Moscow. Look at them as a disembodied spirit, that is, seeing but unseen, observing that to which the spirit has no relationship and in which it is not a participant. It is as though one were seeing things that were in one sense the future, because they were occurring subsequent to one's active life, but in another sense the past, because one had left behind the world in which they were occurring. It was with these thoughts in mind that I boarded the Paris metro this morning. I heard the train approaching as I was going down the steps and had an impulse to quicken my steps, but then I thought, why do so? A disembodied spirit has no reason to be in a hurry. Time no longer has, or no longer should have, any serious meaning to him. Then, perceiving an attractive female figure, I questioned myself again. You, I said to myself, profess to be seeing these women as though you were thousands of miles off in space. What possible difference could it have for you whether or not they are attractive? But then I thought to myself, even if a spirit is disembodied, it may still have yearnings. There is nothing to prevent it from sighing and lamenting, as Justice Holmes once did. Ah, to be seventy again. Oliver Wendell Holmes Zurich Airport, June 13 Flying, but particularly the airports, puts me into the nearest thing to a wholly psychotic depression I am capable of experiencing. These damned American tourists, so goes my inner protest, with their lousy clothes, their exposed undershirts, their T-shirts, their California-style casual shirts, their jeans and tennis shoes. Why do they have to be here in the Zurich airport? Why can't they stay at home? There ought to be a law about it. But, says a still protesting voice, you are yourself an American. The hell I am, says I. And besides, I have a serious reason for being over here in Europe. People who have some legitimate reason for travel, diplomats, businessmen, provided they can prove their bona fides, and scholars, possibly even a few journalists, if they can demonstrate any educational qualifications, yes, but tourists? Under no circumstances. And the same for the Japanese with their everlasting cameras. If you could only stop these two nations, the Japanese and the Americans, from touring, and the Germans too, how much nicer the world would be. Everything that I have believed in, everything I have urged others to believe in over the course of the past thirty years— has been repudiated by my own government and by every one of the other major NATO governments. My entire effort of 35 years to exert a useful influence on U.S. foreign policy and international affairs by speaking or writing publicly on Soviet-American relations was misconceived and hopeless, should better never have been undertaken in the first place. Of course, 99% of it was provoked by other people who invited me, indeed, pressed me to speak or to write on various occasions, and it was my nature to state what I thought at the moment was the truth.
In a sense, you could say that these people who pressed me to speak were to blame. People listened when I spoke. I made good copy. They didn't care whether what I said was useful or not. But I, equally obviously, allowed myself to be provoked, and was fool enough to think that some useful purpose might be served by what I was saying, was fool enough, actually, to believe that policy in a democratic country could be influenced by rational discourse. What is evident from my experience is that this last is quite untrue, that people in the mass are quite incapable of reacting to anything like rational discourse, that if they are to be coaxed into approving and supporting anything worthwhile, it is only by some sort of deceit. Sorenhus, July 25. Where at this point is my great understanding for giving God? Well, I reflect, he is present, understanding, and forgiving as always. His power is great, and we should be lost without it. But that power is not unlimited. He cannot change the natural order in which it is given to us to live. He, God, cannot, at least not in our age, work miracles just for the sake of any single individual. He cannot help us by distorting the natural external environment of our lives. He can help us only by working within us, strengthening us to bear up under our own imperfections and the blows inflicted on us from outside, we being confident because there is no alternative, that in his spirit, in which we are permitted to share, there is, in the last analysis, the justification and the redemption for all things. August 5. Normally the kidney stone merely gnaws and hurts. Today, however, it affected me generally, so much so that after an hour's bout of light work outside I had no choice but to come in, despite marvelous sunny weather, and lie about for the rest of the day on the sofa, reading, I picked it out from the bookcase, the fifth volume of Leon Edel's magnificent biography of Henry James. Henry James, The Master, 1901 through 1916, 1972. A book which is more than the biography of a man, rather a great picture of the literary social life of upper-class England and New England in the years of James's maturity. I find myself, perhaps because it is near to the end of my life, trying, as I read it, to fit myself into that scene, because I suppose I am a literary person myself, slightly manqué, and in doing so I also find myself looking at myself, or trying to do so, through other eyes. This helps to gain perspective, and I think now and then that I have a fair idea of the figure." inoffensive, but insignificant as a person, erratically and inadequately educated, but with a reasonably sensitive, receptive, and clear mind, of which my country could have made better use. One does not, it seems to me, have to be a great personality to see things clearly. It takes, in fact, as Freud observed, a modest man to discern what is real and to distinguish it from that which is unreal in this imperfect world— that, with reservations, is the best I could say for myself. The Farm, September 3. I shall soon be eighty years old. I am not in good health. My days are narrowly numbered. I can no longer hope to achieve much by what I do. I know that what I have to offer is quite insufficient to have any significant impact on the policies of my country, to prevent the deterioration of its internal life or to steer its foreign policy into paths that would have any chance of avoiding a disastrous war. In my personal life, I see nothing but grievous problems and dangers on every hand. In the progressive and physical and emotional degeneration of old age from myself and Annalise, in the failures and tragedies of our children— I know how little I can do to avert these misfortunes. At the same time, I am impressed and humbled by what, as I am constantly being reminded, my name and the image they have of me have come to mean for many thousands of other people. 
I don't like the term role model, but I realize that it is just this that I become for many younger people. Students, foreign service officers, writers, what you will. In these circumstances, it occurs to me that if in these final years there is little I can achieve by doing... There is still something to be achieved by acting creditably the part in which fortune has cast me. This is, it seems to me, the least and the most that I can do. To try to look, at least, like what people believe me to be. To encourage them in the illusion that there really is such a person, and by doing this, to try to add just a little bit to their hope and strength and confidence in life. September 7. The newspaper columns and the wavelengths have been full of the disaster to Soviet-American relations, the shooting down by the Soviet force of the civilian South Korean plane. It was a great blow to the entire peace movement in this country and one from which its members will not soon recover. It was a serious blow, too, to my own effectiveness as one appealing for a hopeful and sensible policy towards the Soviet Union, but I am used to that sort of frustration and have been troubled only on behalf of the thousands of people who have put some confidence in me, who have, in effect, accepted my intellectual leadership, and who now feel themselves disowned and discredited by the very government, relations with which they were trying to improve. It will be some time before the East-West Accord Committee and the dozens of other organizations working in this field can recover from the blow and again begin to make themselves effective. Our motto for the moment should be, we have not allowed ourselves to be discouraged by the blows our own government has dealt us. Let us now not be any more discouraged by the one we have just received from the Soviet side. 1984 Although the Cold War was still going full blast, Kennan observed that President Reagan was shifting tone and perhaps even listening to him. In a January speech, Reagan stressed that despite differences between their governments, the parents of America and Russia wanted to raise their children in a world without fear and without war. He imagined a Soviet couple, Ivan and Anya, meeting their American counterparts, Jim and Sally, and finding much in common. People don't make wars, Reagan affirmed. Chances for better relations took a step back, however, after February 9, when Yuri Andropov, who had seemed somewhat receptive to change, died and was replaced with an old-fashioned Communist Party boss, Konstantin Chernenko. Princeton, January 15. Yesterday afternoon, to my amazement, I received a phone call from Jack Matlock, now serving, I believe, in the office of the National Security Advisor, in effect, at the White House. He was leaving, he said, in an hour, accompanying the Secretary of State on the latter's journey to the Stockholm Conference on Arms Problems. He wanted, Jack said, to give me an advance briefing on what the President was going to say in the speech on Soviet-American relations he is to give on Monday. This he then proceeded to do. He then told me very interesting things, that the President felt some regret over certain of the things he had said in the early period of his presidency about the Soviet Union, and that the reason why he had been unwilling to deal with the Soviet government at that time was that he had felt that we were too weak militarily for our word to have any weight. Now he felt we were stronger and that he was in a better position to deal with them. So he was, this still according to Matlock, quite sincere in the conciliatory things he would be saying on Monday. While pleased with this all, for I have high respect for Matlock, I was startled and puzzled by it. The time it was made, on the verge of his departure on an official journey to Europe, showed that the move was not casually undertaken, and the nature of his position leads one to suppose that he must have authorization, and this, from a high quarter, either the National Security Advisor or the President, to do it. That it was his own initiative, I do not doubt, but that the permission was forthcoming is extraordinary. The Kennans traveled by rail from New Jersey to Iowa, where Kennan lectured at Grinnell College. Kennan noted that the Amtrak train 
compared very poorly with the Russian ones. He liked the town of Grinnell, ethnicity white, devoid of a demoralized proletariat, essential crimeless, not even a porno shop, but the students arrive here drenched with all the negative influences of American society. Kennan Diary, January 28, 1984. The college community was eager to hear Kennan's take on current affairs, which had been occupying his mind. Grinnell College, Iowa, January 29. I have a sense that respect for me has recently risen in White House circles, some of them at least, and in the State Department. They will not consult me directly, and I think I should be glad they don't. But I suspect that they listen, if apprehensively, to what I say. In the President's second speech on Soviet-American relations, there were three points taken directly from my recent New Yorker article. Breaking the Spell, New Yorker, 49, October 3, 1983, pages 44 through 53. Although Matlock had read works by Kennan, it was likely that Reagan had not done so. And then there was Matlock's call. I was shaken today by these reflections. Perhaps, I thought, in view of Mr. Reagan's strong position and in view of the mess Russians have made of their relations with most of the Western Europeans and of their weakness generally, perhaps one should support Reagan and try to work through him for a better relationship. But then I thought of all his other follies and of his unlimited commitment to a military showdown, and I also reflected on my own age and on the limitations that imposes, and I thought, no, the faintly more positive tone of his recent speech is surely no more than a minor tactical concession. He is a stubborn man who, precisely because his political position is a strong one, is unlikely to wander very far from the primitive preconceptions he has already formed. Better, I thought, for you, Kennan, to keep out of this. There is little you can do with Mr. Reagan, and it is impossible to help the Russians when they are so little capable of helping themselves. You are effectively stymied. Accept the implications of your old age and let the tragedy take its course. The Kennans traveled to Europe for a number of reasons. George's research, publicity for the French edition of one of his books, meeting with various officials and scholars, sightseeing, and visiting daughter Wendy, her husband Claude Feifley, and the couple's new son, George's namesake, who was born on February 16, the same date as both Kennan and his grandfather's cousin. En route from Geneva to Florence, March 12, I enter without enthusiasm this country of Italy, of all the great countries of Europe, it is, despite its great natural beauty and its marvelous antiquities, for me the least agreeable. There is none other, at any rate, where the life of the contemporary inhabitants strikes me as less interesting and less attractive. When I see what a mess the modern Italians make of their own country, I am less surprised by what the Italian contractors do in New Jersey." Prague, March 25. How strange and unnatural it seemed to me to see this ancient, profoundly European city, once the center of the Holy Roman Empire and indeed the very epicenter of Central Europe, under the influence of the Russians. Its street signs and other outward marks of political allegiance conforming to the stale, lifeless, and dreadfully outdated symbols of Soviet power— there could not, it seemed to me, be any permanency in anything so unnatural. And while I did not say this to them, the great question, I thought, would be whether the recovery of the position of Bohemia Moravia as a truly central European power, and the ordering of its relationship to all its neighbors, would occur gradually and peacefully, or whether the disruption of the abnormal Russian tie would come about only as a byproduct of another great military conflict, which would probably deprive it of all positive meaning. After the Cold War, Czechoslovakia would divide into the Czech Republic, largely Bohemia, and Slovakia, largely Moravia. Kennan, accompanied by his son Christopher, 
flew to the West Coast to raise money for the Kennan Institute for Russian Affairs. As on other such flights, he took the occasion to elaborate on his critique of America's society and its place in the world. In Los Angeles, he also met with Dr. Frida Poor, who in 1935 had treated him in the Viennese sanatorium and who now appeared as a tiny little aging person, but warm, bright, and happy. Kennan Diary, May 9, 1984. En route to Los Angeles, May 7. What, if I had my way, would be done in place of what is being done? 1. The entire present armed establishment will be, for the most part, replaced by one directed strictly to the defense of our own soil, plus what is required to meet minimum defense assistance needs of our NATO and Japanese allies. The ground force component of this new establishment will be one based on universal national service along Swiss lines. The Navy will be designed for defense of our coasts and for such transport duties as are necessitated by obligations to allies. It, too, while commanded primarily by a professional officer corps, will make maximum use of national service personnel. The most strenuous effort will be made to achieve universal outlawing and removal of nuclear weapons and strategic missiles from national arsenals. Meanwhile, the country will embrace a no-first-use policy and will retain only a minimum nuclear deterrent. 2. First priority will be given to a reduction of population to a maximum of 200 million, preferably to something more like 175 million. Immigration for permanent residents will be effectively terminated. Illegal immigrants already in this country will be accepted for permanent residents, but no new ones admitted. Border controls will be greatly strengthened. Men having spawned more than two children will be compulsively sterilized. Planned Parenthood and Voluntary Sterilization will be in every way encouraged. 3. The principle that the best way to produce is the way that uses the least human labor, the maximum mechanization, the maximum computerization, etc., will be rigorously rejected and its application combated. Everything possible will be done to reprimatize and localize the economic process. Encouragement of the handicrafts, Restriction of elaborate processing, breakup of the national distribution chains, maximum development of local resources, and local distribution. All development of agricultural land for non agricultural purposes will be stopped at once. As much as is possible of that land that has already been thus developed will be reclaimed and used for settlement of the redundant metropolitan ghetto populations. These will be encouraged and taught to follow a semi-rural, semi-industrial form of life. Automobiles, except for the most essential purposes, will be in every way discouraged. Public transportation, by the same token, will be encouraged. Air transport will be throttled down and eventually restricted to hardship and urgent cases. So will much of the trucking. The railroad will fill the resulting gap. Communication, too, will be revolutionized. Most of television will be sacrificed. Perhaps one or two public channels operating only in the evening hours, all advertising being either eliminated or restricted to special announced periods and kept quite separate from the legitimate broadcast material. Newspapers will be limited in size and permitted to accept only a limited amount of advertising, something like 10% of the total space, and this segregated into a special advertising section, not mixed with other material. In agriculture, the small family farm, usually combined with some non-agricultural activity, will be encouraged. The use of artificial fertilizers will be drastically restricted, and with it, of course, the size of the exportable grain surplus. The beneficiary will be the soil. Well, enough of this nonsense. The question at once arises, could any of this, even if desirable, be done other than by the most ferocious dictatorship? The answer is obviously no. It could never be done by popular consent. The people haven't the faintest idea what is good for them. Have I? An imperfect idea, yes, but better than theirs. Left to themselves, 
they not only would and will simply stampede into a final, utterly disastrous and totally unnecessary nuclear war, and if, by some quirk of fate, that escaped them, they would and will complete the devastation of their own natural environment, as they are now enthusiastically doing. Will I say any of this when I speak tomorrow night? Will I attempt to write it for publication? Obviously not. The one impermissible act is to tell the young that there is nothing to hope for, that all is lost. I might, after all, be wrong. I am bound to be, in any event, partly wrong, for no one is wholly right. But I might even be more wrong than that. The Kennans were in Moscow as guests of the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, Arthur A. Hartman and his wife, Donna Hartman. George attended a conference of scholars in the Soviet capital. Moscow, June 8. An exciting day full of memories and new impressions, an unreal mixture of the familiar and the unfamiliar. I returned, shaken up with all this emotional and intellectual tossing to and fro, and there, in the Bolshoi, drugged with the music, yet high-tuned from the various stimulations of the day, I suddenly saw, more vividly than I had ever seen it before, what a garrulous old fool I really am, and how wholly incorrigible. I am sensitive and intelligent, I know. I see things many others do not see. But I lose balance in the presence of other people. To correct me, you would have to deprive me of all social life, and hence of many possibilities of observation. I would not dry up entirely, for I could live largely by literature alone, as I have lived in late nineteenth-century Russia. But that, too, is scarcely a practical solution. Randesund, Norway, July 18. I turn my back, figuratively, on the land and keep my eyes fixed on the horizon of the sea. The abused, raped sea, deprived of its dignity and its mystery by the ubiquitous oil rigs, the monstrous thundering automobile ferries, the airplanes overhead, the pipelines underneath. No wonder that it rises up sometimes in winter and strikes out in its fury against everything that men have been trying to do to it. My heart is with it in these frantic, angry outbursts. Princeton, August 26. Regarding the U.S. presidential election, I have two choices. The first would be to come out publicly before the election to emphasize the dreadful record of the Reagan administration with respect to Soviet-American relations, and to insist that all other issues aside, this alone warrants repudiation of Mr. Reagan and the election of a competitor. The other course would be to lie low and either say nothing at all, or at least say nothing critical of the Reagan administration before the election, in the hopes of preserving a faint possibility of being useful to another Republican administration, if one is elected, and if it should by any chance wish to listen to me or to use me in an effort to repair the damage that has been done. The Kennans, particularly to meet Annalise's wishes, vacationed in Italy. Ischia, Italy, September 23. I thought of the qualities of this place, the incongruous mixture of tolerance, naivety, overcrowding, sociability, family solidarity, localism, acceptance of modernism in its most hideous forms, and yet with some sort of an inner self-defense against it, life led, in short, in a small dimension, full of pettiness, no doubt, and not without its small cruelties and injustices, but borne along by the broad, wise, disillusioned charity of the Catholic Church, by the comforting familiarities of family life, and by the unvarying, reassuring support of the Christian sacraments. And I thought to myself, so long as it lasts, imperfect as it is, all this, perhaps, is the best one can hope for, a messy life full of dirt, overcrowding, confusion, and disorder, but with its failings, like its possibilities, 
limited by the intimacy of its localistic orientation and, above all, at least in the personal sense, human. Better in any case than the great, highly developed impersonal societies, with their lordly ambitions, their nuclear weapons, and their vast, technologically advanced abuse of the natural environment. Capri, September 29. Since I, like most diarists, proceed on the theory that someone beside myself will or may someday read this diary, and since no one was able, before we came here, to describe this island to me with any reasonable degree of clarity or plausibility, I shall speed its departure from my life with one or two words about it. After a medical procedure that removed his kidney stone, Kennan was transported home while reclining in a station wagon, piled with pillows and blankets. Princeton, November 6. With my eyes too low to follow the road ahead, I was conducted out of New York City in the early afternoon sunshine of a warm November day, seeing everything in a way that I had never seen or appreciated it before. The foliage of Central Park, which never looked more beautiful to me, the smart facades of the uptown buildings, the shabby second-floor windows of 11th Avenue tenements, the swift flowing tiles of the tunnel walls, and finally the New Jersey of the Hackensack Meadows, all quite beautiful, so long as one could not see the ground level. The Kennans visited friends in Maine. Somsville, Maine, December 31. I myself am caught in a strange predicament. I see clearly that this American civilization of ours is headed for terrible troubles, troubles that will complete the destruction of the United States as I have known it. If left only to myself and free of obligations to others, I would seriously consider moving to Canada and ending my days there, for I am unable to give any serious help to this country and would prefer not to share its conscience." but every time I move around the country, as I am now doing, I am made to realize what a great body of supporters I have within it. I cannot estimate the size of this body in numerical terms, but surely it runs into the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of which a large proportion are young people desperately in need, not of guidance, for they are too independently minded, thank God, to be uncritically led by anyone, but of a figure in whose honesty and goodwill and moral earnestness and readiness to try to face the facts, they can have confidence. I seem, deservedly or not, to appear to them to be that sort of a figure. If I were to give up the effort here at home and emigrate, I would be saying to all these people, and saying it more eloquently than in words, there is no hope for you, you may as well cut and run like myself. But I have no right to say this to them. For one thing, they are, by and large, in no position to cut and run, and I would therefore only be encouraging them to despair. But, more important still, I have no right to say this to them. I may be wrong. Perhaps, unbeknownst to me, there is no reason for them to despair. Perhaps there is hope, which I, seeing things only through a glass darkly, cannot see. And what a dreadful crime I would have committed if I not only urged them, but caused them to despair needlessly. No, there is nothing for it. I must stay here and try to carry on whatever my own judgment tells me, as though there were hope. I have, in a way, invited this obligation. Had I wished to avoid it, I should never have been a teacher, should never have written or spoken publicly. 1985 On March 11, Mikhail Gorbachev, 54, became head of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev soon announced plans to revitalize his nation, with a program of restructuring the economy, perestroika, and allowing openness toward opinion, glasnost. He was also intent on easing the Cold War. 
neither Kennan nor other American experts on Russia foresaw how far-reaching Gorbachev's reforms would extend. Washington, April 4. I am questioned by the director of the State Department's Bureau of Political Military Affairs, John T. Chain, Jr., about Mr. Gorbachev and related matters. I answer readily enough, that is my failing. My host and his companions are polite and urbane in the best State Department tradition. I am aware that this is the first time in many years that I have been thus consulted in this place, and even if the questioning relates only to information, not to policy, I am mildly pleased to be given this attention. But there is something disturbingly familiar about it, about the place, about the smooth remoteness of my interrogators, about their wariness of me and mine of them. It puts me in mind of Mr. John Foster Dulles and of his suggestion, on the heels of his firing of me, that I should drop in from time to time and tell him what I thought about conditions. What I had to say, he explained, interested him. Princeton, April 21. Three more weeks have passed, weeks of such intensive activity that there was no time for a diary. What have I done? Vanity, vanity, vanity. I attended a small lunch for the Secretary of State. Mr. Schultz, who was relaxed, spoke readily and sensibly about the limited subjects to which the conversation turned and was distinctly cordial towards me. He even surprised me by inquiring my view as to how the new leadership of the Soviet Union should be approached, to which I replied by pointing out that Soviet leaders are normally in many respects insecure people and require reassurance in the form of respect for their prestige, and that when you negotiate with them it is well to have a clear understanding as to the subject of the negotiations and to stick strictly to that, not confusing them by trying to drag in irrelevant questions. Charlottesville, April 26. We drove down in the morning through the Hunt Club country of Virginia, all relatively unspoiled by commercialism, at least visually, and very beautiful in its spring garb to lunch with Avril Harriman at his lovely house on the hill. Pamela was away in Washington, where she had been entertaining some 150 people at a Democratic fundraising dinner. Pamela Digby Churchill Harriman was Avril's wife and the former daughter-in-law of Winston S. Churchill. I admired her loyalty to this so nearly lost cause. This stoutness reflected, I thought, the Englishwoman in her. Avril we found very stooped and fragile, clear enough in mind, but not in memory. He was now very much the venerable gentleman of the old school, endowed with that aristocracy of the spirit and demeanor that seems to come with great old age, particularly when supported by wealth and distinction. Sorenhus, August 14. Christopher has sent me an article from the quarterly entitled policy review, put out by the Heritage Foundation. It began with the monstrously erroneous statement that I had argued that containment should be a global strategy, not one restricted to a few areas. A statement that was, as everyone knows who has occupied himself seriously with my works, precisely the opposite of the truth. He would only have had to glance at page 359 of the first volume of my memoirs to learn this. It was, in fact, precisely this feature of the Truman Doctrine statement that I objected to. I agree with Christopher that it would probably be best not to attempt to reply specifically. But with the 40-year anniversary of the drafting of the X article coming up, I suppose that at some point I should deal with the criticisms, generally, that have been forthcoming from the right wing, including this one. August 19. As agreed with the German publisher, I received some days ago the German translation of the first chapters of The Fateful Alliance. Kennan, The Fateful Alliance, France, Russia, and the Coming of the First World War, 1984. Sent in order that I might look them over before one went too far with the work. Oh, dear, oh, dear... What has happened to the ability of Germans in this age to write their own language? 
awkward, pedestrian, painfully literal word for word, and even then many of the words not right, the translation is totally lacking in understanding of the context and in feeling for the tone and style of the original. I feel sorry for the translator whom I picture as a young man, fancying that he knows English and no doubt in need of money. Why else would one take on so thankless a task? But I don't see how I can let the book be butchered after this fashion, and am saying this as tactfully as I can in a letter to the publisher. Princeton, November 13. Once again, many days have passed since I was able to write in this journal. Why? Because no sooner am I in this place, ostensibly dedicated to scholarship, then I become engulfed in a host of demands, activities, and problems, a few of which are, to be sure, related to scholarship in some wider sense, but not to my own researches, and which simply leave me no time for anything resembling a contemplative life. Never have I felt more strongly the urge to live in the country." in the reassuring company not just of vegetable nature, but also of animals. Dogs, cats, pigs, cows, horses, what you will. Here in Princeton, what remains of nature dies its slow suburban death. November 16. Much of these last two days has gone, however, with the reading of and responding to the massive typescript of a doctoral dissertation written or presentation at Columbia University by a man, a Swede, I believe, by the name of Anders Stephenson. He is obviously an erudite man, far beyond the average educational level of our American doctoral candidates, widely read in philosophy and politics generally. I seem to detect a good deal of influence from the Marxist quarter, particularly on the philosophical side, although I do not suspect him of being now a Marxist, he seems to have read with scrupulous, though skeptical, care and thoroughness everything he could that I had written, including much from earlier years, and he has picked it all to pieces, mostly from the standpoint of consistency and philosophical profundity, but, in my opinion, quite fairly. Recognizing it as the most unsparing and impressive critique of my published views, I was fascinated by it, couldn't lay it down. November 27. Another phone call, this time from a congressman, Mr. Sieberling, who wanted to tell me that he had sent to the White House, before the recent summit meeting, a copy of my Einstein Peace Award speech. John F. Sieberling, Jr. was a Democratic congressman from Ohio. He knew, he said, that the president never read anything, but he thought perhaps people in his entourage did, in any case, Messrs. Reagan and Gorbachev had agreed on principle, had they not, that a 50% cut in nuclear missiles was desirable. And where had that idea originated, except in that Einstein speech? December 27. I am taking advantage of the unusual quiet to try to assess my own situation and potential usefulness. This past autumn has been no different from many others. There has been the same tension between the effort to study history, conducted in total loneliness in the face of a massive public indifference. All this on the one side. On the other side, the multitudinous pressures and distinctions emanating from people who are anxious for one reason or another, sometimes commercial, sometimes idealistic, that I should contribute to the discussion of contemporary affairs. I am becoming a species of myth, particularly for the younger generation, and the less I show myself, as well as the less I talk, the stranger the myth becomes. This is ironic and amazing and puzzling, but it is also a responsibility. I am in utter despair about this country. Despair for its short-term future, despair for its long-term one. I suspect that we are only two or three years from an appalling financial breakdown that will probably wipe us all out. And behind that lie the more serious problems, the nuclear danger, the environmental disaster, the control of the media of communication by the advertisers, 
the resulting bemused state of the population, the decadence, the uncontrolled immigration, etc. In face of all this, however much of a myth I may be to the students, I am helpless. I have influence, you might say, almost everywhere but where it counts. 1986 The year 1986 would be pivotal with regard to historic developments about which Kennan cared. Former ambassador to the Soviet Union, W. Averill Harriman, who had both inspired and frustrated Kennan when the latter was his number two in 1944 through 46, died at age 94 on July 26. The passing into history of the generation present at the creation of the Cold War, as Dean Acheson had put it, was underscored by the publication of The Wise Men, a best-selling group biography of Harriman, Kennan, and Acheson, as well as of Charles E. Bolin, Robert Lovett, and John J. McCloy. Even as the origins of the Cold War were receding, the end of that conflict was, in retrospect, becoming discernible in the summit conferences between Reagan and Gorbachev at Geneva in November 1985 and at Reykjavik in October 1986. Princeton, January 4. At the moment, of course, the great danger spot is the eastern Mediterranean and the Levant, where the growth of Arab terrorism has produced a crisis now near the breaking point. It is obviously a crisis beyond our ability to solve. Our two great past follies, involving ourselves with the Israelis and tolerating the nationalization of the oil fields in that part of the world— giving the status of sovereignty to the various sheikdoms and then permitting ourselves and our allies to become dependent on their oil. These two follies are now returning to bite us, and we shall soon have to pay a heavy price, an incalculable one, for our frivolity. There is a possibility that we may get some snow overnight. I always pray for it. Too much of it cannot come from my taste." Nothing else, it seems, can stop these people, at least for a few hours, from driving endlessly about in the cars. It should, when it comes, be a warning to them of the foolishness of permitting themselves to become dependent on this expensive, wasteful, unsociable, and environmentally pernicious mode of transportation. The Kennans went to New York to visit friends and to enable George to promote the Kennan Institute and do some research at the Bakhmatev Archive of Russian and East European Culture at Columbia University. New York City, January 31. Regarding the shuttle disaster, I feel the same sadness everyone else does for the fate of the victims. But their sacrifice seems to me even more appalling because I have no enthusiasm at all for the activity in which they were to have participated. On January 28, the space shuttle Challenger blew up shortly after takeoff. Only the day before the disaster, I had found myself saying to someone that I would gladly trade the entire American space program, in all its forms, military and civilian, for a good national telegraph system and railway transportation network such as we used to have. If the space program has served, at such vast expense, any constructive purpose, this has been to teach us that of all the heavenly bodies accessible to our observation and knowledge, our own is the only one suitable for any form of human, animal, or vegetational life— with the lesson that we should value this inestimable blessing and try to fashion our life here below in such a way that we encourage its natural beauty and richness and do not continue to constitute what Bill Bullitt once termed a skin disease on its surface. In 1933 through 34, William C. Bullitt and Kennan set up the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Princeton, February 5. Annalise and I, yesterday evening, watched the President deliver his State of the Union message. One normally thinks of the demagogue as a cynical, calculating, scheming character, fully aware of the depth of his own duplicity, but prepared to step roughshod over all moral principles to assure his own power. 
What is most terrible about Mr. Reagan is that he is, to all appearances, an amiable, well-meaning man who probably believes a good part of what he is saying. He is, of course, enacting a role, but is asking the public to enact it with him and is triumphing in the cause. The public enjoys enacting this role with him and is undisturbed by the evidence that it is one that invites nothing other than catastrophe upon the country and the world. February 11. If salvation is to come for Western civilization, it will come not from this country, committed as it is to the commercial and political cultivation of unreality, and not from a Western Europe bemused by Mr. Reagan's fantasies and thus plodding blindly along behind us. This, I suppose, is the real reason why I am going to Hungary, to see whether certain of these Eastern European countries, largely immune to the forces of decadence and contrived illusion that are coming to dominate the West, may not, by chance, stumble on hopeful approaches of which neither of the superpowers is capable. Accompanied by Annalise, George traveled to Budapest to visit a Soviet bloc nation that was fast evolving meet with scholars and officials, and, not least, take advantage of spa medicinal baths for the treatment of my arthritic knees. Kennan Diary, March 9, 1986 Budapest, March 13 I have not seen in this hotel a single sign, placard, or other marking of any sort to suggest that this is a communist country. This is only one extreme bit of evidence of something that has been obvious now for some years, namely that as an object of belief, enthusiasm, or even interest, the Marxist-Leninist ideology is embarrassingly dead throughout all of Central and Northern Europe. The heavy hand of Russian military power, while also nowhere in evidence, is still effective throughout this region. And there are no doubt a great many people, particularly in the younger generation, who have accepted the idea of socialism in a wider and vaguer sense as a commendable ideal. Capitalism, at least whatever is meant by it, has come to have negative connotations. Selfishness, exploitation, contempt for general humanity, etc. But communism, as a militant ideology in the Leninist sense, has proved to be empty of meaning— short-lived and spiritually and intellectually powerless, which is the inevitable fate, I suspect, of all would-be secular religions, flowing as they do only from the arrogance and presumption of individual human minds, viewing man only as an economic animal, pretending that all his dilemmas can be resolved by tinkering with his collective condition— and failing to recognize that the deepest of his problems lie within his own individual nature, there to be coped with only by love and faith. March 28. I must never again visit, so long as the present political situation endures another country of the Soviet bloc. It puts us all, myself and the local American representatives, into an ambiguous position, but myself in particular— I am looked to by people in the host country for things I cannot deliver, for words of hope in which I do not myself believe, yet to tell what I know to be the truth, that they have nothing to hope from the United States, is to cross up the local American diplomats who are only doing their duty and being personally kind to me in the bargain, and to put myself in the position of seeming to be working against my own government in a foreign country— a position in which I never hope to find myself. Kennan went to Helsinki to receive an honorary degree. Helsinki, May 22. On leafing through the diary for 1983, I was not made entirely happy by what I read. Many of the entries were entirely personal, primarily about myself, only secondarily about my surroundings, and while they were sometimes interesting to me for purposes of self-understanding, they were too plaintive and too repetitious to be of much interest to others, as I would have liked this journal some day to be. For this repetitiveness there was, of course, a reason, if not an excuse, 
the reason being the overflooding of life everywhere with a type of modernity drawn largely from the U.S. that I encounter wherever I go and react to negatively and with depression wherever I encounter it. Aside from the boring subject of myself, there was too much about peoples, too little about individual people, and I was made aware in reading these entries that the most valuable things I have written in these recent years have been, after all, my published comments on the contemporary scene, particularly the reactions to my own people and government. Since I have found it best to restrict to a minimum the publication of that sort of material, and since not a day goes by that I do not have thoughts and reactions of that nature that I would like to put on paper— the many blank pages that lie within this new cover would seem to be the best place for them. Sorenhus, June 11. I agree with Tocqueville at the start that more important than the institutions of a people are les manières, a term which I shall not try here to render into English. Ingrained behavior, customs, culture and I consider that these are something not to be suddenly or violently changed, particularly by legislation. Here only the gradual influences will do, if and when they are needed at all, the principal ones being explication, persuasion, and example. In general, I distrust all efforts to produce abrupt changes in the life of a society. The only changes that can be lasting and useful are the gradual, organic ones— in tune with the slow rhythm of social life. The planets and the pace of our own development as human beings should have taught us that. This is why I dislike and distrust all violent revolutionary upheavals in the lives of peoples and all movements that aim to promote them, whether on the right or on the left. Secondly, I am a firm believer, as I believe most of the founding fathers of our country were, in representative government as opposed to government by plebiscite, by acclamation, or by direct action of the public. The public is not supposed to know, indeed cannot know, how best to decide the many questions that come before a government. That, as Burke so eloquently argued, is the task of representatives, and particularly those who are able to give to the problems of government their undivided attention, and they should use their own judgment in making the decisions. But then, those elected to be representatives should have at least minimal qualifications for this responsibility. The public should be able to elect from a panel of candidates, a panel selected in such a way as to assure that its members, if not the best, to assume that is impossible, are at least unlikely to be the worst. And who should make this selection? The people at large are incapable of making it. Such decisions cannot be made by an inchoate mass, and the bosses of political parties, the ones who make it today, are the last ones to whom this responsibility should be delegated. Who, then? That, in my opinion, is the central question for American democracy. Our failure to date, to find any answer to it, is the greatest weakness of our political system. It is not in the election of representatives that the system fails. It is in the process of nomination. This is an extremely complicated problem. I view a rule of law, including a reasonable code of civil rights and a proper system of justice, as basic to any tolerable government, and definitely better if you have to choose, than a tyranny of the many. June 18. The news columns these days are full of the problems of South Africa and, even more, of the reaction to these problems in Europe and North America. So little do I see the justification for these demands, so strange are they to my own way of thinking that I have to ask myself whether I have not missed something. Kennan was referring to pressure to loosen or end the apartheid policies of the white-dominated South African government. Do all these good people, full of their indignant demands for punitive action against the South African authorities, know something I don't know? They speak of the abolition of apartheid, which is indeed an obsolescent and impractical concept, but they are extremely vague about the alternatives. 
one is allowed to conclude that what they want is the immediate and extreme centralization of the country under majority rule with a universal franchise, the immediate extension to the black majority, in other words, of full political as well as civil rights. Do they, I wonder, have any idea of what this would mean? Do they have any reason to suppose that the mass of this black population would have any extensive understanding for such a system of government or any disposition to take upon themselves the qualities of restraint and tolerance such a system implies? Do they really believe that the understanding for such principles of government and the civic self-discipline that goes with that understanding are something that any people, regardless of this previous history, tradition, experience, or habit, could don instantly and easily like a cloak any day it chose to, and then make it work effectively? If so, do they really believe that the centuries of slow growth of such understanding in the West, and the agonies, the conflicts, and the gradual discipline of experience that went into that growth, were as nothing? What bothers me most about these demands for pressures and sanctions is the general philosophical shallowness they reveal— where, here, are the Christian teachings that recognize limits to human wisdom and allow for the existence of genuinely tragic situations, the possible resolutions of which are not readily visible to the human eye? And what has become of the great philosophical insights of such men as Burke and Tocqueville, and particularly the recognition that without an ingrained sense of personal responsibility, tyranny can flow just as readily from the will of a majority as from that of a minority or a single man. Plainly, it seems to me, we are confronted with a generation of people who have never acquired any significant sense of history, and who, lacking that sense, also lack understanding for the reality of tragedy as an ever-present factor of the human predicament. July 1 the two superpowers are incapable of composing their differences and putting an end to the arms race or even mitigating its extent. For this, I put by far the greatest part of the blame on the United States. I see every reason to suppose that Gorbachev, if given any reasonable amount of political consideration and collaboration from the American side, would have been quite prepared to go in for fairly far-reaching accommodations with respect to both nuclear and conventional weapons. This would not have required any readiness on the American side to express agreement to his ideological principles or any acceptances beyond what has already de facto been accorded to the Soviet hegemony in Eastern Europe. Given this helplessness of the two superpowers to do anything significant to lower East-West tensions, the question arises as to what the European countries, both East and West of the dividing line, could themselves do to alleviate the most dangerous aspects of the continued division. Obviously, none of the major European NATO countries is disposed today to take any initiative in that direction. Two of them are in the hands of conservative governments that have given Mr. Reagan almost complete support in matters of relations with the Soviet Union. A third, France, has a government headed by a man just as anti-Soviet as Mr. Reagan or Mrs. Thatcher. A government that insists, anyway, on going its own way, is fully and happily committed to the nuclear weapon, a new embodiment of the Maginot Line psychology, and sees nothing greatly wrong with what Mr. Reagan is doing. Francois Mitterrand was the French president. Most of the other NATO powers are less enthusiastic about American leadership in the East-West relationship, as it has revealed itself in recent months and years, but have been unwilling to mount any vigorous opposition to it. I see three principal reasons for this complacency. They are, A, the feeling that NATO is an end in itself rather than a means to an end and that therefore the preservation of the outward unity of NATO should take precedence over every other consideration. b. The egregious overrating of Soviet military strength, an overrating deliberately fostered and encouraged by the Pentagon, with partial support of the European NATO partners themselves. c. The entrenched belief in wide and influential NATO circles that the Soviet leaders ever since World War II have wanted to invade Western Europe or so intimidated 
that they could take it over politically and establish their political hegemony over it, and that it has been only the existence of the American nuclear deterrent that has prevented them from taking military action to accomplish this end. The result of all this is a stalemate that to many people appears quite acceptable. I cannot take this view. The stalemate, in the first place, is not in itself a stable one. The Star Wars project alone, with its many uncertainties, precludes any stability. And the further growth of nuclear arsenals, aside from adding to the already preposterous menace that these arsenals present, cannot be expected to proceed evenly on both sides. Beyond that, there is the growing danger of the unleashing of a nuclear conflict by inadvertence, by human error, by confusion, by misread signals, by computer failure, by nuclear terrorist attack, or, above all, by complications arising from the tragic, deeply embittered conflicts in various parts of the world where, as a consequence of desperation or inflamed passion, nuclear explosives might be brought into play. In the situations we have before us in southern Africa, in northern Ireland, in the Middle East, in India, Pakistan, and in Korea, potentially one of the greatest danger spots of the world, nuclear armed powers or powers possessing the technology for the production of nuclear weapons are involved. It is only a matter of time, it seems to me, before one or the other of the parties to these conflicts makes use of nuclear explosives and that, when it comes, will be a moment of great danger. The Chernobyl near disaster is, in one respect, a great blessing. On April 26, a Soviet nuclear power plant at Chernobyl malfunctioned, releasing a huge amount of dangerous radiation. It has implications of the most serious nature for both the nuclear power industry and the military development of nuclear weapons. There is a wild absurdity in the present efforts to achieve international agreement on the means for avoiding the relatively moderate dangers of power plant accidents on the one hand, and at the same time, the reckless expansion of the arsenals of nuclear explosives on the other. July 23. There has appeared, still at sea, but now entering the Christiansand roadstead, the most extraordinary apparition I can recall ever seeing afloat. An enormous raft, upon which rests a flat horizontal superstructure some thirty to forty feet in height, from which in turn there rise three tremendous steel skeleton towers, each, according to my estimate, three hundred to five hundred feet in height, certainly the highest floating objects I have ever seen, and presumably among the highest ever to have existed, all this towed by a single sea-going tug, the sound of whose pounding diesels can be heard across the three to four miles of intervening water. I stare at the apparition through my binoculars. It plainly has something to do with the oil rigs. I see it as a species of modern cathedral, an expression of reverence and submission to the great god of this twentieth century, the internal combustion engine and the fuel that feeds it. It is on the altar of this God that there are being sacrificed not only the quality of life of the generation now alive, but through the environmental efforts, the very future of civilization. How sad the real God must be to see these hundreds of millions of tiny bipeds whom he endowed with intelligence, imagination, and conscience, and for whom he provided this uniquely rich and beautiful planet as a habitat, destroying the planet and the future of their civilization for the childish pleasure of chugging around in their little motorized buggies. And we, the historians and philosophers, are supposed to place our faith in the wisdom of these multitudes, democratically, or so goes the thesis, expressed. Washington, September 17. The memorial service for Avril Harriman was a tremendous affair in the National Cathedral. A real high church religious service this time. Very high church, in fact, with the choir boys singing, not very well, 
The Almighty, I thought, must have been surprised to be prayed to so ceremoniously and by so many people for the repose of Averil's soul. For Averil, as I saw him, was the least pious of men. He, I suspect, never doubted from the beginning that he had God's grace, or that he deserved it, and saw no reason why he should pray on Sunday mornings for something that was his by obvious right. I never knew him, in any case, to go to church. There was a dinner at Polly Wisner's where Nancy Kassebaum, senator from Kansas, now Joni's new boss, was present. All very pleasant. George and Annalise's daughter. Clayton was full of praise for a book that is about to appear called The Wise Men. Clayton Fritchley was a former government official and newspaper columnist. These latter being Jack McCloy, Bob Lovett, Dean Acheson, Chip Bolin, and myself. He considered that I came off very well at the hands of its two authors, young Evan Thomas and Walter Isaacson. I myself thought it a dreadful book in a number of respects. Shallow, gossipy, supercilious, and most unflattering to myself, who appears as a plaintive neurasthenic and a bad writer in the bargain, the author of masses of florid and pretentious prose which bored all those to whom it was submitted. The account addressed only my governmental service, with a word or two added about the wreath lectures and the testimony about Vietnam on the Hill in 1966. Beyond that, I don't think the authors knew that I had ever written anything in my retirement. I came away from perusing of the volume, realizing that such is the distance between this generation and my own, that if I had ever done or written anything worthwhile, people of this generation, goddess, thank God, is an exception, would never be able to recognize it as such. The Kennans visited their daughter, Wendy, and her family in Switzerland. Geneva, September 25. I have been enduring over the past fortnight some sort of nervous psychic crisis. It reflects the coming together of a number of causes, of which the simple onset of old age is surely one. But the most marked feature of it is an almost nauseous sense of revulsion, not to my former life as an external experience, but to the person of the man that led that life. The book, mentioned in the last of these entries, had a part in arousing this revulsion because, unjust, often inaccurate and superficial as it is, there is just enough truth in this welter of offensive triviality to remind me of the way I was and the way I appeared to others. And while I had been able in recent years, aided no doubt by all the honors and flattery I had received, to put much of this out of my mind, as the psychically healthy person tends to do, I now, for some reason, find it necessary to confront it. The experience of doing so has shaken me so severely that I think things will never be quite the same again. Princeton, October 15. When I spoke with Mac Bundy on Monday morning, just after the breakdown at Reykjavik, I was much impressed with the suggestion that we should see whether we, as a group, could not find some way to help the president escape successfully from the corner into which he has painted himself. At their Reykjavik summit meeting, Reagan and Gorbachev talked about possibly banning all nuclear weapons. The discussion was stymied by Reagan's refusal to also ban development of the Star Wars anti-missile defense system. On hearing his address of last evening as to why we could not give up SDI, Star Wars, I am greatly discouraged over the prospects of any such approach. I saw, sitting before the microphone last night, only a deeply prejudiced, ill-informed, and stubborn man, not above the most shameless demagoguery, likely to enjoy the acquiescence, if not the convinced support, of a timid political establishment, half knowing that he is talking a lot of nonsense, but unwilling to take him on, and a public easily bemused by media showmanship and chauvinistic rhetoric. He is not a man who will be himself in the least impressed by anything that we or any like us will say. It is only pressure from the Congress or from the NATO allies that could possibly move him, and neither seems to be forthcoming in any adequate degree. I said to Annalise, 
that if it fell to me to talk with Mr. Gorbachev about these matters and he asked me what he could do to overcome the extravagant suspicion and hostility with which his country is viewed in the United States, I would have to say there is absolutely nothing you could do. You could give in to us on every point at issue in our negotiations. You would still encounter nothing but a stony hostility in official American circles, and your concessions would be exploited by the President as evidence that he had frightened you into compliance, and that the only language you understood was the language of force. And what you would be up against would be something wider and deeper than just Mr. Reagan. Powerful elements in the American population feel the need for a totally inhuman enemy. They need that enemy as a foil for what they like to persuade themselves is their own exceptional virtue. The politicians know that, and they, for the most part, superficial, narrow-minded, and short-sighted people, will tend to cater to these chauvinistic reactions, even if this is done at the cost of our relations with other peoples. You, the Russians, largely owing to Reagan's efforts, have been cast in the role of that enemy, and there is nothing you can do about it. You must look elsewhere in the world for the possibilities of normal and satisfactory relationships. Count this country out. Seek peace, trade, and courtesy elsewhere. Not here. November 23. Never has my reputation been greater, for obscure reasons, than just now. Never was the chasm between my real thoughts and state of mind, on the one hand, and the brave front I am obliged to show to the world outside, on the other, been greater. I am faced with the choice between silence and hypocrisy. In these circumstances, I would prefer silence— but the busybody worlds of American journalism and academia keep the pressure on for statements of one sort or another, and some of these pressures are hard to resist. December 13. The question is whether Mikhail Gorbachev represents something really new, interesting, and hopeful on the Soviet scene, or whether his regime is merely a disguised version of more of the same. Harrison and I hold to the first of these views. Harrison Salisbury was a friend of Kennan's and a veteran New York Times correspondent in Moscow. The second is vigorously put forward by the cluster of Poles or Polish Jews, Pipes, Ulam, Brzezinski, and Bialer. Richard Pipes and Adam Ulam were Polish-American professors of Russian history at Harvard. Zbigniew Brzezinski, a Polish-American international relations expert, had served as National Security Advisor under President Jimmy Carter. Severin Bialer, who had left Poland, is a former Columbia University political scientist, who, during the Carter and Reagan administrations, have dominated the discussions about Russia in the halls of government and on the pages and screens of the media. Princeton, December 23. It is borne in upon me by several recent events... Reykjavik, the Iranian arms scandal, and the proposed ABC miniseries on the Soviet occupation of the U.S., that try as I may, try as many others may, you will never succeed in establishing an American opinion, a balanced and sensible view of Russia. In order to raise money for the Contra rebels against the leftist government of Nicaragua, White House aides to President Ronald Reagan authorized the sale of weapons to the Islamic Republic of Iran. Because these linked operations violated U.S. laws, they were kept secret until the scandal broke in November 1986. We have adopted that country as our recognized and official enemy. Having done that, we apply to the Russians our idea of what an enemy should be. Quite the same image for the Nazis as for the Communists— the same for the Gorbachev Russia of the 1980s as for the Stalin regime of the 1930s. The same because the image bears little resemblance to reality and arises primarily only from our idea of what an enemy should look like in order to constitute the proper foil for our exceptional virtue. 1987 Even as the Cold War was winding down, Kennan remained pessimistic about the future, particularly concerning America's foreign and domestic policies. 
His perception of the dilemmas Gorbachev faced made him deeply sympathetic with the embattled Soviet leader. While racking up an astounding record of personal accomplishments and honors, Kennan still regretted his inability to sway the people who mattered most to him, decision-makers. Princeton, January 12. I have been reading over the diary entries from 1964 through 1984 and have derived little pride or satisfaction from the effort. Where they were not personally plaintive, they tended to be repetitive. However, they do, or at least I hope they do, bring out one side of my experience, the aesthetic, of which the memoirs showed very little. So they may have some value. What strikes me most strongly in looking over this material is, one, how little I accomplished, and two, how little I grew intellectually and in understanding. Some 40,000, literally, letters answered over this 20-year period. Two respectable books of diplomatic history produced, but this on a secondary subject. An institute established for advanced Russian studies, but one that has always been and continues to be, insecurely based, and still has no assurance of permanency. A number of public statements made in one way or another on nuclear arms control and Soviet-American relations, but this wholly unsuccessfully in a losing cause. And I, now, thinking much the same things and writing the same things I was thinking and writing twenty-five years ago. Honors are showered upon me, this is a country of fashions, and I, or rather what people conceive me to be, am part of a momentary fashion. I have the curious experience of being probably the most extensively honored private person in the country, and at the same time the person least heeded when he speaks. Figure that one out if you can. Sorenhus, May 22. I take note of the troubles my government is experiencing and am moved in each case to respond with that most useless of all statements. I told you so. Great anguish is being experienced, for example, over the question of how to arrange for the removal of the medium-range nuclear weapons from Europe. Their uselessness and dangerousness have now become generally recognized. But who was it, let me ask? who precisely thirty years ago, in the 1957 Wreath Lectures, pleaded desperately and without avail against the impending decision to base the continental NATO forces on nuclear weapons. An American warship has now been nearly destroyed and thirty-seven lives lost through attack by an Iraqi aircraft in the Persian Gulf. But what was the warship doing there in the first place? trying to protect the supply of oil to the West? But who in early years called publicly more than once for a determined and drastic reduction of our dependence on Persian Gulf oil? Had that appeal been heeded, there would have been no need for the stationing of American warships there for the purpose of assuring the supply. Or was the ship there ostensibly to protect the Gulf from supposed predatory arms of the Russians with relation to that body of water? And, if so, who was it, if not myself, who tried for years to point out that the Russians had no such designs on the Gulf and had no reason in their own interests to entertain any? These were the bases for my view that the stationing of American warships there served no good purpose— was only a provocative exercise of silly and dangerous Reaganite bravado. Very well. We would all have been far better off if people in government had listened to me, but so what? And why was it that they didn't listen? It was not that I wrote badly. They all recognized that I wrote well, even when they were unprepared to give any credence to what I had to say. It was partly, of course, because we, I and they, approached these matters against the background of differing motivations. They were concerned to follow and reflect what they viewed as fashionable and influential opinion in our country, whereas I was concerned to lead that opinion and mold it. But beyond that, they did not understand and could not share the intellectual background against which I was speaking— and nothing, I fear, could have brought them to understand it. To be sure, they and the media of communication with which they interacted 
went through the motions of rational debate about such matters, but it was a debate so deeply colored by accepted preconceptions, so self-conscious, so extensively dominated by the taboo and dictates of a conventional wisdom, that it was simply incapable of responding to what I had to offer. If on occasions, as in the case of containment, we found ourselves momentarily on the same wavelength, this was accidental, fortuitous, and the appearance of agreement was, if anything, more dangerous than the far more numerous instances where what I said did not reach them at all. What conclusions to draw from this? Was I wrong even to make the effort? Were I able to relive these recent decades, I would probably do much the same thing all over again. And this is not just because the effort, if it produced no intellectual echo, seems to have earned me a great deal of personal respect, probably also based on misunderstanding. It is rather that much of what I have said has a chance of being rediscovered after my death, if there is anyone to rediscover it, thus to acquire a certain measure of classic quality, and to evoke understanding by that perverse quality of human nature that makes men more inclined to respond to the works of someone long dead than to those of any contemporary. Kennan resided at Spazo House, the ambassador's official residence, while attending a conference of Soviet and U.S. historians. Moscow, June 20. I observed that the old building was standing there, as it had stood over more of these past six decades, mute and long-suffering, one ambassadorial regime after another, performing its brief pretentious act within these silent and unprotesting walls, then packing up to remove its various paraphernalia, to remove, in fact, most of the traces of its incumbency, including even its memories, and to leave behind it, aside from the occasional forgotten object the successor did not know what to do with, only the curious aroma, perceptible exclusively to the imaginative and sensitive of the trivial, and occasionally not so trivial, dramas and excitements of which these walls had been the witnesses. Such is the ineffable, tragic, pathetic transience of the profession of diplomacy. And the remainder of the stay in Moscow? The sessions of the conference, held in a great, highly modern building called the House of Tourists, or something of that sort, the room so huge that I could sometimes not even see who was speaking at the other end of the table. Our Soviet counterparts, after producing pathetically poor papers, screened, no doubt, by countless committees, showed themselves warm, friendly, eager for personal contact, and much wiser than the papers they had been permitted to produce. Everywhere, of course, the ghosts of memory arose to surround me and accompany me. But I was always aware that what I was now observing was divided from those memories by a vast catastrophe— that most of the life I had once known had been destroyed in that catastrophe, and that what I was seeing were the children of the survivors, separated from their parents and grandparents by an abyss no smaller, in many instances even larger, than that which had once separated me, a foreigner, from those same people. The forces of change, in this instance international change, were stronger than the forces of geography and national origin. There was a day in Riga, highly traumatic. It was fifty-four years since I had last been there. I had, repeatedly, the sense of one who has been permitted to return from the dead and to see, at the distance of a half-century, what remained of the scenes in which he had once lived. The city itself was crowded, its population more than doubled since I had known it. The amenities were largely gone. The parks and public places, on the other hand, improved. To me, as a bewildered, foolish, but sensitive young man, this view, this landscape, once had their own mysterious meaning, not to be put into words. How much of this lay in what I was seeing, and how much in myself... God alone knows, some, perhaps, in each. 
The entire visit was made pleasant by the almost total absence of the reticence and tension which in earlier days, even as little as two or three years ago, had marked all such encounters. A change which we all owed, I am sure, to the courage and good sense of Mikhail Gorbachev. But I, I fear, was the only survivor of the odd cast of characters who were then attached to the legation, partly holdovers from the staff of the pre-revolutionary American embassy in Petersburg, partly, like myself, people of the post-World War I professional era, accepting the somewhat provincial amenities of life in Riga, but with our thoughts and our efforts of understanding— riveted to the great profoundly destabilized country that began 200 miles to the east of us, with its hostile, defiant government and its greatly suffering population, a spectacle to us of horror, drama, and inexhaustible fascination. Sorenhus, August 5. Gorbachev is easy to criticize. He would be hard at this point to replace but no less interesting than his own fate is the effect of his policies on the non-Russian peoples of the Soviet Union and on the countries of the satellite area. Here we encounter a highly complex picture, with no lack of contradictions and dilemmas. A number of the non-Russian peoples of the Soviet Union, particularly the Baltic countries and the Georgians and the Armenians, are better suited than the Russians to make good use of the Gorbachev ideas and efforts than are the Russians themselves. Indeed, in some instances, they have quietly anticipated them, to the extent that they are able in this way to effect a strengthening of their own economies relative to the Russian one, this should lead to an increase in their importance within the Soviet Empire, to a further objective distancing of them from the Russian center, and thus to a heightening of the centrifugal tendencies that had so much to do with the fall of the Tsarist Empire in 1917. More significant still are apt to be the effects of Gorbachev's policies on the relationships of Moscow to the satellite countries. The satellite regimes themselves are still bound to Moscow, of course, by the largely rhetorical but nonetheless politically important ideological bond, and with the exception of Romania, by the far more solid and important military relationship. But in other respects, they had already begun to emancipate themselves in various and widely differing ways from strict Soviet tutelage even before Gorbachev's reforms began. Certain of them had even anticipated these reforms even more extensively than had the non-Russian nationalities in the Soviet Union. Their further reactions to Glasnost and to Perestroika in the Soviet Union will vary greatly from country to country. Those regimes that feel most secure in their relationship to their own people will welcome the reforms and make the most of them as justification for liberalization on their own part. Others, notably the Czechs and the Romanians, will, in fact already do, find themselves severely embarrassed. These strains can serve only to widen the already striking differences among the various Warsaw Pact countries and, by the same token, to produce a further weakening of the general pattern of supposed conformity with the Soviet model of socialism. Gorbachev is a remarkable man, so remarkable as to be almost inexplicable in terms of his own known professional background. What he set out to do, as he saw it, was no doubt to liberate Soviet society and the Soviet economy from the ill effects of the enduring traces of Stalinist terrorism on the one hand, and the corrupting system of privilege, on the other, by which the aging Brezhnev and his cronies contrived to hold things together for so many years. But these evils have bitten deeply into the fabric of Soviet society, and have mingled and partially fused there with certain of the great distortions brought into the life of the Russian Empire by the Communist Revolution of 1917. It is this, in essence, that Gorbachev is running up against, whether he realizes it or not, as he sets out to correct what he sees as the enduring evils of Stalinism and Brezhnevism in Russian life. He probably thinks this is all he has to correct, but he may find, before he is finished, that in some respects he has to correct the mistakes and the blind spots of the Bolshevik seizures of power in 1917, and even to take upon his own shoulders some of the unfinished business of the old czarist regime. 
Russia has no lack of past follies that cry out for correction and will require correction if Gorbachev is to make out of Russian society what he would like to make of it. Princeton, Thanksgiving, November 26. The approach of Mr. Gorbachev depresses me profoundly. Gorbachev was coming to Washington for a summit conference with Reagan. I cannot understand why he consented to come. Here he will only be stifled by the crowding in of several thousand reporters and photographers and insulted by the Reaganite political establishment. And he will return empty-handed, having seen precious little of this country, but cordially hating all he has seen. Washington, November 30. I was startled to gain the impression from this talk and from the morning Washington papers that people in Washington are much more optimistic about the forthcoming summit meeting than I have been. Could it really be, I ask myself, that something more might come of it than the Intermediate Range Missile Treaty which Mr. Reagan was once moved to propose, supposing that the Russians would never agree to it, and which, even if signed, forces a ratification battle that will destroy much of the good feeling it might conceivably have produced. At their December 7 through 10 summit meeting, Reagan and Gorbachev signed a treaty that would eliminate the intermediate-range nuclear missiles in the U.S. and Soviet arsenals. Contrary to Kennan's prediction, the treaty sailed through the Senate by a 93-5 to 5 vote in May 1988. If so, it means that Gorbachev is weaker than I supposed him to be. Or could it be that he is even smarter? There is nothing that so upsets the NATO conservatives, Mr. Reagan among them, than a sudden and unexpected consent to their more outrageous demands. Princeton, December 17. Some weeks ago, I took to New York and delivered to Harriet Wasserman the five binders containing items from my diaries and letters describing scenes and landscapes. Harriet Wasserman was Kennan's literary agent. The idea that a collection of these might be published originated with John Lucas, who strongly urged me in that direction. John Lucas is a historian and was a close friend of Kennan's. William Sean, the reader for the publisher, was concerned and upset because he had found in it nothing from my war years in Germany. William Sean was a former editor of The New Yorker. He suspected, I gather, it was all very vague, that I must have been concealing something from that time. She did not want to say more over the telephone and insisted that she would come out here on the 18th, i.e. tomorrow, to talk to me about it. I don't know what it is really about, but since that it all bears some relation to my views, or lack of views, or suspected views, on the fate of the German Jews, I will find out tomorrow in any case what it is all about. But today, to prepare myself for whatever the trouble is, I spent most of the day in the mud library, reading over my diary notes and letters from that period, numbers of which I cannot recall seeing since the days when they were written more than forty years ago. It was a strange experience, being suddenly moved back in this way into the atmosphere, the stresses, the moods, expectations, dreams, and emotional trials of that period. The image of myself as I was forty-five years ago, and as was reflected in these papers, left me unhappy and unsatisfied, partly, I suppose, because I could not wholly distance myself from it. Too much of it left in me today, but partly, too, because in these notes and letters I also see that image partly from the outside and derive a certain distaste from what I see. It would be easier, I expect, for others, bearing in mind my nature, background, and experience, to be lenient about the shortcomings of that distant figure than it is for me. December 20. Well, day before yesterday, Harriet Wasserman came out to Princeton. It was her insistence and told me about this episode. It was more or less as I suspected. Sean had seemed very upset about the absence of any diary items from the period of my service in Germany. The Ferrer Company, for which Sean now works, had declined the manuscript, and the latter had been returned to her. She suspected it had had something to do with references to Jews in the early diary entries. 
all incidentally from my service in Germany and the Baltic states in the years before the Nazis were even in the picture. She was herself furious about this, but also, I thought, and understandably, concerned over the question of how it might reflect on her and on her business. She was going to talk to them further about it, and Sean had said he was going to phone me about it at some point. The head of the Ferrer firm, I should have noted, had said something to her about Kennan's German problem, whatever that may have meant. I am much concerned about this whole episode, but for Harriet's sake rather than for my own. 1988 as the Soviet Union under Gorbachev began to withdraw, in some cases unilaterally, from various Cold War contests, Kennan was prescient in perceiving that the United States, by contrast, would not pull back from its forward military positions around the globe, nor would Washington sharply cut its contracts or ambitions for ever more sophisticated and powerful weapons. In sum, the groundwork was already in place for America's decade-long transition from a preoccupation with the Cold War to a focus on the global war on terror. Princeton, January 10. Gorbachev, with his statements, actions, and proposals, has done us all one great favor, which was to demonstrate that for a great many people in the West, including the heads of three of the most important Western governments, and for a considerable number of politically influential people in our own country, the reason for supporting the present absurdly high and terrifying levels of nuclear weaponry is not really the need for balancing off the comparable levels of such weaponry held on the Soviet side, that this declared rationale was only an excuse, that the Soviet holdings and further cultivation of these weapons and the Soviet positions in the various arms talks and negotiations have actually had very little to do with these attitudes and that the persons in question have a deep emotional commitment to nuclear weaponry, quite aside from anything the Russians might do in either the cultivation or in the abandonment of it. What we now have to turn our attention to is no longer the perception of the relative strength of the Russians and ourselves in this form of weaponry, but rather, A, the sources of the peculiar morbidity of the human spirit that inspires the Manichaean view of international relations and this anxious clutching at weapons of this nature, despite their suicidal and apocalyptic qualities, as though there could be disasters worse than those which any sort of use of these weapons would draw upon us, and b. how we are to develop and inculcate into American opinion a much more mature and sophisticated understanding of the problem of the balance in conventional weaponry, one that takes into account the intentions as well as the capabilities of the supposed adversary, and one based on the recognition that there can be no salvation for any of us in another major war fought with such weapons, that here again we are ultimately dependent on the intentions rather than the capabilities of the adversary, the influencing of which is primarily a political and psychological, not a military, problem. The Kennans vacationed on Barbados. Barbados, March 10. Where would I, with this torn nature and with this incongruous mixture of strength and weaknesses, where would I have been without a firm, quiet, sensible but sensitive and loyal wife at my side? How persistently the English, in their own self-confident Victorian and Edwardian manner, shaped the lives of what must have been as little as two or three generations back a population of African slaves, converted them to a species of Anglican Christianity, established for them and then bequeathed to them a firm system of humane justice as well as a proper structure of education, taught them cricket to absorb as much as possible of the old Adam in the men, and turn them loose to govern themselves under the benevolent eye of a rather helpless governor-general, the Queen's representative, who nevertheless incorporates the grandeur of the inimitable civilizational ideal, namely the British crown, in the name of which all this took place. Not perfect, of course, not unaffected by the modern age, who is? But if to be judged, then only by the criterion, compared with what? En route to the farm, May 9. 
What I find it hard to adjust to is the acceptance of my own failure, of the failure, that is, to exert any useful influence on the dominant trends of official American thought and policy, and secondly, the dreadful and dangerous extent of my alienation from the prevailing intellectual currents of my own time. First, the failure. I have been unable to prevent the militarization and particularly the nuclearization of American and NATO policy. There has, in these respects, been a consolidation during the Reagan years of precisely these trends in the American political consensus that I oppose. And I see neither in the prospects for the succession to the Reagan presidency, nor in the outlooks of the American press and media, and the same is largely applicable to the European ones as well, any sign of the leadership required to overcome these tendencies. Similarly, I had not been able to lay the groundwork in public or official opinion for any sanification and long-term improvement of Soviet-American relations. The possibilities for that improvement are plainly present on the Soviet side. On the American side, they are lacking. I have also failed, and here I suppose it could be said that I have not tried as much as I could have, to gain any understanding or acceptance from my own concept either of the desirable thrust of American domestic policy or of the principles that should, in my opinion, govern our relations with the remainder of the world. Well, failure is failure. All men fail to some extent. One should learn to accept it. But I am, for better or for worse, not dead yet. I still live and live in a human environment that looks to me for communication, for intellectual interaction, here is where the alienation comes in. I have no hope that a nuclear disaster can be avoided. As for Soviet-American relations, were I to talk frankly with Mr. Gorbachev, I should have to advise him to address no hopes to his relationship with this country, rather to wish it off in his foreign policy concepts, to try neither to injure it nor to appeal to it for any positive contribution to world affairs, but also not to fear it. Its bark will be worse than its bite. Simply to leave it alone and to look elsewhere, primarily to the Far East, for any constructive contributions to international life. Similarly, of course, I can look for no useful American leadership in world affairs generally. I can have no confidence in a country that, A, is as vulnerable as this one to pressures for a militarized view of its external relationships, and, B, places its foreign policies so extensively at the service of the emotions and prejudices of ethnic minorities. What good can a man such as myself, who can look at these problems only from the standpoint of national interest and world peace, hope to do in the face of such distortion of the official American vision? Not a morning passes that I don't bridle at something in the morning paper or the radio news and am seized with the desire to write something about it. But where? One answer, theoretically, is a book. And the effort will be made, but it is not the whole answer. Since the 1930s, Kennan had deplored what he saw as American society's excessive individualism, commercialization, and exploitation of the environment. He also bemoaned the politicization of foreign policy. Lacking much confidence in democracy, he developed the notion of a council of highly respected individuals who might offer wise advice to the executive and legislative branches of government. Kennan would eventually include these and other recommendations in his 1993 book, Around the Cragged Hill, A Personal and Political Philosophy. Christian Sund, July 25 through 26. I produced a chapter delineating five specific problems of American society, all serious ones, which, if neglected, could lead to serious deterioration of American life. I argued, this was not hard to do, that with none of these problems was the American political establishment, as it now stands, capable of coping. The only expedient I could recommend was the establishment, by act of Congress, of some sort of advisory council of state to be composed of men chosen by presidential appointment from among a national panel of distinguished citizens, known not only for their integrity, experience, and good sense, but for their total lack of political involvement or ambition. 
if I thought there were to be conferred on such a body, situated not within the regular political establishment, but at the side of it, and accepted as advisory to both executive and legislative branches of the government, sufficient prestige to lend authority to its findings, then I thought there was a possibility that it might stiffen the regular establishment to the point where it could address more successfully the problems I had mentioned and others like them. It was obvious, however, that all this would take time, years, if not decades. Meanwhile, we would remain at best a nation sorely and dangerously tried by domestic problems, a nation that had shown itself capable of coping with the task of developing, however wastefully, the resources of a great, fertile continental region of the northern temperate zone, but had still to prove that it could cope with the far sharper and more subtle challenges of a world of high technology, nuclear power, and environmental deterioration. But, and here came the dilemma, it was no use telling people that their situation was hopeless, that there was nothing they, with their small strength, could do about it, that they might as well resign themselves for the worst. Not only was there no use in my telling them that, there was also no excuse for it. I had long since recognized in earlier moments of despair that it was incomprehensible and indefensible to tell young people that there was no hope. For one thing, I might be wrong. There might be hopeful possibilities I did not see. If that was the best I could do, then better shut up. The problem was complicated at just this time by the developing political situation. The reports of the Democratic Convention, together with Mr. Dukakis' own statements, his choice of a vice presidential running mate, Michael Dukakis was governor of Massachusetts and Democratic candidate for president. Senator Lloyd Benson of Texas was the vice presidential candidate. And his obvious reference to the various aggressive ethnic minorities struck me as being susceptible of no other interpretation than as evidences that Mr. Reagan, notwithstanding all his inadequacies, his mistakes, and his reverses, had really won in the end, won in the sense that his right-wing view of America's place in the world had prevailed. The Democratic Party, unprincipled and ready to place itself at the disposal of any faction that would promise to bring it money or votes— had surrendered in advance to the well-heeled, loud-mouthed, and brutal forces of the southwestern right wing, arrogant, chauvinistic, and militaristic. These were now the dominant political forces of the country. Mr. Bush, running around the country trying desperately to conceal the fact that he had ever had anything to do with education or culture, those abhorred features of an effete East Coast society, had already long been the captive of these forces. George H. W. Bush was the Republican candidate for president. Now Mr. Dukakis was joining him. Did it matter which of them was elected? And what conceivable connection did I have with their world of feeling and, if you can call it that, thought? If this was their country, as it apparently was, could I plausibly claim it as mine? Aboard a Plane, August Kennan later noted that the entry was written probably on a plane and probably in August 1988. Were I to be asked by a responsible Soviet official, what could we in Moscow do that we have not done within the limits of political realism to change this situation? I should have to reply along the following lines. There is nothing you could do that would really change it. The American political establishment conceives of itself as an actor on a stage facing an audience, which is American opinion and enacting some sort of a passion play. It has cast itself in the role of a knight in shining armor, championing the cause of the innocent virtuous maiden which is the American people. For this role to achieve plausibility there is required a foil, an evil spirit, a wicked sorcerer, if you will, from whose threatening advances the maiden must be protected, otherwise no use for the knight. The sorcerer, dear Russian friend, is of course you. This is the role in which you have been cast. You cannot help it. For a number of reasons you qualify for it as no one else could. It is in part related to what you once were, 
and it has very little relationship to what you are now. But without it, the play could not go on. This is a stage drama, not a reality. It is the appearance of victory they are after, not victory itself. Princeton, September 17. Notification that I am to receive the Toynbee Prize. Named after the historian Arnold J. Toynbee, the Toynbee Prize honors those who have acted from a historical perspective to further the social sciences. The honor will require a speech. Now, how could this have been avoided? Only by declining the honor. In the future, then, I must decline them, although this is late in the game. But I think I can now do it. I have had all the significant ones except the Nobel Prize, and I am most unlikely to receive that. And, oh yes, I forgot to mention, among the things done, a rather short piece I wrote for the New York Review of Books on Gromyko's memoirs. Andre Gromyko, wartime Soviet ambassador to the United States and longtime Soviet foreign minister, wrote Memoirs, 1989. Here again, I was the prisoner of my own past, for I was the obvious person to write it, being virtually the only one who could. 1989. For decades, Kennan had believed that the Cold War would eventually end, yet as that happy day approached, the former diplomat groused that Washington's persistent unwillingness to negotiate had unnecessarily prolonged the conflict. Moreover, he worried about the instability that could ensue from the demise of the communist system and the freeing of the Soviet's empire in Eastern Europe. Critical as ever of U.S. society and the West, Kennan despised any tendency toward Cold War triumphalism. With the inauguration of the administration of President George H.W. Bush, Kennan understood that U.S. policy might change. So he made it a point to share his viewpoints with select media and with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Princeton, February 5. It must be a half a year since I have written in this journal. The month of January has been most unnaturally warm. There has been much speculation as to whether this is not attributable to the warming trend the scientists believe themselves to have discovered, affecting the entire planet. February 12. At a dinner inaugurating the Institute for the Study of Diplomatic History that John Gaddis is setting up at Ohio University, there was the usual sense of encouragement from the Midwestern scene, the unassuming kindliness the pervasive cheerfulness, the modesty and simplicity. And Gaddis, with his intelligence, his strength, his decency, and his relative youth, is the hope of the country for the understanding of the past and the future of the country's position in the world. And his wife, a fine, intelligent woman, herself a scholar, but also a good, quiet mother. Altogether, it was a heartening experience." one that left a good taste in your mouth. The summit meetings were rather silly media events without political substance. At their December 1987 summit meeting in Washington, Reagan and Gorbachev signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces, INF, treaty that eliminated intermediate range missiles from Europe. The two leaders had previously met in Geneva in 1985 and in Reykjavik in 1986. The INF agreement was a minor step in the direction of arms reduction, accepted with reluctance by our major European allies and by many in the President's own political entourage, a small petard on which Mr. Reagan had hoisted himself by some of his earlier propagandistic statements, and from which he found no other way to extract himself. At a time when the Soviets had already deployed intermediate-range missiles in Eastern Europe and the United States had not yet installed such missiles, Reagan had proposed a zero-zero solution. Moscow would have to dismantle existing weapons, while Washington could stand pat. To wide surprise, Gorbachev accepted the deal. Otherwise, things have remained much the same. Throughout the later years of his presidency, Mr. Reagan tried to appeal to both of two mutually irreconcilable consistencies— his hard-line supporters, on the one hand, for whom the cultivation of the image of the evil empire, dedicated to our destruction, appears to be an emotional necessity, and, on the other hand, 
The great body of moderate, well-meaning, but somewhat bewildered people in this country would like to see relations with the Soviet Union improved and a military showdown avoided. Drawing on his remarkable ability to wiggle through the sticky places and to impress others with his one-line absurdities, however mutually contradictory, he has largely succeeded in this effort, waging war with Russia verbally out of one pocket and peace out of the other. But there has never been much room for doubt about the direction in which his own inclinations were leading. He has succeeded, with his extraordinary genius for oversimplification and for establishing the slogan at the expense of the thought, in gaining wide acceptance, not only in the public, but even in the ranks of his democratic opposition, for a whole series of propositions that are quite incompatible with any serious improvement of Soviet-American relations, and particularly with any significant further progress in arms control. In what follows, Kennan refers to the controversy in December 1987 over publishing extracts from his diary. Harriet, if I remember correctly, had thought it possible that the book would be published by the very Jewish firm of Strauss and Ferrer, for which, at that time, Mr. Sean was functioning as a consultant. But Strauss and Ferrer then declined to publish the book, giving as a reason, in a letter to Harriet, this German thing on Kennan's part. I have never been anti-Semitic, but I must admit that this episode brought me as close as I have ever been to becoming one. Those of us who served in the Berlin Embassy during the war were under no illusions about the Nazis. We had not chosen this assignment, which for some of us was a strenuous and exhausting one. Why should it be thought that I should have burst out in prose, expressing my horror of the Nazis? I was not a reporting officer, but an administrative one. To whom should I have addressed such outpourings? To the government? How? Through my superiors in the embassy? They would have thought I was mad. They knew what the Nazis were as well as I did. So did our government. Who would have been enlightened? And what good would it have done? A weird idea these critics of 1988 had of life and work in the Foreign Service in Berlin, 1940. February 16. Today was my 85th birthday. Yesterday I went to New York simply for a pleasant luncheon with Arthur Schlesinger. No strain and no particular fatigue. But I was utterly drained out, good for nothing. I looked at the drafts of two articles written in the past few days. Neither, I realized, was adequate to its purpose. Both would have to be wholly rewritten, and this under pressure of time. And then, for the first time in my entire life, the thought occurred to me, what if I simply can't anymore? What if the battery has finally run out? What if this is it? And if so... How does one, being still physically alive, convey this situation to others? I am not here, I would have to say, for any of the things you expect me to be here for. I must now go my own way. No opening mail, no answering phone calls, no involvement in the life around me, no social occasions. Could one, or must one, Washington, April 3. In view of the change of administrations and the possibility of influencing the new one, I have tried to put my word in where I could. It is, after all, a crucial time, with new and more intelligent people in and around the White House, and in the aftermath of Mr. Gorbachev's sensational unilateral cuts in conventional arms. I thought, if I don't say something now and the new people go the wrong way, I will never know whether something I could have said and didn't would have made a difference. So I gave two interviews on the McNeil Lair program, wrote an article for the New York Times Weekly Magazine and another one on Germany for publication elsewhere, and accepted an invitation to appear tomorrow, April 4, before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as the lead-off witness in a series of hearings on the future of Soviet-American relations. And all this has been complicated by the forthcoming appearance of my book of excerpts of travel sketches from my diaries, and in particular by the appearance of selections of them in The Atlantic some days ago, 
an event that I regretted but could not prevent. Sketches from a Life, 1989. The hearings take place tomorrow morning. I have prepared for them as well as I could, but I dare not be optimistic. I have not been feeling well, particularly in the mornings. I don't think I do so well, anyway, under this sort of questioning. When Kennan finished his two and a half hours of testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, everyone in the room, including the stenographer, gave him a standing ovation. The journalist Peter Jennings commented that if anyone is entitled to call off the Cold War, it is George Kennan, the man who invented the Western strategy for winning it. Princeton, April 9. The Senate hearings were dramatized by the appearance in the Washington Post the same morning of a two-page spread with bold headline and photograph, the Atlantic excerpts and the forthcoming books, so that Washington's attention, if not that of the New York Times, was drawn to my person, comparatively speaking, in no small way. And the hearing, two and a half hours in length, ended surprisingly and somewhat embarrassingly, with something that was, I am told, unprecedented in the experience of that eminent committee, a standing ovation in which even the remaining senators took part. I must be careful not to overrate the significance of that unusual occurrence. The senators who participated were mostly Democrats, though even the Republicans who attended, including Jesse Helms, were extraordinarily polite and respectful. The New York Times, true to its custom, wholly ignored the event. Except for one cable channel, the television people, for some reason known best by themselves, were not there. But the Washington Post reported the event quite handsomely the following morning. Newsweek, I am told, is about to give it prominent attention in its next issue. The New York Times, somewhat shamefacedly, ran the bulk of my initial statement, by arrangement with the committee, not with me, on the op-ed page of today's Sunday edition, following a spate of stories about the various efforts to prod President Bush into clarifying his views about how, if at all, we are to react to the changes in Russia. So I feel that I did succeed in giving at least a palpable jolt to the complacency of the new administration. This, however, has led me into what may prove to be deeper water, I received a phone call from General John Galvin, Supreme Commander of NATO, inviting me to come to Mont in Belgium and to address there the annual Shapex conference of the NATO Pact. This is a closed meeting, not open to press or visitors, which brings together all the senior members of the NATO community. The Farm, April 16. I brought along a thick bundle of reading material bearing on the Gorbachev regime and what it could or should mean for American policy. And after just this first day's immersion in it, and the reading has only begun, I find myself startled by the recognition that not only is the standard NATO outlook dated and no longer relevant to the emerging situation in Russia and Europe, but so, in a way, is my catalogue of grievances against that NATO outlook— we are all being overtaken by a new and dangerous situation, the end of which we cannot foresee. And when we argue about what we have known in the Cold War period, we are arguing historically about the past. Kennedy Airport, May 5. A strange experience, this sudden wave of attention coming over me in my old age. In its present form, this is the combined product of the surprising effects of the Senate testimony and the appearance in the bookstores and in the reviewers' columns of the new book, Sketches. It is, for me, hard to assess. In part, it is explicable simply by my age. I am living amid a generation of people who knew very little about me and have suddenly discovered that I exist. The slenderness of this knowledge explains the primitive naivety of their enthusiasm. Also, there is not much competition. The political significance is harder to assess. The success of the appearance before the senatorial committee was a personal one, but had little effect on governmental policy. The senator did not ask me about arms control questions— the only area where I could have come to grips with those aspects of policy where I could perhaps have contributed something. Well, here I now am, en route to Brussels, 
to speak at the Shapex exercise. This is more serious. The event could not have been more crucially planned. A fortnight later, there is to take place a NATO summit meeting. The central question to be confronted at that meeting is that of whether the range of the Lance missiles deployed by us, the Americans, on German soil should be greatly increased, raised practically to that of the medium-range missiles we were supposed to have removed on the basis of the agreement that Mr. Reagan concluded with the Russians before leaving office, or whether we should not better negotiate with the Soviet Union an agreement which would result in the removal of this type of weapon, of which the Russians have deployed in Germany far more than we have, altogether. Obviously, anyone who had the slightest interest in lowering the tension of the military confrontation in the center of Europe would opt for the second of these alternatives, but neither Mrs. Thatcher or Mr. Bush want to go in that direction, and behind the entire dispute there lies the deeper question as to whether these latter two, and the people around them, really want anything of the olive branch Mr. Gorbachev has been holding out to them, or whether they have taken the Cold War so tightly to their bosoms that they cannot even contemplate life without it. En route from Brussels, May 11. I come away from this meeting with the NATO establishment, more discouraged than I have been for years. I see no ray of hope in their attitudes, nor in those of the major governments that support them, only an indefinite continuation and development of the military and nuclear competition of the Cold War as we have known it for four decades, with my own government together with that of Britain, in the lead. Depressing, above all, is the deep and unreasoning devotion to the nuclear weapon. The indifference to its proliferation, the irresponsibility involved in its cultivation decade after decade, when we have no satisfactory means of disposing of the nuclear wastes, and when our continuation of this cultivation is bound to prolong indefinitely the proliferation of it that is now in progress. Bonn, May 30. Within an hour, I am to call on President Weissacher. Richard von Weissacher was President of the Federal Republic of Germany. These thoughts by way of preparation for this meeting. I am extremely glad that things went well at the crucial NATO summit meeting yesterday, and it is good that a confrontation was avoided over the nuclear weapons. I share in the general sense of relief that things went as well as they did, but the problems that led to the recent tension are by no means solved, and unless there are changes in the attitudes of both British and Americans, I think NATO will have further difficult times to go through. Christiansand, June 29. President Bush was disposed to bestow upon me on the evening 6th of July a high honor. Kennan was awarded the Medal of Freedom. I am to receive it together with three other elderly worthies. I, incredible as this seems, am the youngest of the lot. The ceremony, a very brief one, is indeed to take place in the Rose Garden next Thursday morning, and is to be followed with a small luncheon given by the President and Mrs. Bush. We, the honorants, are, thank God, not expected to respond. I am somewhat bewildered by this development. It is true that the President did speak kindly of me in a public statement some weeks ago, including my name among those of certain of the wise men of forty years ago. It is also true that my name has probably come to his attention in several other ways in recent weeks. It remains a rather strange circumstance that he should be undertaking this gesture towards one whose views on a number of important subjects are known to be so little in accord with those that he represents. Princeton, July 4. Tomorrow we go to Washington for the brief Rose Garden ceremony. As this brief and relatively insignificant ceremony approaches, I have two reactions. First, I realize that what is involved here is a gesture of respect for my person, not for my views or my efforts over the years to influence public policy. So obvious is this that I am led to the suspicion that this is a species of consolation prize given in recognition not of my success, but of my failure, that without the failure, in effect, 
it would never have been accorded. Secondly, I am afflicted with a disturbing sense of emptiness. Talking a day or two ago with Christopher, I was obliged to recognize that there was no way I could, of my own initiative, capitalize on this latter-day notoriety any further than I have done, nor am I expected to. But if not this, then what? Back, presumably, to diplomatic history, but not at once. After the White House ceremony, the Kennans headed back to Christiansand for their summer vacation. Copenhagen Airport, July 8. The White House ceremony and the following luncheon were graciously conducted by the President and Mrs. Bush. The former confirmed my sense of the motivations for the invitation to myself when I remarked to him that I particularly valued this gesture because I was aware that my visions had never accorded entirely with those of any administration since Harry Truman. He replied that the honor was not one accorded for ideological reasons. I sat on the second place to the right of him at lunch, the intervening chair being occupied by the former senator, Margaret Chase Smith. The president seemed, I thought, a bit hurried and tense, more so than I would have thought he would be just after his four-day holiday in Maine, and also, less surprisingly, somewhat removed and distracted. Despite his excellent health, the cares of office, I suspected, were weighing upon him. On November 9, the Berlin Wall came down. Kennan felt overwhelmed, not by joy, but rather by the pressures of responding to requests for comments. While unwilling to give up his public standing, he longed to focus on his scholarship. He was thinking about writing a third volume of his history of the pre-World War I Franco-Russian alliance. Princeton, November 14. For the last two or three weeks, after nearly two years of interruption of my historical work, I finally got my desk cleared of the usual trivia cleared to the point where on a number of days I could go over to the Institute Library and return to history. I loved the experience, every minute of it. Was happy in it, in fact. But it was a fight. The old web of ulterior involvements of every sort continued to lie heavily upon me. The hours in the library had to be literally clawed out of this web day after day. To do this clawing was a tour de force, the pressures were intensified by the dramatic events occurring in Eastern Europe, in Germany above all. He published an op-ed in the Washington Post, warning that it was premature to think of German reunification. Precariously, almost desperately, I continued the struggle. Liz, at the telephone, was obliged to fight the good fight even more fiercely than myself. Elizabeth Stennard was Kennan's secretary and aide. The phone rang all day with requests for interviews, TV appearances, articles, statements, you name it. November 15. Very well. Agreed. They win. I lose. I am defeated. Defeated not by lack of strength or talent, but by the power of the entourage, by the power of an entourage that has little interest in serious things, that values the entertaining quickie more highly than the sustained effort, values the emotional reaction more highly than thought, an image more highly than reality. It is an entourage that wants performers more than it wants scholars. But there it is. And so pervasive is its power, even at the end of the telephone line in the Institute for Advanced Study, that no one in my position can withstand it except at a cost that would involve real violence to his own social life and to that of his family. Where, then, do we go from here? I went last evening for a long, lone walk through the empty nocturnal Princeton streets, trying to think out the answer to that question. I could, I thought for a time, see myself wandering through life from here on out, purposelessly and distractedly, taking things as they might come, observing little things and deriving amusements from them, reserving my comments as a rule mostly for this journal, anticipating nothing, expecting nothing. 
but this, upon reflection, proved not as easy as it sounded. In response to the many appeals to do this or that, choices would have to be made. But by what criteria? If things are insignificant, how does one choose among them? November 18. I received a call from Washington to the effect that the President wished to see me, together with three other ex-ambassadors to the Soviet Union, on Friday, yesterday, at 2 p.m. So down I went, on the familiar trek to Washington, showed up, by the grace of God, because the Amtrak train was nearly a half hour late, in the White House at the proper time, met with my former colleagues, Tom Watson, Arthur Hartman, and Mac Toon. Thomas Watson was ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1979 to 1981, whereas Arthur Hartman served from 1981 to 1987, and Malcolm Toon from 1976 to 1979, and was ushered with them into the Oval Office, where we were greeted by the President and joined by four or five other people, three of whom I recognized as the Secretary of State, the Vice President, James A. Baker was Secretary of State, Dan Quayle was Vice President, and the Security Advisor, whose name, always on the tip of my tongue, I can never remember, but, oh yes, now it comes to me, Mr. Brent Scowcroft, I believe. There followed a series of contributions, including my own, than which, but for different reasons in my case, I can think of nothing more useless and trivial. A curious man, Mr. Bush. You talk with them. He is courteous, relaxed, reasonable in what little he says, and charming. You leave him, and what he says to the public bears not the faintest mark of what you had said, and what he had appeared to listen to quite respectfully. I, in any case, came away quite favorably impressed with them, though not at all impressed with the usefulness of the exercise we had just been through. But in the morning paper I read the record of words from his lips that could scarcely have escaped those lips had he had the faintest knowledge of what I wrote in last Sunday's Washington Post, or had what I said to him yesterday made the faintest impression on his mind. Thanksgiving Day, November 23. I have been obliged to recognize over this past week a change in myself, an unpleasant change, which I suspect of being irreversible. How can I describe it? Not only physical weakness, jitteriness, unsteadiness, etc., but also emotional reactions, lack of buoyancy, moments of impatience and irritation, other moments of dark apprehension of I know not what and a sense of being not fully in control of my own reactions and behavior. Aha, I say to myself, the onset of senility. But that sets up contradictory questions and reflections. If you recognize in yourself the signs of senility, can you really be senile? Or can you be senile, knowing that you are in a state of senility, yet being unable to control the manifestations of it? I fear, alas, that you can. What sort of conduct, then, does this dictate? Small undertakings, I would suggest, not large ones, and above all, a minimum of self-exposure to larger gatherings of people. November 29. I continue to feel the ulterior involvements of my life, trying as I may to avoid them, growing upon me, and being less and less coped with. They have been increased by the dramatic happenings of the time, the sudden self-emancipation of eastern Germany and Czechoslovakia from communist rule, and, of minor interest to me, but the occasion for great excitement among the gentlemen of the press and media, the meeting, two or three days hence, of Messrs. Bush and Gorbachev on their respective naval ships near Malta. The telephone, by consequence, has been ringing constantly here and in the office, bearing requests for interviews and appearances. All these have been declined, except an invitation to appear once more, alone, in January before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Perhaps I should not have accepted it, but I am one of the very few people they seem to trust, and there are, I think, a few things I can usefully tell them. So, there we are. December 3. 
A weekend, grandly wasted for the most part. Much of it spent watching Messrs. Becker, Edberg, and McEnroe play tennis. Boris Becker, Stefan Edberg, John McEnroe. While the communist domination of Eastern and parts of Central Europe was going up in flames, and Messrs. Gorbachev and Bush were meeting in the midst of a Mediterranean near hurricane at Malta. My reason for this frivolity was the last effects of the ill health that has held me in this dreary grip over this past fortnight. I must, I know, now begin the effort to inform myself seriously about what has been going on these days in Russia and Europe, in preparation for speaking at the Council on Foreign Relations later this month. This revolution in the communist world failed, for some reason, to excite me very greatly. I can fairly say that I saw it coming... I was trying to tell the government as early as in the late 1940s and early 1950s that Russian communism as an ideology had entirely lost its hold on the Soviet people. And it is years ago, before Gorbachev came onto the world scene, that I began trying to persuade people that the structure of Soviet authority in Eastern Europe was seriously undermined and would, if challenged, prove unable to stand up against any pressure. I often compared it to a thin sheet of ice on a pond which looked quite solid but would, if stepped upon, prove unable to bear any weight. But of course I could not see when the disintegration would come, or how suddenly. It is, to my mind, a pity that it did come so suddenly. It overtakes everywhere a generation which, through no fault of its own, is wholly unprepared for self-government does not even have any viable political parties to take over from the communists. Not only that, but none of these excited peoples seem to have learned, as they could have learned from the sensible Finns, that the only safe way to establish their true independence is to show a decent respect for Soviet security interests. If they do not come to that realization, and if they couple their demands for independence with a challenge to Soviet security... It will simply destroy Gorbachev, the man who has given them the large measure of independence, or in the case of the Baltic states of autonomy, they have so recently achieved. December 16. Four days hence, I must address a meeting of the Council on Foreign Relations, supposedly a regular serious occasion, but actually a special Christmas meeting to which members may take, I understand, their older children— the news of the occasion has got around. There's going to be a great crush, and people expect great things of me. I am assured that all that is expected is ten or fifteen minutes of extemporaneous remarks to be followed by questions. Painless, one might suppose, but far from it in actuality. Europe is in the throes of the greatest upheaval since World War II, and a many-sided, rapidly moving one at that. What can one say about it in ten to fifteen? minutes. As these days go by, I am increasingly preoccupied with the thought of an unavoidably abrupt and final act of liberation from this futile and exhausting bondage that causes me to spend week after week either saying no politely to importunities of every possible sort, or yielding occasionally to the odd unrefusable one and having then to deal with the new crop of requests it produces. I think this, and say it, in full awareness of the many times I have said it before, but it is now a question of whether the ultimate act of liberation comes by my own initiative or by death. Since the time available is limited in my case, why not by my own initiative? 1990 For several decades already, Kennan had suspected and he was about to succumb to death, or at least to senescence. Nevertheless, the 86-year-old remained sharp and active, and he would live for another 15 years. Kennan remained uneasy about the rapid changes sweeping through the tottering Soviet Empire and South Africa, nor was he happy about the decline of the old international system of unquestioned national sovereignty and the rise of a new international regime of, at least in theory, Universal Human Rights The Great Egret, Casmarodius Albus Bill and Laura Riley, friends of the Kennans, often hosted them at North Haven, Maine, or at Captiva Island, Florida. 
Kennan penned this and similar verses in appreciation of the Audubon prints in the guest cottage. Please stand aside a moment for the haughty great egret. He is the well-acknowledged leader of the long-legged beauty set, and if you should fail to show him the respect he thinks you owe him, he might choose to disregard it, but he won't forget. Princeton, January 21. The first three weeks of this new year have been taken up with the liquidation of the remaining obligations of what I hope now to be able to regard as my old life. The encounter with the Council on Foreign Relations just before Christmas, a huge affair which, because of the number of members and offspring who showed up, had to be removed to the theater of Hunter College, was, to judge by all the reactions, a great success. Then, on the 5th of January, there was a huge affair given by the state of New Jersey, in which, again, I was among the honorants. Three days ago, after much preparation by reading and writing things I would otherwise never have read or written, I made my appearance before the Senate committee, which, on this occasion, consisted of a simple senator, Mr. Biden, which reduced somewhat the dramatic quality of the event, and acquitted myself to my own satisfaction whatever the others in attendance or the press and public may have felt. And with all of this, I consider my contribution to the public life of my time to have been substantially ended. The period of this contribution was a clearly delimited period, some forty-four years in extent. That it is now ended, and that a wholly new one is beginning, is obvious. What I could contribute to the new one would be, at best, brief and not greatly significant. January 25. All over the world, strange and dark things happening. Russia disintegrating, drifting into the collapse of the traditional Russian Empire, experiencing the failure of Perestroika and the ruin of Gorbachev, moving into a new time of troubles. This country on the verge of financial disaster with incalculable consequences. February 4. Evening before last, we saw on television the Prime Minister of South Africa announcing to a troubled and silent Parliament the removal of the ban on the African National Congress and promising the early but definite release of Mr. Mandela. Nelson Mandela had been imprisoned by the all-white government for his agitation for racial equality in South Africa, and an end to the segregationist rule of apartheid. Concerning the second of those undertakings, I have no special feelings. I know nothing about Mr. Mandela, other than he has been in prison for a very long time, and has resolutely refused to abandon the use of violence to obtain for his movement the power he would like it to have. I know of no pearls of wisdom that have fallen from his lips, or of any other evidences of great nobility or high statesmanlike qualities on his part, that he is better off, from everyone's standpoint, outside of prison than in it, I have no doubt, that he will be brought to Washington, permitted to address the Congress, and given an ovation by people who know nothing about him but want to curry political favor with black voters, is obvious and of little importance." just another manifestation of American domestic political posturing. I have no confidence in the prospects for anything like a mingling of the races in South Africa, nor can I permit myself to hope that the whites will be permitted to retain very much of the quality of their own lives, or indeed of the vitality of the economy, in a country dominated on the principle of one man, one vote, by a large African majority." I would expect to see within five or ten years' time only desperate attempts at emigration on the parts of the whites and strident appeals for American help from an African regime unable to feed its own people from the resources of a ruined economy. Captiva Island, Florida, February 11. I suddenly realized how tired I was of all the things that absorbed my interest in Princeton. The remaining involvements, the obscure struggle with the inevitable bewilderments of advanced age, the spectacle of the tragically disintegrating Russia. Princeton, March 7. George Schultz, honorable and amiable man that he is, spoke at a dinner here day before yesterday. In the Tour de Raison he gave us, he placed much stress on what he viewed as the success of our government 
in persuading or compelling other governments to respect human rights. This statement sets an entire chorus of dissenting, or at least questioning, bells clanging away in my mind. Do we claim, as a feature of our sovereign status, the right to govern ourselves as we like, deferring to the traditions, tastes, concepts, and customs of our people? And would we resent an effort by any other government to prescribe for us changes in this governmental system? If so, do we nevertheless claim, on the basis of some supposed superiority of our own system, the right to intervene in just this way in the lives of other peoples and governments? And is it our view, in this connection, that our particular institutions have universal value, that they represent the best possible response to the need of all peoples, regardless of their traditions, tastes, etc., regardless of their history, regardless of their stage of development? And do we consider that individuals have rights of citizenship independent of any duties or responsibilities this citizenship might also involve? Does a man require only to be born to assume human form, that is, in order to become the beneficiary of these human rights? Is nothing to be required of him? Is it that he may be as selfish, as nasty, socially as negative, uncooperative, and burdensome to others as he likes, but as long as he contrives to stay within the law, he can claim all the benefits of these rights? I am sure the answer of most Americans to this last question would be an emphatic yes, and perhaps unavoidably so. But the disparity between a total irresponsibility and an unearned privilege continues to bother me. March 12. I am probably the most widely honored person outside the entertainment industry and the political establishment in this country. How could this have happened? and how to put it in its proper place. I am at a loss to answer those questions. I've had occasional insights, yes, and most of them ahead of their time, so much so as to render them, at the time of their conception, substantially useless. Also, I have been extremely lucky, favored by fortune, even in most of those experiences that seemed at the time to be disasters. But I am well aware of my own weaknesses, I am being honored in large part, not for what I really am, but for what people think I am. But that in itself is significant. Not only is it significant, but it is an obligation. Finding myself thus costumed like an actor acting the part of someone other than himself, I must try to live up to the costume and to the part. My role is to sustain other people's illusions. March 17. We have been enjoying nearly a week of real summer weather without precedent for the high temperature in this part of the country. One wonders, of course, whether this is not one of the first evidences of a real and menacing warming of the planet. In any case, the forsythia, not unnaturally, is in bloom. Although the dissolution of the Soviet Union into its constituent republics by December 1991 would develop without serious violence, the breakup could have spawned chaos and bloodshed. That worried Kennan, who had never lost his passionate feelings for Russia. April 5. Today is a day of black despair. Part of this, no doubt, is physical. There was also politics. The realization that the foolish Lithuanians determined to kill the goose that lays the golden egg have evidently succeeded in pushing poor Gorbachev back into the arms of, and into a dependency upon, the army, the police, and the Russian hardliners, and thus putting the final end to his real independent leadership in Russia. Accordingly, there will grow up an increasing breach between him and the U.S., produced by the movement of this country into the position of the great patron of any and every entity that expresses a wish to leave the Soviet Union. The adoption by this country, in other words, of a policy of promoting and accepting a shared responsibility, responsibility for the breakup of the traditional Russian Empire, with all the chaos, bloodshed, and horror that is going to mean. May 5. Our government was preparing, under pressure from our hardline NATO partners, primarily the French and British, 
to exploit the present confused and precarious situation in Russia with a view to excluding the Russians from all participation in the security problems of the continent and leaving them confronted, as the final result of their great military effort in World War II, with a Europe dominated militarily by a Germany, representing in itself the greatest military power on the continent, and in a state of alliance with the United States, Britain, and France to the bargain. I thought it always a mistake to take advantage of the momentarily weakened position of another great power to obtain advantages one could not have obtained under normal circumstances. To do this, I said, was something that always revenged itself at a later date. June 1. Last evening, the state dinner for Gorbachev at the White House. It was, I thought, very nicely and tastefully done. Annalise looked, I thought, very beautiful in her multicolored chiffon dress. I kept meeting people I knew or faintly recognized. Henry Kissinger greeted me with real warmth, which moved me. Gorbachev, as on the first occasion when I met him, gave me the embrasio. Gorbachev literally embraced Kennan and told me that he had seen the statement I recently made, the Milwaukee statement, presumably, and so jolted me by this greeting that I, distracted, failed to notice Mesdames Bush and Gorbachev standing a little back from the president and had to be yanked back by Annalise to greet them. Altogether a creditable evening on the American side, showing that we, the Bush White House at least, know when challenged how to do this sort of thing, but I was never unaware of the sharpness of the differences that are going to have to be talked out tomorrow morning, particularly in connection with Germany, the problems of European security. En route to Norway, June 17. Some way or other, the time has to be spent, not wasted. Well then, I had thought to write this summer. Why not start now? The most important thing to be said is that man, even the best of him, is an imperfect creature, a cracked vessel. This does not mean that he is not capable of fantastic efforts of creativity or virtue. It means only that those who are capable of such things, a small minority at that, find their efforts frustrated or corrupted by certain powerful impulses in themselves that are in conflict with all creativity and all virtue. These impulses fall into two categories, both deriving their power from nature's insistence that those born into her family should be concerned for the preservation, or in more practical terms, the multiplication of their species. One of these impulses is the instinct of self-love. The other is the sexual urge. Let us take first the sexual urge as the simpler and most primitive of the two. What may be said about it? Sometimes, like self-love, assuming many forms, even disguising itself, it remains an urge of enormous power, and it is, above all, in conflict with civilization, with order, with reason, even with human dignity. So silly is it, by all rational standards, so destructive and so self-defeating that it fits poorly with even the most rudimentary requirements of an orderly, responsible life and sometimes even with those of its partner, self-love. Its manifestations oscillate between the extremes of the tragic and the ludicrous. It is often confused with love. The two do indeed sometimes meet, though seldom for very long, and when they do, and as long as they do, and only then, the sexual urge is relieved of its sordidness and in some way ennobled. Ennobled because here, love if it is real love, becomes the master, and the sexual urge, in taking second place, gains dignity from the service, and from that which it serves. But those moments do not mark all lives, and are not long-lasting even when they do. But meantime, this urge remains the chaotic, anarchic force that we know it to be, beastly, demeaning, mocking the dignity of its helpless victims, always grist to the mill of the cynical and the scoffers, but leaving everywhere a trail of shame and frustration in its path. Self-love, the other compelling elementary force which mars the perfectibility of the human species, is quite different, more pervasive, for there are, for good or for bad, 
a few that seem to escape the sexual urge, more subtle in the devices it employs to hold its victims in its grip, far cleverer in disguising itself, less flagrant in its attack on the good order of society, even insinuating itself into the most widely accepted and even respected inventions of civilized behavior. The Farm, September 16. It is clear that I am, whether slowly or rapidly, but in any case with increasing acceleration, dying. Whether there is life after death is a question that does not trouble me. It is clear to me that the soul, while of course dependent upon the body for its presence and activity in this world, is not identical with the body, and there is no particular reason why it should cease to exist just because the body has been abandoned by the functions of life and is no longer a human being but only a rotting substance. Accompanied by Annalise, George flew to Europe so that he could visit France at Krotorf Castle, attend the Pour le Merite for Arts and Sciences meeting in Würzburg, catch a glimpse of reunited Berlin, and then travel to Moscow, where he was a guest of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. They stopped off in London on the way home. En route to Europe, September 25. There are weighty reasons why one should be very careful about any complete disappearance of a central Soviet authority, not the least of them being the danger of fragmentation of the responsibility for custody of the nuclear weaponry now in Soviet hands. Krotorf, West Germany, September 29. Four days from now, Germany is to be reunited. The change has come much too suddenly for its effects to be in any way foreseeable or predictable. Beyond this lies the immense and menacing uncertainty of the situation in what is now called the Middle East. It is really the Near East. So great, so baffling are these uncertainties, that here in these last days they have scarcely been discussed at all. Life, aside from the sudden rise in the price of gasoline, takes its usual course, and one lives from day to day. The papers have been full of German politics, particularly the unification of the Western Social Democratic Party with its sister party from the East. But these are all short-term developments, viewed only as such. The future of Germany and of all Western Europe is recognized as being greatly sensitive to the world outside. And the world outside is unstable and inscrutable in the highest degree. En route to London, October 8. The Day of German Unification Annalise and I took a stopbahn train to the Friedrichstrasse in what was, until today, the eastern sector of Berlin, whence we joined the tens of thousands of people shuffling along in two great streams in opposite directions on Unter den Linden. We joined the west-going stream and continued with it for one or two miles. We had no choice, in fact, for we could, over all this distance, find no other means of transportation than our own legs, of which my right one complained rather emphatically over the unusual demands being placed upon it. The crowds, made up mostly, I suspected, of East Germans, were quiet and undemonstrative, many of them a bit hungover, perhaps from the more strenuous celebrations of the night before. It was impossible to know what they were thinking. I had the impression that their principal reaction to this historic day, beyond a good deal of curiosity, was a certain paralyzing bewilderment in the face of the suddenness and unexpectedness of the entire recent stream of events. I saw no signs of any triumphant chauvinistic or even nationalistic emotion. Altogether, upon leaving Germany, as we did the following morning, my principal reaction to the situation there was the recognition that this situation was, in the longer-term sense and from the standpoint of American policy, essentially out of control. The unification of the country in the way and at the time it came about was not the result of anyone's foresight or of an agreed policy on the part of the powers that were allied in the Second World War. It was the result of spontaneous action on the parts of several tens of thousands of young East Germans, motivated by the hope of getting better jobs, making more money, and bathing in the fleshpots of the West. 
Everyone cheered, of course, and expressed satisfaction, but was this, over the long term, what we really wanted? The establishment of a united and armed Germany as incomparably the greatest economic and potentially the greatest military power in Europe, and this before there was any really significant framework of European unification into which Germany could be firmly integrated. What is most disconcerting is the fact, demonstrated by these recent events, that there is no longer any sort of central control over the march of events in Europe. If chance, in the form of spontaneous outbreaks of impulse on the part of poorly informed and unreflective people, proved to be the dominant engine of change during this recent crisis, sweeping aside every sort of sober reflection and judgment on the part of the responsible governments, who is to say that things will be any different in the years ahead? Even if the German government contrives to take things in hand, and its leaders are almost the only ones who possibly could, our own ability as Americans to affect the course of events has been reduced to almost negligible dimensions. Be that as it may, we proceeded on October the 4th to Moscow, where we were met at the airport by representatives of the Central Committee of the Party and of Arbatov's Institute. The following morning, I was driven to the Kremlin for the scheduled meeting with Alexander Yakovlev, a vice president of the governmental structure, as opposed to that of the party, member of the Politburo of the party, and a man known not only as the only intellectual in Gorbachev's entourage, but as one very close, intellectually at least, to Gorbachev himself. Most of the discussion was conducted in Russian on both sides. Occasionally, when I had something I particularly wanted to be careful about, I went over briefly to English. I had warned Yakovlev in advance that I would not be in a position to discuss with him the present situation in his country, which is developing with frightening precipitation, and which I had made no effort to follow in detail, and would be prepared only to talk with him about the history of Soviet power and of its place in Russian history. He had said that he would welcome this, and indeed it was to this subject that he directed the first part of the two to three hours conversation. The Soviet Union is indeed today in a dreadful and most alarming state. The most critical and threatening aspect of this situation is, of course, the immediate condition of the economy, particularly, but not exclusively, the breakdown of the official production and distribution system for food and other consumer goods. The American media correspondents in Moscow have been giving what may have been a somewhat over-sensationalized picture of this situation by concentrating their reports on the official food stores and neglecting the open markets, where food seems to be comparatively quite abundant. But even taking this into account, the situation is serious and even scary. For the state of affairs I have just described demands immediate and drastic attention. Instead of giving it that attention, Gorbachev, and here I fault him too, and the other governmental leaders have been giving most of their time to the other more long-term problems of the switch from the party's previous monopoly of power to an elected governmental system and to the similar transition from a command economy to a free enterprise one. Both of these are, of course, tremendous problems, but less urgent than the immediate collapse of the economy. And the concentration upon them by the leadership reminds me of what General Marshall said about the situation in Europe just before the Marshall Plan initiative. The doctors deliberate while the patient fades. The whole picture is overshadowed by something else that is of greatest importance and to which the leadership, in my opinion, is also giving insufficient attention, which is the progressive disintegration of the Soviet Union itself. So far-reaching has been this process of spontaneous decentralization that Gorbachev, I fear, is going to wake up one of these mornings to discover that while he has largely in place a new and ostensibly democratic apparatus for the governing of the Soviet Union, there is no such thing as a Soviet Union left to govern. That the three Baltic countries would demand their independence and act in many respects as though they already had it was only to be expected, and the same could be said about some of the others, particularly in the Black and Caspian Seas region. But much trouble lies ahead in connection with the Ukraine, parts of whose population are stridently demanding independence, 
whereas the country is in a number of respects very poorly fitted for it. And even more important, but also more alarming, is the vigorous movement toward independence in the Russian heartland of the country, under Boris Yeltsin's leadership. For if in this great territory, more than half of that of the USSR, and comprising roughly half of its population, the center of real political vitality moves from the old Union Soviet level to that of the Republican government, as it now threatens to do, the question will arise as to whether there will be enough left in the way of subordinate territory to justify the maintenance of any central authority at all. I have pointed out in an article about to appear in the November edition of Foreign Affairs that anything of that sort would hold great dangers for everyone involved, including ourselves. This whole problem is now greatly aggravated and complicated by the evidence that in many respects the other great problems I have mentioned, the political transition, the movement to free enterprise, and even the mastering of the present difficult economic situation, could probably be approached more effectively at the separate Republican level than at that of the now relatively helpless central government. For this reason, the problem of the decentralization of the previous empire also demands new and urgent attention, attention which, so far as I can see, it is not receiving. The best solution would be a loose confederation that would involve extensive economic and financial cooperation, somewhat along the lines of the present European economic community, and possibly the continuation of a common currency, but also a new ordering of military relationships that might allow for local militia, but also for something in the nature of a central military organization, possibly along the lines of NATO, and particularly one that could continue to bear sole responsibilities for the nuclear weapons now in Soviet hands. One could well blame Gorbachev for much of this. He clearly did not foresee, nor did any of us, how quickly and dangerously things would fall apart in Russia once the strong disciplinary hand of the party was relaxed. What he did in destroying the old system was a great historic service to Russia and the world, and nobody else could have done it. But he is not a good politician in the democratic sense. He has no adequate interaction with the people at large. Yeltsin, not an intellectual but quite intelligent, is far ahead of him in these respects. He, Gorbachev, is a man of ideas and a very courageous one, but he is not a good administrator and is anything but an effective demagogue. If the decentralization of the country continues at the present pace, Gorbachev's role in Russian history may turn out to be completed, for he has hitched his star to the development of the central all-union government, and this may soon fail and disappear under him, like a horse under its rider, leaving him without much of any function at all. But here, too, I may be mistaken. This is no time for profits or predictions. Gorbachev is a resourceful man with a great and deserved international reputation. Russia, whether united or not, needs him. Perhaps he will rouse himself betimes and contrive to take charge both of the economic situation and the reordering of the relations among the republics. I hope so, but I cannot be sanguine. Princeton, December 16. Mr. Bush continues to entangle us all in a dreadful involvement in the Persian Gulf, to which no favorable outcome is visible or even imaginable. In addition, he has, by forcing through the U.N. resolution, mentioning January 15, created his own deadline. The Bush administration had helped push through the United Nations a resolution demanding that Saddam Hussein's Iraqi forces evacuate Kuwait, which they had occupied since August. At the moment, it is hard to see anything ahead but a military political disaster. Chapter 10 At a Century's Ending 1991 through 2004 1991 Kennan continued to take pride in his accomplishments, even as he despaired at the limit of his influence. He criticized the war against Iraq as unnecessary and as diverting resources and attention away from desperately needed rehabilitation of America's domestic infrastructure and finances. 
Nevertheless, he was impressed with the spectacle of U.S. military might. Contrary to what one might expect, he said little about the final collapse of the Soviet Union. Princeton, January 15. Today, January 15, is of course the day on which the U.N. ultimatum to Iraq expires. Mr. Bush receives carte blanche to inaugurate hostilities whenever and however it suits him. There is every reason to assume that at some time during the next hours or days he will do just that, thus locking us into a quite unnecessary adventure which is bound to preempt our attention and our resources for many months, if not years to come, and for which no ultimate favorable outcome is visible or even imaginable. This, coming only a little more than a year after the effective ending of the Cold War, cancels out the respite which that development might have provided for us, including the opportunity to undertake the restoration of our shattered finances and endangered economy. One might wonder whether so great and weird an error could be anything other than the reflection of some sort of a subconscious death wish on the part of American society in general. But this would be an oversimplification. The American public at large had no impulses of that nature. Nor in this case, and this is a significant change, did the Congress. The sole bright spot in this entire dismal business has been the high quality, troubled, thoughtful, and dignified, of the congressional debate over the resolution giving the President authority to go ahead and inaugurate hostilities. No, the impulse to which this strange behavior was a response was one concentrated overwhelmingly in the mindset of the president himself. And this, as I see it, was the product of two factors. One, our unfortunate involvement with the part of the world in question, now called the Middle East, though this is a geographic misnomer, as this has been shaped in the years since World War II. The other, the belief so deeply inculcated through the false attitudes of the Cold War and so strongly supported subsequently by the Reagan administration, in the ability of America's armed strength to solve all serious international problems and to assure the political glory of any president bold enough to employ it. I, during this entire recent crisis, have not said a single word publicly about the Gulf crisis but I have had to ask myself whether I could not have foreseen this crisis and done something to help hold it off. I look back over my own record, and I see that in the case of every fundamental component of this present situation, I did in earlier years express myself as forcefully as I could. As far back as 1954, I stressed the folly of turning these Persian Gulf oil resources over to the local sheikhs, and then establishing their shakedoms in the quality of sovereign states, beholden to nobody. None of this had the faintest effect. An attempt, as chief of the planning staff, to warn the U.S. government in 1948 of the fact that in co-sponsoring the establishment of the state of Israel in the face of the continued opposition of the Arab leaders, we were creating a problem to which we could have no peaceful answer had no result other than to earn me a reminder from the Undersecretary of State that ours was a country in which domestic political considerations, even when involving the interests of only a minority of our citizens, took priority over considerations of national interest. My efforts, finally, to persuade people over the Cold War years that war with the employment of great modern forces could in this modern age serve no positive purpose. All these efforts turn out once again, as Mr. Bush's decision now proves, to have made no perceptible impact at all on our official thinking, or even on public opinion. How then to reconcile this with the startling fact that I find myself, at the age of nearly eighty-seven, if not the most extravagantly honored private individual in this country, than one of, at the most, two or three of whom that could be said. Is there not here a grotesque anomaly between the esteem bestowed on the person and the scant regard for his views? 
And if so, is this not evidence of some delinquency on his own part? Is there not, in other words, some way I should have conducted myself that would have assured to my thoughts a public attention commensurate with the respect paid to my person? February 6. The situation in Russia, too, is unmitigatedly dreadful. There, the future is wholly unpredictable. The best that could be said is that it will probably take years before things sort themselves out, and what may happen in the meantime is fearful to contemplate. When I am asked, what do I think of the situation in Russia, my reaction is, how lovely it would be to live somewhere deep in the country. February 8. This past fortnight has been, from the personal standpoint, a very difficult one, much physical weariness and deterioration, a more rapid succession of heart palpitations. I am now really and rapidly growing old. And I did write this last week, and published in today's Washington Post, an article on recent events in the Baltic countries and on the other aspects of the problem of what is to become of the traditional Russian, recently Soviet, empire. I wrote it, really, to be read by Mr. Gorbachev, as I rather expect it will be. I wanted to urge him, in his own interests and in those of Russia herself, to give the Baltic states their independence and to meet the other restless republics halfway in their desire for a much greater autonomy and a looser set of ties to Moscow. I wrote it as a matter of duty, without any very high expectation that it will have any effect but even this was an exertion. En route to Captiva Island, February 12. The dreadful, fateful involvement in the Persian Gulf is approaching its climax, which can be anything but a favorable one. Mr. Bush continues to place his bets and his own political prospects on a thrilling military victory, disregarding the appalling effect the war is having on opinion throughout the Arab and Muslim world, a development that would appear to prejudice increasingly the chance for anything resembling a satisfactory peace. Princeton, February 27. The President announced this evening the suspension of hostilities in Iraq about two hours from now, on condition that the Iraqis respond in kind. One way or another, this marks, I am sure, the termination of a brilliantly successful military campaign, and one, incidentally, which puts us into a new age in respect to the art of warfare. We shall now have to face the multitudinous problems of designing a new sort of a peace to take the place of the precarious one that existed prior to this war in the Middle Eastern region. This will be very hard and it is not a problem to which I could contribute in any very useful way, even if I were asked to do so. Those who have created this problem will have to come up with the ideas as to how they are to cope with it. I only hope that they will not pay too much attention to Arab and other Muslim opinion, and will not go too far out of their way to appease it. The one strong feeling I have gained from watching the Gulf War on television over these long weeks, is that so far as the Arabs are concerned, I would rather have their respect than their affections, and their respect in particular for our military power and prowess, for they seem to understand little else. Their friendship would rest at best on fickle and hysterical foundations. Let them hate us if they will, so long as they regard us, as this war should have taught them to do, as a serious force, a military force, if not a political one, in world affairs. September 4. A strange psychic state, moments of apprehension of I know not what, a lack of emotional elasticity, great discontent with myself, Regrets for the callousness I showed towards others when I was young. General dissatisfaction with myself and lack of enthusiasm for life. These, I suspect, are clear signs of age and even of approaching death. 
This last I do not mind. It is, generally speaking, high time that I died. But I would like first to finish the book, and I feel every day that in my effort to finish the book I am racing against death and must be sure that I can complete this last task. For, as John Donne said, none can work in that night. In Washington, Kennan addressed a dinner at the Library of Congress held in honor of the 100th anniversary of Avril Harriman's birth. He also spoke at St. Albans School, where he received the first peace prize given by the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. Washington, November 15. For nearly two and a half months, this personal diary has been neglected in favor of the completion of the as-yet-unnamed book, Around the Cragged Hill, A Personal and Political Philosophy, 1993. The latter was taken to New York and delivered to Harriet Wasserman ten days ago. She delivered it, on the same day, I believe, to Donald Lamb, the chief of the Norton Publishing House. He read it, as did some of his associates, and pronounced it, according to Harriet, the most important book he has ever written. A pronouncement which, well-intentioned as I am sure it was, would have had more weight in my eyes if I consider that any of the nineteen-odd books I have written was of any importance, in the sense, that is, of what I would suppose importance to mean to him— whom others have declared, and which I readily believe, to be the best in the trade. The Kennans traveled to Boston, where doctors examined George's heart palpitations, which had recently worsened. Boston, November 21. I fear, in particular, the reviewers. Where could you find people, particularly in this country, who could understand such a book? Actually, I know that is not what is most important. More important will be the people, if there are any, who will pick the book up and read it fifty to a hundred years hence. If they find nothing intelligible in it, then it will indeed have been written in vain. In this sense, it should be regarded, as have so many other books, as something written for those who came after me, and perhaps given the prospective state of Western civilization in this coming period, long after. The Kennans went to Bermuda for a vacation. In contrast to the many readers of the Mr. X article of 1947, who lauded Kennan for his prescience about the eventual fall of the Soviet Union, the author of that essay evinced no such pride. He believed that Washington had foolishly expanded the geographical scope of containment and had passed up many opportunities for negotiations that might have eased or ended the Cold War. Bermuda, December 26. Yesterday evening before dinner we went over to the lodge to watch, on their TV set, Gorbachev giving his resignation speech, in which he conceded that the Soviet Union had come to an end. The lowering and removal of the Soviet flag over the Kremlin was also showed. A historic moment, if there ever was one. Today, here, things are much like the other days. Drifting cloud masses and sunny intervals. Wind has gone further around to the north. One begins to become lazy. Lay awake this morning pondering question of what should be the basis of American foreign policy, fell to thinking of a dilemma, far, wide, and interdependent versus small, intimate, only local dependence. My own preference, of course, for the latter, but realistic? Considering the total undependability of our world environment, my first reaction is, surely we should seek together with a complete cessation of immigration, as extensive a national autarky as we could possibly achieve. Why, I ask myself, if we are going to talk about autarky, limit it to the national dimension? I have, in my book, suggested the breakup of the country into a dozen smaller entities. Why not autarky in them? 1992
While finding himself increasingly bothered by the frailties of his aging body, Kennan remained razor sharp in his commentary on events past and present. Walking the streets of Washington prompted a frank appraisal of his now deceased associates. Kennan looked askance at Washington's growing tendency in the post Cold War world to use troops in dealing with humanitarian disasters overseas. He perceived that what the generals called mission creep could entangle the United States in thorny problems. Moreover, such military involvement helped postpone what he saw as the need to reallocate financial resources toward domestic needs. Princeton, January 14. After two months of journeys to Washington and Boston, several cardiograms, some anxiety, and Lord knows how many thousands of dollars, I am precisely back where I was before. The only difference is that I know that what I have are not just the usual palpitations, but something usually known as atrial fibrillation, which can be, although they think it is not in my case, much more dangerous. Began today, though feeling wretched, the rewriting of the chapter in my book on foreign policy. A hard job. March 11. I was moved to receive, here at my home, a courtesy visit from the new Russian ambassador, Vladimir Lukin, who was here in Princeton ostensibly to address a dinner at the Woodrow Wilson School, but his leading assistant at the embassy, Vladimir Pechatnov, had told Liz that he would accept the invitation from the school only if I could receive him while he was here. He had only been in this country for three or four days and had not yet presented his official credentials at the White House. It gave me an unusual satisfaction to reflect that he had, so to speak, presented his credentials to me before presenting them to Mr. Bush. March 17. Curious changes are occurring in me these days. I went this morning to Firestone Library to pick up, among other things, a copy of a volume of English translations of Chekhov's stories, one of which Annalise and a friend wanted to see. On finding the book in the stacks, I found myself, glancing at the translation in it of the step, fell to reading it, standing upright between the narrow stacks, was so moved by it that I finally had to tear myself away, then went home and, the house being empty, sat down in the library and burst out sobbing. Something that has not happened to me for years, over the sheer beauty of the tale. But in this outburst of senile emotion, I suddenly saw myself and my present life as, I suspect, they really were, rather than as I was accustomed to seeing them. Saw myself as the old emaciated scarecrow that I am, going through the motions of trying to hold together a personal and professional life as though I were sixty-eight instead of eighty-eight, leading this life instead of vegetating somewhere far out in the country, cultivating my garden patch and tending my chickens, as a man of my age ought to be doing. April 9. Strange, I observe, are the effects of old age upon a man. Not the physical ones, of course, but the psychic and emotional. I am tired of the things with which I was only recently more intimately involved. The Cold War and its history, the Kennan Institute and its problems, the record of my own life, etc. May 16. The ordeal of having the pacemaker inserted was somewhat enlivened by questions being put to me by an assistant surgeon who had read one of my books and who now bombarded the helpless me with questions about Russia. I replied as best I could and muffled the tones from underneath the blankets that had been placed over my face. Washington, October 5. I pursued my elderly limping walk through the inner streets, encountering at every turn the houses in which there had once lived friends and acquaintances. Joe Alsop, the Bolans, the Atchisons. 
while I knew all these people, and some of them quite well, I was never properly a member of what was called the Georgetown set. I was, for much of the time, too poor and too little urban. I spent my weekends elsewhere normally after the war, out at the farm. Thus I missed all the weekend entertaining. But it was more than that. While well, some of these friends knew me quite well, professionally if not personally, they all, I thought, looked at me slightly askance. Joe Alsop, being himself a fine writer, recognized what he thought was a similar quality in myself and respected it. Beyond that, he knew little about me, and what he thought he knew was mostly wrong. Chip Bolin, himself not a good writer and quite uninterested in the quality of writing as distinct from its content, regarded me in an anguished way as a brother, if only for our mutual interest in Russia, and followed me with an anxious eye lest I depart from the correct interpretation of trends and events in that far country. Dean Atchison, like Alsop, recognized me as a good writer, but viewed that quality with a touch of suspicion, sensing that it fitted ill with the world of politics and the law that was his natural habitat. He viewed me, I suspect, with a sort of amused personal affection, but I never commanded on his part the same sort of respect he accorded to the law. There was, in his view, nothing better or higher than the latter profession— the American Foreign Service did not even come within sight of it. For these, and for all the others, I hovered uncertainly on the horizon, a strange occasional social phenomenon, over-intense, seldom relaxed, to be fitted into no known category, to be approached with a certain respect, but also with a certain wariness. You never knew, they thought, when I would fall out of the proper tone, or in some other way violate the rules. And they were not wrong. I never knew it myself. At a play based on selections from my sketches from a life, the only unpleasant moment of the evening came when my host, who was Jewish, turned to me and whispered something unpleasantly critical about the passages referring to the Germans— I was puzzled by this and replied that perhaps she should read the full text, but she made no reply and turned away. I still remained puzzled by this and at a loss to know to what she was referring. It could scarcely have been the mention of the shock I experienced when first seeing Jews in Berlin wearing the yellow stars, unless it be my observation that a great many Germans too were shocked and troubled by the same spectacle. But this was true. As for the other passages, could she have been offended by my feeling for small German children who, amid the ruins of Berlin, still believed in fairies? If so, then we are really in trouble. For whoever despairs of the children despairs of civilization itself. Or could it have been my sense of outrage over the realization that we, the Western Allies, had destroyed 75,000 civilians, people of all kinds and ages, in the firebombing of Hamburg. Did she think I did not know that the Germans, too, had bombed cities and that the Nazis had burned even greater numbers of innocent civilians? But had I not referred to and rejected the screaming non sequitur, they did it to us? My host's reactions left me with a lingering sense of concern. I had an exposure greater than that of many others to the terrible sides of Nazi rule and needed instruction from few. With this exposure, too, I tried, as with the comparable exposure to the cruelties and abominations of Stalinist rule in Russia, to come to terms in my own way, bearing in mind the weakness, the blind spots, the helplessness of great masses of people in the hands of totalitarian rulers, and hope I have done this with reasonable fairness and sense of humanity. But if I thought these were things I could never hope to discuss freely with my many Jewish friends, 
that this was a sort of getting-off place beyond which communication and understanding was no longer possible, it would be a source of deep discouragement to me. For my entire literary life, as I now see it, has been one long effort to gain understanding for the outlooks of others and to reach their understanding for my own. Princeton, October 22. The New York dinner honoring Arthur Schlesinger on his 75th birthday must have included more than a hundred guests and was elaborate and replete with celebrities and noise. I, given the first male place to the right of the host, was seated between Jackie Kennedy Onassis and Evangeline Bruce, with both of whom I enjoyed talking, albeit for different reasons. Evangeline Bruce was the elegant wife of the diplomat David Bruce. But when 10.30 came and we had still not come to the dessert, and it was clear that a large part of the program still lay ahead, I, aware that I would have to travel to Washington and to face another dinner there the following night, fled, thus abandoning most ungallantly my two distinguished ladies, but seeing no alternative. November 14. These last weeks have been busy ones. I wrote and published in the New York Times op-ed page one piece protesting the Bush administration's wild and despairing claim to have won the Cold War. It brought in a number of responses, all favorable except for one letter by Richard Pipes, published on the same paper's editorial page, taking issue with my piece on the grounds that I myself had said in the X article that we had it in our power to influence the course of events in Russia. Pipes failed to note that the five pages immediately preceding the sentence he quoted had been filled with material about the underlying weaknesses of the Soviet regime and the uncertainties that hovered over its future, and that the quoted sentence was only an introduction to a paragraph asserting my view that the way we could influence Russia was by the power of example, not, by implication, military threats and intimidation. A week later, I published in the Outlook section of the Washington Post a column that, I took steps to see, was made known to the State Department through Frank Wisner and to the Clinton entourage through Tony Lake. Frank G. Wisner is a businessman and diplomat. He is the son of Frank Wisner, an official at the Offices of Strategic Services and the CIA. Anthony Lake was President Bill Clinton's national security advisor and is, by happenstance, a son of the former Eleanor Hard, to whom Kennan had been engaged before he married Annalise. I voted for Clinton. I did so without enthusiasm, for I disapproved of some of his statements about domestic affairs and found others of them not greatly persuasive. But Mr. Bush had never impressed me very much in the first place, and I felt that he and his entourage in addition to being poorly in touch with parts of the population, particularly the more intelligent youth, were worn out and devoid of any adequate positive program. I have no means of knowing what the Clintonites will do about foreign affairs. The Farm, November 26. As we left for this Thanksgiving visit to the farm, I picked up from a bookcase in Princeton a book of Reinhold Niebuhr, which I had never used, brought it along, and have read it here. Man's Nature and His Communities, 1965. Have read it, in fact, with intense interest, not only for its own value, which is at the impressive elevation that marks all Niebuhr's works, but for the light it shed on my own recent book, now about to appear, Around the Cragged Hill, A Personal and Political Philosophy, 1993. We share, I am thrilled to see, a number of insights into the condition of man. How many of these, in my own case, were ones inspired or induced by other reading of Niebuhr's works, I cannot say. Certainly I was significantly influenced by him, but this present reading gives me the impression that in some ways I may have gone beyond him, if only because the developments of the years since his death 
have confronted us with dimensions of reality that were less conspicuous in his time. There was our common recognition of the dangers of collective impulse and reaction over those of the individual. I had fancied that my own recognition of this factor was original. I was thrilled to see that Niebuhr had also recognized it, although not nearly so sharply as had I, or had he attributed to it the same significance. Princeton, December 9. The television screen is showing live pictures of the Marines going ashore in the gray dawn of another African day in Somalia. I regard this move as a dreadful error of American policy, and I think that in justice to myself, I should set down at this point, if only for the diary, my reasons for this view. The purpose of this exercise is, we are told, to take charge of the channels of transportation and to assure the movement of food to certain aggregations of starving people. The supply lines by which it would have to be delivered are subject to harassment on the part of armed bands and individuals along the way, as a result of which much of the food is plundered and lost before it can reach its destination. Why, then, is our action undesirable? First, because it treats only a limited and short-term aspect of what is really a much wider and deeper problem. The situation we are trying to correct has its roots in the fact that the people of Somalia are wholly unable to govern themselves, and that the entire territory is simply without a government. The starvation that we are seeing on television is partly the result of drought, or so we are told, partly of overpopulation, and partly of the chaotic conditions flowing from the absence of any governmental authority. This dreadful situation cannot possibly be put to rights other than by the establishment of a governing power for the entire territory, and a very ruthless, determined one at that. It could not be a democratic one, because the very prerequisites for a democratic political system do not exist among the people in question. Our action holds no promise of correcting this situation. Secondly, this is an immensely expensive effort. What we are pouring into it must run, in the monetary sense, into hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars. This comes at a time when our country is very deeply indebted. There are many needs at home particularly in the condition of our cities and of the physical infrastructure of our society, which are not being met, ostensibly for lack of money. The dispatch of American armed forces to a seat of operations in a place far from our own shores, and this for what is actually a major police action in another country and in a situation where no defense of American interest is involved, this, obviously is something that the founding fathers of this country never envisaged or would ever have approved. If this is in the American tradition, then it is a very recent tradition. December 14. I have had spells in recent days of a type of depression I have never before experienced. Not this time the overdramatization of my own ills that used once to take me from time to time, but rather an extreme awareness and distaste for American civilization as I now see it around me. Since the external environment has not greatly changed, I suspect that the recurrence of these moments are attributable, not surprisingly, to some sort of physical changes within myself. How I long to be living somewhere in the country, real country, if such a thing were to be found, but this would, I suspect, depress Annalise as much as the absence of it depresses me. 1993 Kennan's lifelong ambition to influence domestic and foreign policy flared up anew with the commercial success of his book on political and personal philosophy, Around the Cragged Hill. Princeton, January 3 the first review of the new book appeared today in the New York Times Book Review. It was not a serious review, 
If the author, George Will, had read the entire book, the review does not suggest it. It was a kindly piece, but not serious, reflecting, as it seemed to me, the view, Cannon is not a bad old chap. Let us be indulgent of him. Every old man is entitled, after all, to a few intellectual oddities, and some of his are even here or there amusing. I was pleased, of course, that the review was not nasty, but I came away from the reading of it with the idea that I would rather be severely criticized by someone who took the book seriously than be treated with such benevolent condescension by someone who did not. January 22. The presidential inauguration seemed a happy national fiesta, rather moving, in fact. I was particularly affected by the spectacle of Mr. and Mrs. Clinton accompanying Mr. Bush on foot to his helicopter and wishing him Godspeed on his return to private life. And again, the receiving by Mr. and Mrs. Clinton in the White House after the parade of some six hundred people chosen by lot from applicants from all across the country, and the kindness and respect shown to these people, and particularly to the little children by the president and his wife. True, all of this was bound to be followed the next day, and was so followed by the brutalities of politics as usual. But there was, in all of this happy ceremony, normal occurring in so vast a country, a certain magnificence, and there were moments when I found it hard to repress the tears. It yielded for me a moment of pride and affection for my country, such as I am not often permitted to enjoy. The Kennans traveled from Washington, where George had met with Frank G. Wisner and Strobe Talbot, to Princeton, to New York. After a career in journalism, Strobe Talbot became Deputy Secretary of State, with special responsibility for relations with Russia. While on babysitting duty with Annalise in New York, George tried his hand at genealogical research at the New York Public Library. He was thinking about doing a family history of his ancestors. New York City, February 2. Frank Wisner, whose most recent post had been, as I understand it, Undersecretary of State for Security Affairs, had now, in the last post-inauguration days, moved over to a similar position in the Pentagon. Strobe T., on the other hand, had just received a high position in the State Department, where he was to have overall charge of all affairs having to do with Russia. It was to be the first official position he had ever occupied. Both men were extremely kind to me, yet I came away from the encounter a bit chastened and saddened. Frank heard me out on Russia with apparent respect, but I felt as did Henry Adams, according to one of his diary notes or letters, when he wrote that he and John Hay were now regarded as sages, by which he evidently meant that they were to be treated with respect, but that their observations were not to be taken seriously when it came to public policy. Henry Adams, the grandson of John Quincy Adams, was a historian and an acerbic commentator on public affairs. His Education of Henry Adams, an autobiography, 1918, remains a literary monument. John Hay was Secretary of State under Presidents William McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt. This being the case, it was time, Adams wrote, for the two of them to make their exit as gracefully as possible. Princeton, April 7. The extraordinary and wholly unexpected commercial success of my recent book. For full three weeks, if I remember correctly, it surprised us all, publisher, agent, author, and many others, by appearing on the New York Times national bestseller list. And it will again appear there, after a week's absence, on the coming Sunday. It is selling massively across the country and noticed almost everywhere, except by the U.S. government and the media. A strange fate, mine, to move so many compatriots, but never those in power. Well, more and more I am being made to realize that this is not my epoch. I enjoy a greater prestige than I had ever expected to enjoy. 
I am, like Henry Adams, who someone pointed out was born on the same day of year as myself, also being viewed as some sort of a sage. And I find myself being, or at least so I am led to suppose, the most elaborately honored non-political and non-governmental personage in this country, yet totally without influence where it counts. I drift along on some sort of an elevated magic carpet, far above the fray, but so appalled by the little I see of it that I am beginning to lose my interest in it, give scarcely more than a glance at the morning paper, and do my best to retire into a really private life. April 29. In spite of the commercial success of the book, neither the Clinton administration nor the media have shown the faintest interest in its contents, not even in the suggestion for a council of state. And the administration has never gotten into touch with me about anything. But this, too, is something to which I am accustomed after forty straight years of such treatment. Had that kind of frustration been the cause of my present troubles, this would have revealed itself years ago. What troubles me is a state of weakness so extreme that at least one of each three or four days I am not even able to do any normal mental work. That is new, and there must be some reason for it other than the sort of depression the doctor suspects. My interest in life, in an epoch which is not my own and which I can do nothing to affect or improve, is fading. I would prefer to have a small place in the country, live there alone, keep a dog, feed some chickens, and stumble about among the remains of what was once a garden. September 12. I am rather disgusted with myself for all the time wasted over these three weeks, particularly watching the U.S. Open. But that comes only once a year, and it is almost my sole frivolity. Everyone, it seems to me, is entitled to at least one major frivolity per annum. November 2. To celebrate my 90th birthday, the Council on Foreign Relations was expecting to invite three ex-presidents and five or six ex-secretaries of state of the United States. Whether any of these will accept and come is, of course, a question, but at least two or three of them presumably will. In any case, the mere fact that it was thought fit to invite them and this to a dinner in my honor jolts me severely. I know my weaknesses. I am accustomed to receiving honors in the academic world, but this moves me out of my accustomed orbit and causes me to realize that I now have a different sort of an image, an image to which I not only have to try to live up outwardly, but inwardly as well. This sobers me and causes me to think that I must try, in this final bit of my life, to put behind me a number of my principal weaknesses, to accept the importance of the image that has been formed of me, and not to play the part, but to live it. I emphasize this last. I've talked with Annalise about it. She, sensible woman, says, Oh, just be yourself. Being yourself has brought you where you are today. Let it carry you through the dinner. Sound advice only in the sense that I am not the man to pretend to be anything other than myself. But it is the self that is insufficient and ought, at long last, in these few short weeks, to be changed. It ought to be more collected, more composed, more deeply thoughtful, not just spewing out the insights of the moment, but putting together all that I have, confronting the tragic elements in what I see around me, but without yielding to despair. I must, without losing my modesty, respect all that within myself that has caused others to respect me. But if I find that what invites their respect is in part an image that fails to correspond entirely to the reality, I must, at any rate, respect the image and try to live up to it, not by dissembling the reality, but by trying to bring it closer to the image. 1994 On reaching 90, 
Kennan resolved to retire from public life. Yet he kept going. He also could not stop regretting his failure to instigate change in the policies and governing structure of the United States. Princeton, January 6. Realizing that for one reason or another, I had not been able to keep this diary regularly over this past autumn, I decided to use some of the days of the Institute's Christmas holiday to write a summary account of the doings of these last three to four months. There was a trip to Washington at the invitation of Strobe Talbot to talk with people in various departments of the government who were concerned with Russian matters at the working level and to attend a dinner he was giving at his home for the Secretary of State, Mr. Warren Christopher. One could well ask what I, having not been officially concerned with Russian matters for forty years and informed of the passage of events in that country primarily only through the daily press, could have to offer to these various people who literally lived in this subject. But they were mostly experts, each with his limited professional competence. Strobe assured me after the session that what I was able to do for them and what they appreciated was to put everything together and look at the entire subject in a way they themselves were unable to do. This, I suspect, precisely because of my greater distance from the subject, was largely true. As for the Secretary of State, with whom I had previously never had anything more than a nodding acquaintance, I found him, in this more intimate atmosphere, a much warmer and more engaging personality than when he puts on his characteristic attorney's mask and appears before the press and the public. Altogether, I welcomed this chance to establish acquaintance with those who now have responsibility for Russian affairs in Washington. I was, after all, for some twenty-six years, a member of the American Foreign Service. I have some feeling for the situations of those I was meeting, and I would rather have a relationship of personal acquaintance and mutual confidence with them than to be obliged to feel myself regarded as a hostile and suspect outsider. At the Institute for Advanced Study I spoke about the enormous damage, social, spiritual, and even genetic, which seven decades of communist power had done to the Russian people, what this had cost them, how far it had set them back, and what now remained, a confused, genetically and economically impoverished population, shaken, humiliated, and traumatized, without much confidence in itself, and without the leadership to give it that confidence. Whoever could not recognize this background and bear it in mind had little chance of understanding what is now taking place in that tragically injured and spiritually diminished country. Mr. Clinton, in speaking publicly some months ago at the Seattle meeting of various heads of state, attributed some of the success he conceived us to have had in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War to visionaries like Truman, Marshall, and Kennan. A kind remark, even though visionaries was not exactly what we three gentlemen were. What concerns me most deeply are two phenomena obviously closely connected, which have something to say to us about the mental and emotional state of large portions of our population. The first is the unrestrained decadence that has overcome so much of our social and cultural life. The delivery of most of the process of journalistic, electronic, and cultural communication into the hands of the entertainment industry, and then the dreadful uses that industry makes of its near monopoly— not merely the low intellectual level, but the shameless pornography, the pathological preoccupation with sex and violence, the weird efforts to claim for homosexuality the status of a proud, noble, and promising way of life, and in general the sweeping permissiveness and lack of moral leadership on which these distortions thrive. Beyond this, there is something that is, to my mind, even more menacing, and that is the evidence of real emotional instability in considerable portions of our population, particularly in the universities and among young faculty and portions of the student body. I have in mind the bizarre effects of such contagious hysteria as 
political correctness, but also something that is an unavoidable component of such hysterias, namely the total loss of a sense of humor. This, in fact, carries very far, even beyond the instances I have just mentioned. In whole or in part, it pervades the magazine world, the political cartoons, the behavior of students en masse at sporting events, and a great deal of the movie and television outlook. Since I have always regarded a capacity for appreciation and enjoyment of the ironic and the absurd as an essential component of mental and emotional health, particularly in people with our cultural inheritance, I can only regard the extensive disappearance of it as a sign of something very significant and very disturbing in the mental and intellectual life of the people affected. All of this gives to me the impression that ours is indeed, in significant degree, a sick society. And I cannot imagine where, in a country which has consigned a great portion of cultural leadership to the electronic media, the cure for this malady is to be found. February 7. Difficult days. I have been trying, rather desperately, to clean up the papers staring me in the face from both my desks, the one in the office and the one here at home, in view of my determination that my ninetieth birthday, now less than ten days off, shall be the cut-off date for the effort, the never-ending effort, to cope decently and courteously with the stream of demands from the outside that I should do things others have wanted me to do. I wanted to prepare for this by having before me, when the day arrived, a clean slate. No further engagements, no unanswered correspondence, no obligations to others. I worked over the past weekend at this, even skipping church to find time to do it. Thought I was, at least as far as the office was concerned, on the verge of success. But no, by noon today the desk was covered with new demands some of them relatively urgent. New York City, February 15. The Council on Foreign Relations birthday dinner was for about a hundred people, fully eighty percent of them my friends or people with whom I was well acquainted. In view of what the event meant for me, I shall try to include in this account a list of the guests. The affair was presided over by Leslie Gelb, a former journalist and official in the State and Defense Departments, Leslie Gelb is the former president of the Council on Foreign Relations. But present, too, were Peter Tarnoff, Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, and Pete Peterson, chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. I was seated next to Madeleine Albright, the present ambassador to the UN who, I gathered, represented the White House. She read aloud and presented to me a letter from the president, the drafting of which he himself had drafted. There was then read and presented, I blush to say that I can't remember by whom, a similarly kind letter from the Secretary of State, Mr. Christopher, together with the bestowal of the Department of State's Distinguished Service Award, which is, I believe, the highest recognition that department can give to any individual. There followed the announcement by Peter Peterson of the establishment of an endowed distinguished fellowship for Russian studies at the Council to bear my name. Something in the order of a million dollars had already been raised. Most moving toast of all, from Marshall Shulman, calling attention to my work as a scholar. Marshall D. Shulman was a scholar of the Soviet Union, advisor to U.S. officials, and founding director of the W. Averill Harriman Institute for Advanced Study of the Soviet Union at Columbia University. In short, they poured it on and left me not only overwhelmed, but unable to think of any even approximately adequate response. Princeton, February 25. An effort to get up off the bed found me, to my dismay, simply incapable of doing this legs would not hold, and such was the state of vertigo that I could no longer stand or walk. Annalise, seeing that things were getting no better, 
called Dr. Wei, who appeared somewhere around 7 p.m. and, after examining me, pronounced my condition to be the evidence of a stroke. March 24. I have had two mornings in the office. I have answered X number of letters. Another X number still remain and will be replenished every day. I have fielded a request from Senator Bill Bradley for a foreword for a part of his forthcoming book. I have received Henry Kissinger's 590-page book and also a phone call from his office suggesting an early lunch of the century. And what do you suppose he has on his mind? I have struggled with a newly installed state-of-the-art telephone system on my office desk, all the complexities of which I have not mastered and have no intentions of mastering. I am making arrangements to attend the semi-annual meeting of the American Philosophical Society later in April. Life, in other words, has been resumed precisely as it was before my recent 90th birthday, before my stroke, exactly as it was, in fact, 30 years ago. No allowance is made for my age or my condition. I have felt poorly for most of the last five days, sometimes even close to the edge. But I went to the cardiologist this afternoon and was pronounced fit as a fiddle. A few pills each day. Otherwise, don't spare yourself. Lead life as you always have. Obviously, if I am nearing death, I am the only one who suspects it. Sorenhus, June 29. About a week ago, I got word that the president's speechwriter, Mr. Robert Borston, nephew, as I understand it, of the recent librarian of Congress of that name, was trying to reach me. Reason? The president was shortly going to Riga for a meeting with the three Baltic presidents, and there had been talk of my being asked to accompany him, or, if that proved impossible, perhaps send a greeting through his party to the staff of the embassy at Riga. I therefore roused myself, although still not in the best of health, drafted a message of greeting as requested. The first secretary of the embassy in Oslo made a brief visit down here to discuss the matter and receive the handwritten draft of the greeting, and thus we were off. I have since drafted another two- or three-page paper containing some of my thoughts on the situation in the Baltic countries and on some of the views about Russian-Baltic relations, to which the President may well be exposed when he comes to Riga, and sent it the same way. The probabilities were that they never will reach him, but I am too old to be greatly concerned about this. I am still too much the diplomat, too much the servant of our government— to fail to respond when thus challenged. July 2. I came here this summer, armed with a great volume of Shakespeare's collected works, and resolved to read them all through, time permitting. Well, I have now read, for the first time, relatively seriously and completely, the first of the plays in this book's arrangement, The Tempest. The question, whether Shakespeare was really at heart a Christian, whether he was not more deeply influenced by the tragic mysteries of the Greek concept of a humanity at the mercy of the power of a variety of semi-human gods. I shall keep this question open as I go on with the reading. July 7. I received a very pleasant phone call from Mr. Borston, who told me that the very private thoughts I had written out and dispatched through the Oslo Embassy had been shown to the President, that he had had them checked from the factual side by the government's experts, and had encountered only corroboration on that quarter, and that as President he wanted Borston to transmit his thanks for my pains. In the following entry, Kennan reflected on a recent State Department dinner in his honor. Princeton, October 14. I could not, of course, be unmindful throughout the evening that this was the building from which, on one summer day years ago, I departed after being casually dismissed by Mr. Dulles, thus ending a career of twenty-six years in the Foreign Service, and that there was no one in the building whom I knew well enough to say goodbye to except the charming fifth-floor receptionist. The Kennans traveled to Barbados for a vacation. Barbados, December 28. 
In the personal sense, melancholy is heightened by the fate of my last book. A national bestseller for a couple of weeks, it seemed to sell best the farther you were from Washington or New York. One exception, the excellent review by Arthur Schlesinger in the New York Review of Books. And it appears to have been read extensively everywhere but in the two circles to which it was addressed, the press and the government. Here I was preaching to a mixture of the deaf and the inattentive. 1995. Kennan's strong feelings for Russia continued to shape his thoughts. He worried about the Chechen rebellion and about the ethnic prejudice of many experts on Russia. He thrilled at the chance to accompany President Bill Clinton to Moscow to celebrate the 50th anniversary of VE Day. He ended up, however, declining the invitation, apparently fearing that his frailty would render him a spectacle. His thinking remained wide-ranging and robust. In response to the public debate that erupted on the 50th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Kennan mused that the most basic question in August 1945 had been our obligation to ourselves, to our sense of what it was suitable and decent for such a country as ours to be doing. We should have swallowed our militant pride and consented to sound out the Japanese on the possibilities of compromise. Kennan to Freeman Dyson, January 20, 1995. Freeman Dyson Papers, in private possession. He penned incisive critiques of St. Augustine, Felix Frankfurter, Walter Lippmann, and Dean Acheson. Felix Frankfurter was an influential Supreme Court justice and an occasional advisor to presidents, especially Franklin D. Roosevelt. He also tried to explain his own failure, as he saw it, to devote adequate effort to the diary. Princeton, January 13. I follow with increasing dismay and heaviness of heart the ill-considered action now in progress against the Chechens. They are a people for whom I have no admiration and for whose nationalistic aspirations I have no sympathy. But there were far better ways that the situation could have been handled one hears in many quarters alarmist prognostications that this will be the end of democracy in Russia, that Yeltsin will use this episode to impose a complete dictatorship. I doubt that this sort of thing will or could happen. Things have gone too far in Russia, and the imposition of that sort of discipline on the Russian people, after all that has happened in the past six years, would encounter too many forms of obstruction and resistance. February 4. I gave a telephone interview to National Public Radio responding to some three questions I had asked them to give me in writing in the advance of the event. I did this because the questions they wanted to put were about history, the beginning of the Cold War, and not about me personally. The questions were themselves illustrations of the paucity of historical knowledge on the part even of the intelligent editors at NPR. It was evident that my questioner understood very little of the situation that existed in Soviet-American relations at that time, and had even been influenced by the subsequent right-wing charges that President Roosevelt had at the Yalta Conference deliberately delivered Poland and Eastern Europe into the hands of the Stalin regime, for them to do what they wanted with. And this, although there was an abundance of published evidence, Chip Poland's book alone would have sufficed— to show the unsubstantiality of that charge. Witness to History, 1929 through 1969, 1973. The complacency with which we had witnessed not caused the Soviet advance into Eastern Europe and the consolidation of their fearfully oppressive rule over that area actually flowed from a. the genuine naivety of FDR and certain of those around him, b the extent to which our government had succeeded in persuading many Americans that the Stalin regime was composed of well-meaning people whose wartime aims were not really too different from our own. C, and most importantly, the incorrigible persistence of our military leaders in refusing to give any attention to political considerations while the war was on. This last factor, incidentally, was strongly supported by the White House. 
not least because of FDR's unshakable impression that if he only had sufficient time to talk with Stalin and to expose the latter to the charm of his own personality, he could cause this leopard to change his spots. March 9 The only other guests at a dinner in New York City were the well-known George Soros and his wife Susan, he, of course, if not the world's richest man, then certainly one of the three or four richest. I had, of course, heard of him, but knew very little about him, and wondered what manner of man he would be. To my surprise and pleasure, I found a charming and unpretentious Central European, impressively well informed of all that was going on in Central and Eastern Europe, and very shrewd in his judgment of the situations, the problems, and the leading personalities involved. I had, after dinner, a long and pleasant talk with him, and I was moved to wonder whether his relaxed and normal manner did not have something to do with his realization that I, in contrast with so many others that he meets, wanted nothing from him financially and appreciated him, and I hope anyway that he sensed this, not for what he owned, but for what he was. April 4. Woke up today feeling very poorly, and then in mid-morning a phone call from Strobe Talbot, now virtual undersecretary of state, to tell me that the president wanted me not just to be with him at the commemoration of the ending of World War II in the Arlington Cemetery, but also to accompany him that same evening on the presidential plane to Moscow, to be with him in attendance of the Russian ceremony for the same event. I would, of course, have liked to go. I was, after all, the senior American official present in Moscow on that memorable day, and it would give me much satisfaction to be there as an honored and friendly guest of the government in the Kremlin, in place of the dangerous enemy that I was always supposed to be, not only on that historic occasion when I stood off the base of one of the pilasters and addressed the cheering Soviet crowd, April 8. I have struggled over the question, to join or not to join President Clinton on his forthcoming journey to Moscow. Everybody urges me to go, except Annalise, who wisely gives no advice, but only makes it known that if I went, she would expect to accompany me. Christopher, who is here this weekend with his little son Oliver, feels especially strongly about this says it would be stimulating, would perk you up, and you would go through it famously. Grace would say the same thing. If I try to tell them that I don't feel up to it, they say, Oh, we've heard all that. If I go to the doctors, went to one on Wednesday, they can only say that except for the failing heart and the arthritic knees, they can find nothing wrong with me. And every morning when I get up, I find myself in such a condition that I say to myself, Never, never, under no circumstances should I ever attempt anything like that. June 8. I have been torn this week between the demands of my scholarly undertaking and those of watching the French Open tennis tournament, bits of which are shown, unfortunately, only in the mornings the only time when I can do any good writing. Watching good tennis is my only frivolous hobby. But should anyone be without one such? Only by something of this sort can we keep our sanity in this crazy and unpromising time. June 12. Poor old Russia. Having had no sufficient emigration of real Russians, it has no real Russian diaspora. The people abroad who write about it for publication are surely 90% people who came from Russia, or whose parents did, and established themselves in the West, but who are everything else but true Russians. They are people of Jewish, Polish, German Baltic, or of other kinds of near Russian, but not of Russian origin. Generally speaking, they don't hate Russia. They strongly dislike it and want the remainder of Western opinion to share their feelings. I am one of the very few American wasps who have any great interest in that country, and would like to see it fairly treated. But to someone such as myself, the Russians themselves are no help. 
They are not really much interested in what is not Russia. Sorenhus, July 5. I brought along the confessions of St. Augustine, and I am at this moment deeply into them. I find in these confessions a great deal, a stupendous amount, in fact, of attention given to the relationship of man to God, but very little to the relationship of man to man. And this fails to satisfy me, for I find myself asking whether the greatest service individual man is capable of making to God will not be found in whatever useful service he can render during his short time on this globe to his fellow man. Also, I find myself somewhat disturbed by the extremely personal nature of St. Augustine's relationship to God and by the demands this relationship implicitly places on the concern and attention of the deity for the situation of a single man. God's mercy and understanding are comprehensive, not exclusive, and there must have been a great many others who needed them, and upon whom, precisely because of their significance and helplessness, they had also to be expended. You, St. Augustine, were undeniably a great man of your time, but it was not for you, as you advanced your claims for God's attention, to assume this, to assume for yourself, that is, as high a place in the measure of God's values. I may be nearing the margins of sacrilege, but I cannot help my mind's turning in this connection to the humble graffiti affixed, I was told, to a religious placard somewhere in England, consisting only of the words, Jesus saves, to which some irreverent person, or was it really a reverent one, had added the words, Jesus is tired, save yourself. The Kennans went to Maine for a vacation as guests of their friends, Bill and Laura Riley. Among the books that our thoughtful hostess, Laura Riley, left before us in this cottage was a book of taped interviews. I opened it at random and fell upon the interviews with Felix Frankfurter, Walter Lippmann, and Dean Acheson, all older men and celebrities of the time when I was in my planning staff period. I knew Atchison the best, of course, but occasionally met the other two as well and talked with them. Several times with Lippmann, once, quite futilely for both our parts, with Frankfurter. Younger than all of them, and for long a subordinate of Atchison, I was impressed by their reputations and their authority in their respective fields. Now, something of a minor celebrity myself, and one who still regards himself, as he then did, as the intellectual equal of any of them, it amuses me to think back on the deference with which I treated them all, a deference largely justifiable in view of my greater youth, and concealing, no doubt, a generous measure of conceit on my part. And I now review in my mind the ways in which I viewed them, and they viewed me, in those long-gone days. For Frankfurter, I had the least regard. A sharp and aggressive legal mind, certainly, a wily and formidable denizen of a political center dominated by lawyers, but neither a philosopher nor an impressive personality. In Lippmann, a man who had carried journalism into something much greater than what that term generally describes, a fine writer with a brilliant mind and an impressive store of what I might call liberal erudition, mildly affable on the outside, but cold and, in a curious way, defensive on the inside. He analyzed public questions with great maturity of judgment and literary style, but, yielding to the normal compulsions of a columnist, wrote too often and too much, his formidable critical quality sometimes carrying him around in circles until he found himself chasing his own tail. Lippmann greatly resented me for my arrogance in writing the X article, and above all, writing it for Foreign Affairs, a journal for the contributing to which he had disqualified himself for personal reasons. He felt challenged and provoked by the fact that an unknown pipsqueak such as myself should have written, on a subject of which he saw himself as the dean of commentators, an article that became the object of such massive public attention. I never lost my respect for him. 
He remained for me, of course, over the ensuing years, a committed intellectual opponent, yet one whose sharp and logical criticism probably did me more good than harm. Atchison was something entirely different. I viewed him as a man of honor in the highest degree, and felt for him, as our association in the State Department ran its course, much respect, and even a certain remote affection, remote because of the differences in age and position that divided us. He was seen by many, and not always unjustly, as a cold and haughty person, capable of cutting people down when he thought they deserved it with a single stroke of his razor-sharp tongue. But he was actually a very warm person within the relatively small circle on whom his capacity for friendship or affection was bestowed. He was, in fact, a man of intense dislikes, but also of fierce loyalties, and I respect him for all of it. By education, training, and profession, Dean Atchison was in every inch a man of the law, his world was that of American lawyers and courts, and of the American political system, and the doings of which lawyers and courts were as a rule so deeply involved. Ours was, after all, a political system run by legal decision rather than by the wide range of administrative discretion that played so large a part in most European governmental operations. That being the case... Atchison had little understanding for his administrative responsibility as head of the Department of State. He dealt with individuals rather than with bureaucracies, to which category the State Department outstandingly belonged. He knew nothing about the American Foreign Service, at that time conceived by many of us, its members, as an hierarchical, disciplined institution like the Army or the Navy. He must have known that he had, in theory at least, the highest direct administrative authority over the members of that service, but he had difficulty in viewing them otherwise than as citizens, subject individually to the laws, the courts, and the workings of the political system, like everyone else. When then, as occasionally happened, these officers fell afoul of the workings of prominent parts of the political system, as in the case of certain of the old China hands, he could see no obligation on the part of the State Department or the Secretary of State, personally, to defend them. Old China hands refers to State Department officials who had based their careers on their familiarity with China. Kennan was referring to such China experts as John Patton Davies, Jr. and Edmund Club, whom Atchison had failed to defend when they were unfairly attacked by Senator Joseph McCarthy, and others seeking scapegoats for the 1949 defeat of Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek. There were laws and courts, were there not? Princeton, December 12. Fell to thinking, this last day or so, about the question, why do I have such difficulty in finding the time to give attention to this journal? And it occurred to me that the most obvious answer is because I have for years given precedence to my correspondence with other people and with other writing tasks, all of it on the wholly unrealistic premise that when I get my desk cleaned up, then I shall return to the diary. But of course, come to think of it, the desk has never been entirely cleaned up and never will be, and this means that this journal, as a species of correspondence with myself, will never achieve its full purpose unless and until I consent to regard the correspondence with myself as more important than the correspondence with others, which perhaps, especially in present circumstances, and for such purposes as may be reasonable and promising for a man of my age, it really could be. But it is possible that I have not thought through the question of just what sort of a diary this should be if it is to have any utility. A diary can serve more than one purpose. It can be only what I think of as a calendar diary, a bare record of what one did on a given day, to serve as an aid to memory and no more. Useful, perhaps, at some date long in the future for a biographer or a family historian anxious to establish the time when a given event occurred. Or it can be a notebook of sorts, such as many writers of fiction seem to have kept, to remind them of curious things they have heard or seen or might otherwise unrecord. 
or it can be a journal of ideas, of thoughts evoked by experiences of the day. I have tried to hold this diary as close as possible to the latter category, but this approach is not normally fueled by any sense of urgency, beyond which I know from experience that many thoughts come to me only when I sit down to write something for some very specific ulterior purpose, for something I had not thought to record for myself alone. Had I ever asked myself and compelled myself to decide just what sort of a journal this was meant to be, what could be expected of it, why, in short, keep it, I might have given it more faithful attention. 1996 Though convinced that his life could not last much longer, Kennan worked to refine his thinking on matters concerning the future, such as the developing world roles of China and of Russia. He also reiterated long-held notions, such as the benefits of what he called an isolationist foreign policy. Princeton, March 20. There are sometimes moments in the transition zone between sleep and the waking state, and particularly when one is wakening in the morning, where insights occur that are indeed subject to a degree of logical coherence, but are also the products of some deeper, more emotional, in part subconscious forms of awareness deserve a more serious recognition than they normally get. Yesterday morning, lying in just that sort of transitional state, I was aware of the fact that there is a gap between, on the one side, my ability at this age to go about at least a considerable number of normal activities, and on the other side, the complete loss of that ability, which is the end, death. The gap has this outward semblance of stability, but I know that it is a very fragile sort of stability, and could at any time be abruptly and totally destroyed. It is, in a sense, like a profound abyss on the edges of which I lead a life of pretense, of pretense that I am really as normal and robust as I appear to be. April 13. Highly unsatisfactory television interview with David Gergen, a former White House advisor. Gergen has become a television journalist and frequent commentator on public affairs. Pleasant enough personally, but he was totally unprepared, had only the flimsiest of acquaintances with the book, if it could be called that at all, and made no mention of it at all, to my memory, in the interview. Kennan is referring to Around the Cragged Hill, he launched us instead into the dreadfully hackneyed subject of containment and used the whole fifteen available minutes pressing me to discuss it, which I did wearily and very badly. He plainly had no knowledge of what I had been doing over the past thirty or forty years and was, I suspect, surprised to find me alive and publishing a book at this great age. April 28 I looked again this morning at parts of my book, particularly the chapter on non-military foreign policy, which I had almost forgotten I ever wrote, and I came away from the experience boiling over with indignation. Why? Because I, looking at it from this distance, found large parts of it where deep problems of political philosophy were well addressed and worthy of note, yet I could not find the faintest response on the part of the media or the government to the points I had raised. I had not expected these views to be met everywhere with agreement. On the contrary, I realized that some of them would be little short of provocative, but I thought them worthy of public attention and of critical response. And the fact that there was none of this is what most upsets me. I would much rather that my views had been disputed than that they be ignored. I consider these views, more frankly stated, to have been major contributions to the development of political philosophy in our age, and to have this go wholly unrecognized is a bitter disappointment. But I am not sorry that I stated them. I could do no other, or at least, had I done any other, I would never have ceased to reproach myself for the omission. May 16. Annalise complains, even to others, 
that I complain too much about my health. I know why she does it. She does not want to admit to herself or to anyone that it is weakening. She is no doubt right, at least in one respect. I ought never to complain. But what I am complaining about is not the discomfort of old age itself, that I would and probably should bear and grin. It is that people are asking me and expecting me to perform as though I was not ninety-two years of age, but sixty-two. Could one not have, at the age of ninety-two, a few moments of repose? June 13. By virtue of a consent delicately extracted from me over many months by John Gaddis, I received in my office a television crew sent over, or so I gather, by the BBC for the purpose of interviewing me about the history of the Cold War. The reason for this interview had to do with an undertaking of the BBC to produce, in partnership with the Turner Broadcasting Empire, or whatever it is called, of this country, an educational film of at least twenty hourly segments on the history of the Cold War. In vain I had argued with Gaddis that I didn't like this medium, that I did not trust its claimed educational capacity, that the watching of such films was the lazy student's way of studying history, that I was a writer, not an actor, that I disliked my own appearances on TV films as much as I disliked the medium itself, that every answer I might give to the questions such appearances evoked would be an egregious oversimplification, bad acting, bad history. His answers were, but you can't stop. It is a part of the modern age. The film will be produced whether you contribute or not, but if you don't contribute, it will be even worse than you envisage it as being. It will be worsened in particular because you yourself have a unique relationship to the Cold War and a unique view of it. Sorenhus, July 21. I have listened to the news of the two explosions, the one on the plane off Long Island and the one in Atlanta, and I naturally wonder what the more lasting effects on American policy are going to be. The investigation into the crash of TWA Flight 800 concluded that the cause was not terrorism, but rather an explosion of fuel vapors resulting from a short circuit. The deadly bomb at the Atlanta Olympics was the work of a domestic terrorist. On domestic affairs, probably unfortunate, but on American attitudes on foreign affairs, perhaps not all bad. If these events can wean Americans from their common belief that we have only to give our civilization maximum exposure across the world and people will come to love us, perhaps the bombing, aside, of course, from their tragic and unforgivable human consequences, will have useful effects. Princeton September 21. I have completed the small, 96 pages, History of the Kennan Family. It would be published by W. W. Norton as An American Family, 2000. Much of my plight is explicable by the fact that as I have moved into the condition described as old age, the various aspects of my personality have not developed in unison. Each of them, the physical, the mental, the emotional, sexual, the imaginative, the control over the nervous structure, etc., has advanced or regressed at its own pace, so that now, at this age of ninety-two and a half, they no longer relate to one another as they should. There is a lack of the normal coordination. They jar each other, disregard each other, strive from moment to moment for ascendancy, and the result is a mess in both the way I conduct myself and see myself, and in the way I am seen by others. November 25. Waking up yesterday morning, I fell to asking myself whether I could properly be called, in the vocabulary of this epoch, an isolationist. The answer is yes. Being guided strictly by consideration of national interests as opposed to a plethora of other ones, I am indeed an isolationist, though with certain important reservations. I would urge fidelity to the requirements of our two and only formally contracted alliances, 
those with NATO and Japan. I see great portions of the international community embracing almost all of Latin America, Africa, and Southern Asia, where governments are led mainly by exploitative attitudes towards us, attitudes as devoid of any gratitude or appreciation for what we may give them as of any particular concern for the maintenance of our world position. To these, as I see it, we owe nothing but the dictates of our national interest. The two great countries of China and Russia present, admittedly, special problems. In the case of China, I see that country as the seat of a great culture which deserves our highest respect. Its people, from all I have been able to observe or have learned of them, are of very high intelligence. Higher, I should think, than could be said of our own, but extremely ruthless when crossed, and essentially xenophobic. For this latter quality I do not blame them. It is their privilege to be that way, and I think that those of their people who have migrated to this country have played a positive role here and will play an even stronger and not invariably positive one in future years. But I cannot see that we have anything to gain from a closer government-to-government -government relationship with that country. I would like to see us treat them on the diplomatic level with the most impeccable courtesy, which they would understand— but to have, beyond that, as little as possible to do with them, and in the areas where we have to deal with them, to treat them with no smaller a firmness than they are accustomed to putting forward in their relations with us. This would apply in no less measure in problems of trade than anywhere else. We should guard against allowing our business world to develop any extensive dependence on China in commercial matters, even if this should force them to moderate their hopes for occupying a prominent place in what they insist on viewing as the great Chinese market. And finally, I would urge that our government should desist, finally and completely, from any and every effort to press the Chinese government, now or in the future, in matters of human rights. That is their concern, not ours. In the case of Russia, things are more complicated. In its traditional religious and intellectual culture, Russia belongs very largely, not entirely, to the Western world. In its relations with the West, it will continue to have things to contribute as well as things to learn. Its civilization has been seriously weakened by the vicissitudes of this passing century, including, outstandingly, the exactions and abuses of seven decades of communist control, and it is now going through a hard time the outcome of which we cannot foresee. There will, I think, always be useful and enjoyable contacts between Russia and this country at the higher levels of arts and letters. That says little, however, about the quality of governmental rule in both countries. At its worst, in Russia, it could cause much trouble for Western Europe and for us. At its best, Russia could become a useful factor in the preservation and strengthening of Western European society, and this is for us of great importance, for Western Europe remains, in my view, the only part of the planet to which we can look with some confidence for the support of our civilization. 1997 Kennan regarded the extension of NATO to the borders of Russia, as a short-sighted policy that would antagonize Russia. Although he succeeded in helping to stir up opposition to this policy, the Clinton administration went ahead anyway. Princeton, January 4. Should I make any New Year's predictions? So far as I can recall, I have never done this, and what I could offer would be less in the way of predictions than of expectations. So far as the public arena is concerned, they would not be pleasant ones. That the Russians will not react wisely and moderately to the decision of NATO to extend its boundaries to the Russian frontiers is clear. They are already reacting differently. I would expect a strong militarization of their political life, to the tune of a great deal of hysterical exaggeration of the danger and a falling back into the time-honored vision of Russia as the innocent object of the aggressive lusts of a wicked and heretical world environment. Beyond that, and more realistically conceived, there will be efforts by the Russian leadership, a. 
to persuade the members of the Commonwealth of Independent States, meaning a portion of those that broke off or were pushed off from the Soviet Union in 1991, to transform the relationship with Russia into one of an out-and-out -out military alliance, and b. to develop much closer relations with the neighbors to the east, notably Iran and China, with a view to forming a strongly anti-Western military bloc as a counterweight to a NATO pressing for world domination. Thus will develop a wholly and even tragically unnecessary division between East and West, and, in effect, a renewal of the Cold War. Beyond that, since I am speaking of expectations, I would think it unlikely that the peace process in what is now called the Middle East will come to a favorable conclusion. Israel, by insisting on its present position, will become increasingly isolated among its Muslim neighbors, not all of whom in other circumstances would necessarily have positioned themselves as its enemies. And if all this should deteriorate into the area of military conflict, then our country will be asked to take over the bulk of the military burdens, something the politicians might prefer for the usual domestic political reasons to do but which might split public opinion in a most undesirable and painful manner. But enough of my gloomy expectations. Let us, and me and mine, along with all the others, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst, and take what comes. January 28. The deep commitment of our government to press the expansion of NATO right up to the Russian borders is the greatest mistake of the entire post-Cold War period. I feel that I should state that view publicly, but then it would be wrong to do this without notifying the few friends and potential friends I have in government and giving them, at least hypothetically, they won't do it, a chance to correct their course. In an effort to be fair, I stretched my mind through the early morning hours trying to find any reason for this colossal blunder. I could find none. But in the insistence on doing this senseless thing, I saw the final failure of the effort to which I have given so large a portion of my life, the effort to find a reasonable area of understanding and sympathy between the great Russian people and our own. But how old I am, how weak... How helpless. February 3. I have drafted and sent to Trobe Talbot my letter warning him that I had it in mind to come out publicly against NATO expansion, as now planned, and I have drafted and sent my letter to the New York Times, where, to my surprise, it was received with cheers. It should appear before the end of this week. I cannot predict what the reaction will be. Someone or other may want me to come down to Washington to discuss it, but I doubt it. Just as they, without consulting me, have nailed their flag to their mast, so must I nail my flag to mine. Let them see how they can extract themselves from the mess they themselves have created. February 8. The results of the New York Times op-ed piece in this age of instant communication were surprising. Before the day was out, a German publisher, Die Volke, was checking in on the facts channels, wanting to publish an excerpt from it. Then came a word from Grace's office, where she had checked in electronically, presumably from St. Petersburg, to say that she had heard of it there. And later, the same day, the French prime minister, who had been to Moscow for a brief visit with Yeltsin, came out with a suggestion that there be a summit meeting of the leading NATO powers in the near future. The relationship of this last event to the appearance of my own article was, I am sure, purely fortuitous. But in any case, the article could not have appeared at a better moment, and I came away with the feeling that if I did not change American policy by this intervention, I at least set the policymakers back on their heels. April 15. John Gaddis is about to assume his professorship at Yale, where I predict he will be very busy, much appreciated, and happy. But I, for my part, am concerned. 
It must be now more than twenty years ago that he and I signed a brief and simple agreement designating him as my authorized biographer. He has, I know, done some work on it, interviewing most of my family, except Christopher, and close friends, and assembling, I suspect, mountains of material. But in the meantime, I have no signs that the biography has even been undertaken. I don't find this surprising. He would, no doubt, have preferred to write it when I am dead, as I should in the natural order of things, long since have been. But I am also aware that during this long interval, his own position and reputation have progressed from that of a relatively modest scholar at a minor Ohio place of learning to one of great academic prominence and distinction. With all that this means in this country in the way of pressures, not only from other academic circles, but from the media, particularly television, whose hunger for screen material is unappeasable. So I begin to wonder whether he will ever get down to the task of writing the biography. Not, I fear, unless I should do him the favor of dying immediately at this present point, allowing him time to put the work together in the coming spring and summer before he starts in at Yale, not, God knows, an impossibility, particularly if I go on feeling as I have today, but also not exactly in the realm of probability. Sorenhus, July 11. I have been rendered most unhappy by the press reports of the NATO meeting in Madrid, where the formal decision was taken to admit Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary to membership in NATO, which meeting was taking place precisely while we were conducting our unhappy air flight. I had, of course, expressed publicly my decided disapproval of this measure. How, one asks, are the Russians to take this? What NATO missions are there for which the new NATO members have to be so suitably armed? How is this to be reconciled with the assurances to the Russians that they need not worry— that the extension of NATO's borders to the east has no military implications. July 31. The past twenty-four hours have been the most unhappy of any similar period I can recall. First, there has been the growing recognition that has been growing on me for the past week or so, that my own condition, physical, mental, and emotional, is now deteriorating rapidly and has progressed to a point where, in addition to being physically crippled, I can no longer trust either my memory or my mental coherence. To add to the sadness and pain of all this, and perhaps partly as an illustration of some of it, the last night was an intensely unhappy one. I had phoned Marion Dernhoff on another matter during the day, and there was a casual mention by myself of the Polish hatred of Russia, which prompted an immediate and emphatic response from her to the effect that this, as I knew, was something on which she could not agree with me at all. I woke up at 1 a.m., recalled this reply, recognized it as evidence that she saw nothing wrong with the recent and future extensions of NATO's borders to the Russian ones, this, in turn, caused me further to recognize that I have failed completely to put forward effectively my own views on this subject, that the Polish view of it has triumphed in Western opinion, and that if I could not persuade Marion and my own wife of its unjustifiable and terrible implications, the entire thrust of my activity as an official and a publicist must be regarded as misguided and useless." With that recognition, my entire view of myself, my work, and my life collapses. I lay then from one to five in the night, pondering the recognition, and when I asked myself what I should say to Marion, if I was to say anything at all, I could think only of the bald statement, Marion, I am simply heartbroken over what is now occurring. I see nothing in it other than a new Cold War, probably ending in a hot one, and the end of the effort to achieve a workable democracy in Russia. I see also a total, tragic, and wholly unnecessary end to an acceptable relationship of that country 
to the remainder of Europe. Princeton, September 7. The week that has just passed has been one in which the news was dominated by the tragic death of the English Princess Diana. So extraordinary were the reactions of this event that it becomes, it seems to me, a challenge to any thoughtful person to find the reasons why it is so extraordinary. I can see it only as the reflection, and a very disturbing reflection, of the effects of the television and the computer age on the public in general, but particularly on the youth now just coming into what should have been the age of personal maturity and responsibility. That the response we now have before us contains a very considerable component of mass hysteria cannot be doubted. This form of hysteria is always a dangerous phenomenon, it is particularly dangerous when it is informed and encouraged by the television media. The great majority, after all, of those who have shared in this reaction to the princess's death had never seen her except on film. Their whole relationship to her, in other words, was vicarious. But this, of course, is precisely what the business of TV is. To convey to great masses of people vicarious emotional stimuli devoid of any responsibility on the part of the viewers to react in any way to the challenges with which these stimuli confront them. The result of this is the promotion of personal immaturity on a vast scale, feeding a voyeur's idle curiosity, but holding no answers to the real dilemmas and challenges of personal life. November 4 on reading the article in the New York Review of Books by Theodore Draper on the Hiss Chambers matter of some forty to fifty years ago. In 1948, as Cold War tensions were increasing, Whitaker Chambers, a former member of the Communist Party of the United States, publicly accused Alger Hiss, a respected State Department official, of having passed secret documents to a Soviet agent in the late 1930s. Though Hiss was found guilty of perjury in 1950, Controversy about his guilt or innocence persisted. I was interested in this matter at the time, not just because Hiss was the darling of the Eastern establishment of that day and first and foremost of Dean Acheson, but particularly because it was he who was taken along on that last sad Rooseveltian journey to Yalta, and it was he, knowing nothing about Russia, who was allowed to stand at the president's side and to advise him on how to confront Stalin, or as Chip Bolin was used primarily as an interpreter, and I, ill with the effects of a difficult Moscow winter, was left in temporary charge of the embassy there, and nothing was further from the thoughts of the president and his entourage than to consult me about anything at all. Later, in the 1950s, when Whitaker Chambers' charges against his attracted great attention and were used, not least by Richard Nixon, as a means of attacking the Democratic liberals, I was fascinated by the conflict and even assembled a small collection of the books which then began to appear about the case. It did, after all, involve the Soviet Union as the supposed instigation and master of Hiss's communist connections, in summary, I never trusted either of the two men. Both were too perfect in their respective roles. Hiss, as the bright, promising, and admiringly successful New Dealer with his Georgetown residence and his easy proximity to the great of the Rooseveltian world. Chambers, as the repentant and therefore pure and courageous one-time denizen of the communist horror, from which, by noble agony, he had now liberated himself, and for whom a devotion to the truth had left no other alternative than to expose and denounce his former comrade in the communist conspiracy. These poses, for anyone who knew something about the Russian communist intelligence apparatus, were too vulgarly pretentious to be wholly plausible. Princeton, December 2 I had a dream that rocked me as nothing of this sort has rocked me within my memory. I was, clearly, carried back to a time more than fifty years ago. The dream was built around a real emotional dilemma of that time, 
It was not, in the dreamlike version, realistic. The elements of the dilemma were brought out in a vision of great beauty and horror, a weird, semi-nocturnal scene of a great, tireless, cold, and deserted plateau with only one tiny human figure, far away, lost, abandoned, and desperate. The plight was, in some way, my doing. I also could have helped, if anyone could, but circumstances prevented my doing so. Here was the dilemma, and I was unable, perhaps not strong enough, to solve it. And this helplessness was a fatal flaw in the integrity of my emotional life, and a long-lasting one, as long-lasting as has been myself. I was still torn apart by the unresolvable dilemma, and I was appalled by it. The whole unpitying bite of it was still upon me, more dreadful than ever. 1998. Kennan rendered judgment on his own sexual improprieties and on those of President Bill Clinton, who was trying to survive the Monica Lewinsky scandal. As he had in his 1993 book, Around the Cragged Hill, Kennan pondered the human relationship with God. Princeton, March 8. The scandal of Mr. Clinton's relationship to his Jewish girl intern is grinding, more and more sordid and wearisome every day, towards what I believe will be its inconclusive termination. An investigation would conclude that President Clinton had lied about his affair with Monica Lewinsky. I have seen no reason to revise the opinion I held and expressed to Annalise at the outset of this episode some three weeks ago, namely that I thought Mr. Clinton should step down, taking the position that a man cannot be expected to cope at one and the same time, both with the fending off of this sort of legal harassment and with an adequate performance of his normal presidential duties. But he has made serious mistakes in responding to this challenge, and no one can now help him. On the foreign policy front... I found myself wondering why we cannot regard another country, in this case Iran, as just that, as one more country which we would regard as neither friend or foe, with whom we are prepared to deal on a day-to-day -day basis, neither idealizing it nor running it down, keeping it to ourselves, here of course I am speaking about our government, our views about its domestic political institutions and practices, and interesting ourselves only in those aspects of its official behavior which touched our interests, maintaining, in other words, a relationship with it of mutual respect and courtesy, but distant. May 3. Fell to reflecting on Christ's profoundly deep-seated conviction that he was the Son of God, as well as the Son of Man. But of what God? What was God like? Where was he seated? Had Jesus ever really been there? Of all this, we are told nothing, and since he was born of woman, must have passed infancy and childhood in this world, and since there are no evidences of long absences in his life as a youth, how and when could he have known God, have been recognized by the latter as his son, and assured himself of the filial relationship? They are, of course, silly, inept questions, ignoring and sidestepping the element of divine mystery, without which there could have been no real Christianity, and they could easily be misinterpreted. But they and similar questions suggest to me that the God of whom Jesus spoke was, whether or not he himself was aware of this, a concept of his own creative imagination. This sounds, of course, as though I were saying that his God did not really exist, that he was only a figment of his imagination. But things were more complicated than this. The vision Jesus had of God was one not only of imagination, but of intuition and of superconscious conviction. And it was a vision of such power and magnificence 
that he could see only some deeper meaning in his very awareness of it, that it must have had some ultimate reality, and that he was, in some way, selected as the conveyor of it to the life of his time. May 11. Can it really be, I ask myself, that a man of my age cannot be spared the humiliation of being dragged, like a semi-inert body, through the stresses and strains of social life in this town, and in its various outreaches, required to ask himself daily, should I, must I, do this or that? And this at a time when all I really want is rest and solitude. And must I accept the added burden of never-ending concealment of the condition I am in, a life, that is, without joy or self-respect? How easy it is when you have no other choice to fall back on the usual, familiar, externally oriented personality, the show personality, nurturing the impression that one is the same brave figure, striding confidently through the minor trials, challenges, and obstacles of life in the manner to which family, friends, and acquaintances have all become accustomed. May 28. Partly, perhaps, it is sheer laziness, but there are other reasons, too, why I have of late written so little in this journal. One is, of course, the effects of sheer old age, and particularly the physical and nervous difficulty I experience in the very effort to write by hand. But another, and also no doubt the reflection of old age, is not that I have too little to say, but rather that I have too much. The mind seethes with thoughts, but many of them are at least in part repetitive of thoughts I have long since expressed in print, usually quite uselessly. On the other hand, there is, of course, a time for everything. One of the reasons why those thoughts, expressed so long ago, fell upon deaf ears or dim, little attentive eyes, was that they were put forward at the wrong time a sin that is indeed rarely forgiven. But it is now too late for me to put them publicly forward. The effort would be beyond my strength, and I would not know where and how in this advertisement-ridden culture to place them. I cling to the faint hope that someone may some day, perchance by sheer inadvertence, pick up one of my books, by my preference around the Cragged Hill, and note what I was talking about. Aboard a cruise ship, June 29. Two extraordinary dreams I recently had. Both appeared to me to have taken off from the extraordinary dream I had at some date in the last weeks of 1997, which revealed to me so vividly and sadly the split personality that I now know myself to be. A division dating, I am sure, from the day in April 1904 when my infantile relationship to my mother was suddenly torn apart by her sudden and tragic death. Now, in the first of these two recent dreams, I found myself confronting scenes that were too silly and ludicrous to bear retelling. Dreams have little or no sense of humor but which suddenly confronted me with all my sexual-emotional delinquencies of the past, not, thankfully, the recent past, but earlier reaches of my life. The dream brought home to me the extent to which they inflicted, or could have inflicted, suffering or injuries on relatively innocent persons of the other sex. Despite the absurdity of the examples that the dream offered, I was, by the time it was approaching its close, racked with a sense of repentance. And I remember asking, just before it ended, what then should I do, being the worthless person you have just shown me to be? Should I destroy myself? And here, quite properly, I answered my own question promptly and correctly by saying, no, that would serve no good purpose whatsoever. You must go on living with yourself and making the best of it. But it was meant, I am obliged to conclude, as a reminder, coming to me from where, 
of the corruption and helplessness that I shared with so much of the remainder of humanity, and of the continued need for placing myself and whatever talents I may possess into a perspective in which these weaknesses and inadequacies would never be ignored or underrated. The second dream occurred only two or three nights before our departure. There was nothing facing me but an absolutely blank wall, not totally black, but dark and wholly without decoration, and before it there stood in three dimensions, like a sculpted object, but real, the crucifixion, the cross, and nailed to it the living body of the tortured Christ. Nothing else, no sound, no word of comment or explanation. I was simply confronted with this scene. It was left to me how to react to it. I felt, in the case of the other dream just mentioned, that the dream was not the product of just my own subconscious emotional life, that some external force was at work here, that someone, and someone capable of shaping my dreams, was trying to tell me something that I was otherwise not apt to know. And now I had the same feeling about this other dream— that it was not something of my own emotional subconscious manufacture, that behind this stark, wordless confrontation and through it, someone was trying to say something to me. But what? Princeton, September 24. Poor Mr. Clinton. He has not been a bad president in the times when he could keep his hands off women, and I should say, as they go but he is the outgrowth of a seriously decadent and spoiled society. He is tactically nimble and impressively industrious at his job, but he is shallow in his philosophical background and in his human relationships. And he has, unfortunately, little or no understanding of the true grandeur and dignity of the presidential office. For that you would have to have been born into more than he appears to have been born into. October 20. An agonizing and absurd evening, wrangling with Annalise about my life here, I complaining that the effort to live at the same pace as at this age of ninety-four, as I did at the age of sixty-four, is telling on me. I can live reasonably well with one or two engagements or involvements staring me in the face— but not with five or six of them on my mind at one time. I must, I feel, come to a point where I make a fool of myself. On the other side of the marital table, no understanding for any of this. You is the usual refrain, do all right. I say to myself, if you go on this way, you will break down and the end will be hastened. Well, responds the alter ego, you want the end to be hastened, don't you? You long for it every day. True enough. And if it were to be sharp and swift and not too atrociously painful, I would not complain. But I begin more and more to suspect that that is not the way people like myself die. The old heart, half asleep, half dead, if you will, plugs along under the incessant needling of the pacemaker, dragging after it the tired, protesting old body and allowing it no rest from its labors. More and more the physical frame becomes a silly, offensive, half-conscious old scarecrow, a miserable slave of habit, a burden to all those around it. I think often of the final lines of the first paragraph of Pushkin's great poem, Eugene Onegin, in which the gallant young aristocratic playboy, charged with caring for his dying uncle, sighs and thinks to himself, when in hell is the devil finally going to take you? How many people will be thinking that, I ask myself, before this silly, unthinking old heart relaxes its unpitying grip and permits what Churchill called just old death to do what it was meant to do. 1999
As Kennan, at the age of 95, felt himself coming apart, he hoped the diary might help with holding himself together. Despite his diminishing powers, he tried to adhere to a high standard. Captiva Island, February 27. I'm writing in this diary simply in the hope that to write in it in this way and in this time will help me to put myself together at a moment when I feel myself badly unstrung and disoriented. As a result, I suspect, of fatigue overtaking me after yesterday's day of travels. Princeton, May 20. Phoned Terry first thing this morning and asked her to fax the following message to Grace. Terry Bramley was Kennan's secretary and aide. We have, evidently unwisely, junked your old fax machine and replaced it by a new and much fancier model. Having wasted an entire day trying in vain to understand the 45 pages of instruction for its usage and to send you a message on it, I have decided it is not for me and that there is an abiding mutual hatred between us two. I therefore neither expect nor desire to touch it again. However, I suspect that if you were to fax me on the usual number, the beast, taken unaware, would probably transmit it and suggest you try. Love, Daddy. Washington, May 24. Dinner, I being escorted to the fine sixth-floor reception room of the State Department in a wheelchair. Seated next to the Secretary of State, Madam Albright, with whom I had a good serious conversation. On my other side, an equally intelligent woman, Madame Christine Sarbanes, wife of the ex-senator. I had to speak for several minutes without notes and without, I must say, any particular preparation, but I think I coped creditably and things went well. The attendants at the dinner? Approximately two hundred, of whom I knew only a few. Sorenhus, July 2. A Federal Express package containing five copies of the New York Review of Books for August 12, containing as its leading article, I was startled to see, the interview I gave, most unhappily, to Dick Ullman. Richard Ullman was a professor of international affairs at Princeton and a friend of Kennan's. I was even more startled upon reading further in the same issue when I came upon and read with pleasure three other articles— all of which I found far better than my interview. I was disappointed, too, by the fact that nowhere did the review point out, in connection with the interview, that I was ninety-five years old. We oldsters should, of course, not coquette with our age, and certainly it cannot be misused as an excuse for weaknesses we have had over most of our lives. But there are certain handicaps connected purely with advanced age— and of these our readers might at least be reminded. July 13. I have, incidentally, recently come to feel that the English, with all their faults, are really, have been at least the greatest of peoples of post-15th century Europe. This, at least, in their literary and scholarly upper class. Their civilization was, of course, erected on great and unfeeling class distinctions— but the members of the upper class were in many instances no less cruel to each other than to those beneath them, and somehow or other they produced, out of the unfeeling but firmly disciplined society, some of the greatest of world thought and literature. I don't like the English any more than they like us, but I recognize their qualities, am myself an heir to some of them, and am grateful for this inheritance." August 3. Spent a good part of the day just lying around and pondering the question, what do you do when there's nothing you have to do? I am far from a solution to the question. The mind grasps at all sorts of responses. I will not call them answers. There are certain injunctions on behavior, but there are ones that would prevail even if you had something you ought to be doing. Example, Make yourself scarce. Don't spend a minute more in the company of others than politeness requires you to do. 
Then quietly absent yourself. Never forget that you are a goddamn bore. And for this reason, when you cannot avoid being in the company of others, don't speak more than you have to, more than politeness requires. Princeton, October 23. Because I have had in these last weeks and days a feeling that I was in a curious way coming apart, I feel a need to put together again at least that part of me that is still, if only out of decency, respect for my environment and self-respect worth holding together. And perhaps, or so I think at the moment, the orderly discipline of keeping this journal will be a help in that respect. October 25. A question that presents itself when it comes to the possibility of putting myself together is to what extent the disintegration is a matter of nerves and the will, and to what extent is it simply physical? Certainly the second of these questions demands a serious answer. This was borne in on me this morning when I was driven first to the Institute and then downtown for a couple of errands on Nassau Street. I returned from this expedition, resolving never to undertake this sort of thing again. The shopping visit involved, by my estimation, no more than some 450 feet of walking, which only a month ago would have presented no problem at all. This time I was, by my own sensation, on the verge of collapsing before I made it back to the parked car, and I was aware that in the shop, where I bought a book, I was a feeble caricature of my former self. The question in my mind is, does so rapid a physical and nervous decline mean the rapid descent to the end? I would like to ask the doctor about this, but will not do so. It would be unfair to him. I have no desire to prolong this condition. I am fairly sure it would be better for wife and children if it were not prolonged beyond the immediate future. November 27. I have just reread the Gospel of John, and here I am drawn to wonder over the great emphasis placed, not only by St. John, but by other Christian thinkers, down to Calvin and the modern Protestant Church, on the qualifications of faith alone as an assurance of salvation. Faith, belief, yes. But why should people have been asked to believe? Heathens that they presumably were, they were now being asked to believe not only in the supreme power of God, but in the divinity of a man claiming to be God's son. How and on what basis was this supposed innovation in their belief to take place? Ah, one may say, you forget the miracles— at this point, I was obliged, by sheer physical weakness, to break off the writing, move across the room, and lie down until lunchtime. Had I been physically better off, I would have gone on to explain why I saw the miracles as a partial reason, of course, but only for a limited number of people, and even for them, not fully persuasive. For an even more limited number of people who knew Jesus and talked with him personally, there was, I suspect, a more serious reason for faith, and that was the great apparent power and persuasiveness of his personality. But this, for hundreds and eventually thousands of others, could have been no more than a matter of hearsay. More about all this, if I live that long and in adequate condition, at another time. Christmas Day, 1999 the unquestionable decline of my own powers, partly intellectual powers, but beyond that, going into the personal, the inability to confront the small distractions of life, the decline of memory, the limits of concentration. I see myself surrounded in this house by great piles of demands upon me, demands that I don't see in myself the power to cope with, Many of these arise from expectations encouraged by things I have done in the past, coming from people who have no idea of the inner frailties of old age. I am, in this sense, the victim of my own past. 
The lesson of all this is, I am sure, that I have lived too long, have outlived myself. I have no defense against the refrain flung at me by so many. You look all right. I try, in the face of all this, to do my best, but it is not good enough and the awareness of its inadequacy is what weighs most heavily upon me. 2000 Although Kennan was, as he put it, sour on everything, he remained mentally engaged in almost everything. He followed national and international politics. He worked on the revisions of his family history, and he reflected on his relationship with his biographer, John Lewis Gaddis. Princeton, January 22. This journal has plainly suffered a longer neglect than usual, and that for the usual reasons. Poor health and a formidable overburden of mail on my desk. I would like to revive it and will make an effort to do so, but handwriting becomes increasingly hard, and sheer physical exhaustion insists on its rights. The details of declining powers make depressing reading, so let it go at that. February 13. I am also aware, lest any reader of this journal think I am not, that I am steadily forgetting how to spell. And this, after writing twenty books. March 3. Eight days have elapsed, as I now make it, from my return from the hospital. None of them have been easy ones. Harriet and the publisher, panting evidently with determination to get on with the book, have pressed me day after day to get on with this or that. An American family. My own self-respect as an author has compelled me to rewrite, almost in entirety, an entire chapter. March 25. Oh, dear, oh. Dear, I finished the rewriting, as it turned out, of two chapters of the book. But I have stood the effort, with all its side effects and demands on attention, poorly. And today, after spending half the day in bed, I came to realize that I am in a state, not just of nervous exhaustion, but of deep depression. And in this, and I suppose it is always that way, it is not just my own condition, but what I see of the state of the country that is involved. I see everything in black. The president tearing around in India and Pakistan, doing things and saying things that are neither necessary nor useful. The poor but valiant old pope paying his visit to what he, not the present inhabitants, regards as holy places. The stock market jumping up and down at its absurd and dangerous heights. The press and much of the public absorbed with its annual mock ceremony for the Oscars. A ceremony as empty, silly, and decadent as the films and glamour of the moving picture industry they are trying to glamorize. I am sour on everything. And the acme of my alienation from my time came when the strike of a portion of the American Airways, or something like that, cabin personnel, was settled at the last minute. I found myself disappointed by this outcome, because the company, failing a solution of the conflict with the employees, had vowed to shut down all its operations everywhere. And this, I thought, would be just dandy. The public ought to be taught, I thought, to understand what an unreliable, uncomfortable, dreadfully polluting, and basically unnatural and expensive means of travel the airplane really provides. I was, I suppose, just about the only person in the country who regretted the avoidance of this strike. And is that not depression? The Farm, April 22. I would like to set forth such views as I, at this advanced age, entertain. Views, that is, on global, regional, and national problems. Views highly adverse to the prevailing assumptions of the relatively liberal culture of which I see myself as a part. I could not hope to do this for publication. 
but I might have to say would far exceed the dimensions of any op-ed page in the daily press, probably exceed the dimension of any magazine article as well, nor would it be widely noted there. In book form, some of these views were set forth in my book Around the Cragged Hill some years ago, and I doubt that anything I wrote in all my literary career ever fell flatter and received less public attention than did these particular views. Even then, I would still like to get my views down on paper. Never mind for whom. If only as part of my political literary legacy. But this, if only my handwriting were to be used as the medium, would require weeks of uninterrupted concentration. And with the typewriter... That could be done only at home, and such life as can be led there is highly unconducive to such an effort. There are endless interruptions, phone calls, invitations, visits, daily correspondence, press readings, etc. The ancient typewriter is in the most intensely habited room in the house, together with the television and the telephone, I could, and perhaps will, try, but with few favorable prospects. Princeton, April 29. A visit from John Lucas. He, too, I thought had changed a bit, had been ill for a time. But I can talk with him as with no other visitor. Each of us sees in the past work of the other elements of profundity which, in both instances, have never achieved anything resembling recognition by the critics or by readers in general. Bunny Dilworth sent over to me yesterday afternoon a great heavy bundle of materials connected with myself, which her late husband, Dick, had squirreled away during the years of our acquaintanceship. J. Richardson Dilworth, a lawyer for the Rockefeller family, and his wife Bunny were friends and neighbors of the Kennans. Among them, whether she was aware of it or not, was the typed record of an interview between Dick and my appointed biographer, John Gaddis, all dealing with myself and my foibles, of which Dick, I thought, showed a more lively and painful awareness than did his interlocutor. The subject of the talk was purely my person, there was no reference to anything I had ever written or otherwise achieved, and I realized that to Dick, and perhaps in a sense to both of them, the person was more important than the achievement. Which is a pity as I see it, for while the person did indeed have foibles, and while it was no doubt good for me to be thus confronted with the recognition of them, and humbled by it, the person was beyond comparison less important than the work as a writer and thinker. The person alone would never have justified the sort of effort that Gaddis is preparing to put into the account of my life. May 2. These last two days have been extremely painful ones for me, for the text of Gaddis's interview with Dick Dilworth had shown me that the former, at least at that time, had no idea what was really at stake in my differences with the Western, French, and British governments and our own, differences that marked the years of the decade from 1948 to 1958. These were the crucial years in my efforts to be of use to my own government, and indeed to all of Western Europe in our encounter with the Russia of the aging Stalin that I was a total failure in those efforts is clear, and should have been even clearer to me at the time. I learned in any case to accept the failure, and after 1958, the wreath lectures being the final and conclusive episode, to abandon the effort and to go my own way as a scholar. But the lone battle I was waging in those years, a battle against the almost total militarization of Western policy towards Russia, was one which, had my efforts been successful, would have, or could have, obviated the vast expenses, dangers, and distortions of outlook of the ensuing Cold War, and would have left us in far better shape than we are to face the problems we now confront. 
that this battle should not be apparent even to the most serious of my post-mortem biographers means that the most significant of the efforts of the first half of my career, namely to bring about a reasonable settlement of European problems of the immediate post-war period, will never find their historian or their understanding. And this is hard. June 6. We received a luncheon visit from John Gaddis. The visit has asked me to reflect on the shortly-to-be-written biography. I have never regretted the decision to charge him, among many of the others who would like to try their hand at it, with this biographic task. He is incomparably better informed than anyone else about the diplomacy of those post-war years when I was performing governmental service. He is a thoroughly honorable person. He will relate what he knows and finds significant of that time, whether he will take a similar interest and attempt to depict with no less insight the post-governmental phases of my life and experience, the personal ones recorded in the sketches or the political-philosophical reflections set forth in around the Cragged Hill, I am not so sure. But I consider myself more fortunate than most of those who have biographies written about them. Sorenhus, July 23. Is there, I find myself asking, any use in continuing this sort of a journal? Well, there have been, as I then perceived it, both personal and non-personal reasons for doing so. On the personal side, there was the belief that this sort of a record, when reviewed periodically by the writer, gave the latter a certain distance of view on himself, his weaknesses, complaints, useful and useless hopes and reactions of the day, warned him about things to be better avoided, kept him from pursuing erroneous roads, leading nowhere. Princeton, August 27. From Harriet and the publisher, I learned that the editors of The New Yorker were, don't ask me how, impressed with the uncorrected proof of my little book, which they must have seen some time ago, and they want to send one of their number out to Princeton in one of the approaching days to do what they call a profile on me. This puts me under a strange sort of dilemma. I am unquestionably depressed, but should I receive this editor in that condition? Obviously not. But so pleased am I with the interest that magazine has shown in that little book that I feel it would be ungracious on my part to decline to receive the gentleman this means, however, that I must, in the interval before he comes, pull myself together and restore, so far as I can, my sense of humor. August 28. I watched the Democratic Convention. While not in agreement with Al Gore in all respects, I did feel that in his final acceptance speech, the real person finally began to overcome the political actor. Others seem to have gathered a similar impression, for his rise in the polls was quite striking. I am still not very happy about his choice of a vice president, but continue to recognize its demonstrable political advantage. September 25. I suffered. It was very small suffering, what I believe to have been a small heart attack. The heart, by the feel of things, was in any case certainly involved in it. But it involved, for someone of my age, the familiar problem. Either you do too much and are then sharply and unpleasantly reminded of your frailty, or you do too little, in which case you tend to vegetate, which is actually worse for everyone involved. On the edge of this fragile balance, my life proceeds. 2001 Kennan resolved to relax his standards for the diary. He would no longer bother to record significant or otherwise important events and thoughts, he told himself. Nonetheless, he could not refrain from noting some key international developments. Nor could he resist making the diary into a potentially useful medical record. The summer of 2001 would prove the last that Kennan spent in Norway. Princeton, February 4. 
I'm giving up any and all effort to make this into a serious literary journal, and will use this and ensuing pages simply for jottings of daily events in these final weeks of my life, events of no interest to others than myself, and to myself only as matters of record that may help me to keep action and memory in some sort of useful relationship to each other. April 30. Realizing that it will presumably not be long before it becomes unsuitable and unuseful that I should bear the main responsibility for making decisions or plans for Annalise and myself about the various displacements of her body and mind, and that these questions would be ones to be decided between the doctor and the children, principally Christopher, I thought that I should, as a possible aid to them, keep some sort of a brief record of major matters of health they might like to know about when they assume that responsibility. June 5. Woke up, knowing that the day was to be a bad one, and was struck by a total recognition, total, unquestionable, and susceptible of no doubt or vacillation, that I was a dying man. How long it would be before the end, I could not know. Man knoweth not his time, but it could not be very far off. And meanwhile, this awareness should govern all my decisions and behavior. Pursuant of this conviction, and whether it was cause or effect, feeling shaky and confused in the extreme, I made a morning trip to the old institute office and completed the examination of the papers that had been left there, disposing of the circumstances of their removal from the room and coming home with the feeling that, at least, is now done. Whether well done or badly, I could not say, nor need to ask. On September 11, 2001, 19 terrorists hijacked four U.S. airliners and crashed two of them into the World Trade Center buildings in New York and one into the Pentagon. As passengers in the fourth aircraft tried to gain control of the plane, it plowed into a field in Pennsylvania. A few weeks later, President George W. Bush launched a war in Afghanistan, where the terrorists belonging to al-Qaeda had trained. Kennan did not refer to the 9-11 attacks in the diary. The Farm, November 20. I will not worry further about the multiple, unnecessary, and grave dangers into which Mr. Bush is now so light-heartedly leading us. I am like someone on a ship crossing a great ocean. I know that the course taken by those on the bridge is dreadfully incorrect, but having been neither consulted nor allowed to feel that my opinion, even if volunteered, would be welcomed or respected, why should I worry beyond a point? I can only be inwardly prepared for what is coming and mumble helplessly, as did the discarded and dying Bismarck, Vihera meinen Enkeln. God help my grandchildren. November 21. Regarding the war in Afghanistan, I find myself more of an isolationist than ever, reflecting that we, as soon as we can detach ourselves from that imbroglio, should concentrate our efforts on developing at home alternatives to the importation of Middle Eastern and especially Saudi Arabian oil. This, in place of further efforts to play a role in that particular region. 2002 Kennan suggested, through a friend, that if people in the State Department wanted his views on current problems, they should send a representative to talk with them, Although the State Department did arrange such a meeting, he did not mention the encounter in his diary. Even with his strength ebbing, the old war horse never ceased wanting to influence public affairs. Princeton, March 22. I have also had in mind the curious idea, trying in this coming period, to set forth in the dimensions of a small book to be entitled something like An Old Man's Dream partly facetious, some of the bizarre thoughts on public problems of a man of my age. Today I sat down and asked myself to give this more serious thought. 
The result of that effort persuaded me that, attractive as was this idea, it was wholly impractical and silly. I no longer have the strength for any such involvement, and it could even make life harder for me if it were tried and failed. June 22. I woke up early this morning and thought that I would, if strength permits, resume the keeping of a diary. In what now will be written, if the effort succeeds at all, there will be none of the pretenses or affectations of earlier diaries, no deep thoughts, no logical conclusions, no strivings for literary color. I am, for good or for bad, beyond all that. My mind is a hodgepodge of random, uncoordinated impulses and reflections. Let them flow as they may, like water slowly seeping through a swamp. July 6. I find myself in a state of rapidly advancing deterioration of both body and soul. Whether it is in my power, in the power of will and understanding, to halt this or to slow it down remains to be seen. If not, what lies ahead is, of course, unpredictable, but I hope will be short. But does not the very awareness of this process evidence that it can, at least by strength of will, be at least slowed down and made less disreputable? Let us see. Is effort, even unsuccessful, its own reward, even clumsy effort, and even at this age? I quail at the questions. July 13. What a time and what an age at which to try to keep a diary. I watch, but this too only half-heartedly, the political arguments on TV, hoping against hope that the president will soon begin to be called to account for his grievous and abundant follies. God help us if he is not citing what would turn out to be false evidence that Saddam Hussein's Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction, the administration of President George W. Bush was pushing for war with that nation. Washington, September 15. I have been urged by at least one friend to write another X article, urging patience and avoidance of violence, even with regard to Saddam Hussein and his Iraq. And here with relation to the question of military violence overtly initiated by ourselves or its opposite, I have a few views centering on the question of nuclear weapons that I would like to voice. But I am simply not in any position at this stage in my life to involve myself in public controversy. So the matter stops at that point. Princeton, December 16. I now live, beginning with my own children, in a circle of resistance to anything more than a certain level of sympathy for the ailments of the very old. I sense this as well in the case of my two excellent physicians, Doctors Way and McCain, who have at one point or another given me their attentions in recent months. Both have examined me. Neither has found anything seriously wrong with heart, lungs, urinary, or digestive systems. What then am I complaining about? But I notice that while in these recent weeks and days I have been careful not to bother either of them, neither of these physicians has made any inquiries as to how I was getting on. My situation, then, is what could most accurately be described as one of a lonely personal discomfort, which I must learn to accept. 2003 The diary for 2003 evidences a sudden decline in the near centenarian's mental faculties. By December, he was desperately trying to hold himself together by marking the passage of hour-long increments of time. Nevertheless, earlier in the year he noted with revulsion 
President Bush's war of choice in Iraq. Kennan had also taken the opportunity, when in Washington, to explain to a group of reporters why he opposed the war. Princeton, March 18. The launching of the war in Iraq, the first firing in cold blood, is now, the President has told us, only some 36 hours off. July 31. I am, at this moment, totally confused about time. The calendar, that is. Not to mention a no lesser confusion about myself. What bothers me about the calendar is simply that it is hard for me to believe that the attack on Iraq and its immediate consequences could all really have occurred in the four and some months of April through July of this present year. As for myself, after completing a truly disturbing awakening after a night of weird and threatening dreams, I fell to pondering the implications of that misery for my relations with those around me, and was preparing to set to paper some of the thoughts that pressed upon in that connection when I picked up this long-neglected diary. Any complaints of these discomforts, voiced to others, fall on highly deaf and totally unsympathetic ears. All of them, doctors, children, friends, have come to regard me as one incorrigible and incurable hypochondriac, and such is the extent of their unanimity in this conclusion that I have no choice but I accept it, at least for all objective purposes. They are not fools. There must be reason for their attitudes. I must keep my physical complaints studiously to myself, and that I shall be at pains to do. But this resolve imposes certain restraints on them as well as on myself. They must not send any others to see me. They should not, unless they want to make a liar of me, address to me the question, or encourage others to address to pose it, How are you today? I might be provoked into admitting that I did not feel entirely well. December 17 I have lived through the most terrible night in memory, its agonies sharpened by extreme dizziness and weakness which frustrated several efforts to get into a standing position to cope with the trials of the night. Well, after successfully shaving in late afternoon, I have again lived through the trials of the half hour and am still confronting them. Let me begin by noting certain of the insoluble aspects of the problem. A. My limit of successful effort is the single sixty-minute hour or, if the strain is not too great, a single uninterrupted succession of such hours, but no more. B. This, the single hour, can be endured and lived through without physical or nervous discomfort, and its limits are marked by the very half-hour passage of the hour in question. This effort to come to terms with my problems was supposed to have been inaugurated with the passage of the 9.30 half-hour mark, but the clock across the room shows it to be, at this moment, not 9.30, but 11.30, a difference of two hours, and still no 9.30 notation. What has happened to mock my good intentions? December 18. Where do we go from there? And what becomes of my good intentions? Only, perhaps, to make another start and see. What then? It is, in any case, now shortly before noon. Anna will soon be arriving with that unwanted but relentlessly prepared and served challenge to this communication with myself. Anna was a caregiver. To give it up? Nothing left then than the end. So struggle along. December 19. Another of the hourly passages is now upon me. I am determined to continue to build my life around these regular hourly marking points. 
2004. Kenning clung desperately to his failing memory. He dictated the February 6 entry, which appears to have been polished a bit by the typist. He then tried to write down the years of each stage of his career and life, but getting the chronology right proved too much for his fading mind. He abandoned the timeline midway through. Princeton, February 6. To aid in matters of memory, I append a list of the apparent challenges to reality that have marked some of my recent days. All of these for noting under the title of Reality and Unreality in My Recent Memory. It is incomplete, but will serve its purpose. Some days ago I read in the paper of observations made publicly by the President to various journalists. I had seen a part of these in the morning New York Times. I had thought, however, that he went on to speak at greater length about these matters. On receiving the actual text of the paper, I found in it nothing of that sort, and was obliged to conclude that all the further testimony to the press represented nothing more than my own imagination. Year 1943. Liberated from Nauheim confinement, sent to Portugal, Azores crisis. Kennan was liberated from Bad Nauheim in 1942, not 1943. 1943 through 44. London, home. 1944 through 46. Moscow with Harriman, War College. 1947 through 48. Marshal and planning staff. 1948. Counselor, Department of State. 1950. Without pay year. Institute. Resignation, Princeton. 1951. Korea and half-year service. Purchase of Princeton House. Move to Princeton. 1952. Kennedy offers appointments. Off to Belgrade. Kennedy offered Kennan the ambassadorship to Yugoslavia in 1961, not 1952. Kennan put enormous effort into pulling himself together for the 100th birthday celebration held in his honor at the Institute for Advanced Study on February 18, 2004. At the gathering, he stressed his continuing gratitude, a half-century later, at being appointed a faculty member, despite his lack of professional credentials. Kennan, in his last year, could not write in the diary. John Lucas saw him near the end. His head, resting on a pillow, now had a skeletal beauty. He could speak only a little, forcing out a few words with increasing difficulty. He died peacefully at home on March 17, 2005, one year, one month, and one day after his 100th birthday. Although Annalise survived him by three years, she had succumbed to dementia even while George was still alive. So ended the journal, begun by the eleven-year-old. In this simple little book, a record of the day I cast, so I afterwards may look back upon my happy past.